Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense, we welcome you to the fourth uh, public hearing uh, related to our collaboration uh, with the Hudson Institute. Uh, I think it's very important for us to uh, publicly uh, express once again our deep appreciation uh, for the sponsorship of this uh, panel uh, and, uh, frankly, the resources they provided to us uh, to uh, take on what we consider to be a very, very critical mission as we take a look at our ability to identify and respond to uh, one of the more sinister threats that exist out there, whether it's thrown at us by uh, Mother Nature or a ISIL or a nation state or uh, whomever that actor or actors may be. So again, uh, we are deeply appreciative of the Hudson Institute, and while this is uh, the last public meeting we'll conduct here, uh, there'll be some private meetings here as we develop a uh, series of recommendations to uh, submit to the Congress of the United States for both short-term and long-term uh, activities, recommendations relative to the ability of this country to identify and respond to those kinds of uh, threats. Uh, today we confront a very troubled world and it becomes more challenging every week. Uh, while many issues threaten our nation, biological and chemical threats are among the most sinister. Al-Qaeda, ISIL, and other terrorist groups have voiced their desires to obtain and use biological and chemical weapons. And lone actors crude terrorist attempts with agents like ricin are reported regularly. Further, the ongoing Ebola crisis levels reveals significant gaps in U.S. public health and medical preparedness. Last year's chemical attacks in Syria prompted serious consideration of our own ability respond to domestic chemical terrorism and an influenza pandemic continues to lurk. It is clearly necessary to consider our current ability to defend against such threats and provide for the health and welfare of our citizens. I am privileged to co-chair this panel with my friend Senator Joseph Lieberman who unfortunately will not join us today. He's not a little bit under the weather and uh, we will proceed without his uh, wisdom and his counsel, but he's been so involved for the first three meetings and obviously will be involved uh, as we develop a set of recommendations to send to the Hill. Just for the benefit of the audience, and we're grateful that C-SPAN thinks enough of this panel to be covering it today, I would like to outline what we tried to do in, in dividing our efforts along three, four, four specific uh, panels issues that relate to uh, our effort. The first panel we held several months ago was on threat awareness. Uh, we took a look at the potential risk associated with biological and chemical threats that can inflict potentially catastrophic consequences. And we discussed the risks posed by the states, the nation states, and individual actors. So that first panel was about just the general nature of threat awareness. Obviously, the second panel was prevention and protection. And so we, did, we asked a series of panelists to give us their overview on everything from biological arms control and cooperation with bilateral and multilateral agreements uh, to first responder protection and agricultural defense. And we took, an took a look and assessed our Ebola and pandemic influenza response and our capabilities to respond to future uh, pathogens. The third panel was involved uh, experts to talk with us about surveillance and detection and understanding of the biodefense requirements in this critical area. Uh, we took a look at the existing technology and its effectiveness. We examined the challenges associated with early detection and early diagnosis and we took a very interesting look at the human and animal interface as it relates to uh, to our charge on this uh, blue ribbon panel. And today we've got a very, very uh, lengthy group, significant group of uh, subject matter experts to talk with us about response and recovery capabilities. And so uh, we, we think we've covered the waterfront from uh, threat awareness to uh, response and recovery and everything in between. And it'll be our mission, we're joined today, uh, Kenneth Weinstein and Donna Shalala, Tom Dashwell, and, and uh, I think uh, Jim Greenwood will join us later uh, to submit to the Congress of the United States a series of recommendations and hopefully we will be in a position to be up there advocating for these recommendations on a personal basis as well. So uh, as we've done with every panel uh, and every meeting, we normally 
begin with a unique perspective. And to this extent, we have uh, Mike Rogers, former congressman. Obviously, he's a, I think you're a fellow with the Hudson Institute itself. Uh, and uh, given the work he's done in the world of uh, international community, terrorism and the like, we think his uh, perspective to commence this final panel would be very, very helpful. So, uh, Congressman Mike Rogers, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Governor, Secretary. It's a lot to get on a card. I will, uh, that's funny, really, it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a little different being on this side. Of you the bet, it's a lot <laughs> better being. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, I discovered that sure. as Secretary, Mike. Sure thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, exactly. Um, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I appreciate the work uh, of the panel. And I want to say I've been uh, with Hudson now for a couple, couple of months, and the intellectual firepower there uh, is both inspiring uh, and, and uh, I have learned a tremendous amount. You think you come in you know, fairly well-schooled and you realize you've got a long way to go when you hang out with, the, uh, with my fellow colleagues at the Hudson Institute. They're doing really, really powerful work. Uh, I, I just thought I would tell you our journey a little bit on how we, uh, in a bipartisan way, got to you know, the BARDA bill and the PAPA bill yeah. on issues that we saw coming up that we didn't believe were going to be addressed uh, because it's just it's really hard to get people's attention about something you can't see or you can't touch necessarily, but you know the devastating consequences. And there are many a nights, as chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, you don't sleep for things that you know, uh, often centered around our uh, threat matrix of bio uh, terror attacks uh, and our ability to respond in a way that I think would be completely appropriate. So Anna Eshoo and I started in 2006. Uh, after a series of uh, investigative is too strong, but at least inquiries into uh, the status of terrorists at least attempting in their interest in obtaining bio weapons. And what we found was there was a high degree of interest in obtaining weapons, but we're in the middle of a conflict in Iraq. Uh, we're obviously in the middle of a conflict in Afghanistan at that point. And the focus was not just necessarily where it needed to be. So working back with the White House uh, at the time, the, the Bush administration, uh, collectively with Anna Eshoo, Democrat, Mike Rogers, Republican, working with the White House, we agreed that we needed to, to have a special fund uh, or effort to try to produce countermeasures uh, in a market where there was no marketplace for it. And that was the biggest problem. There is only one single customer in reality for these countermeasures. So I don't care if it's radiological exposure, I don't care if it's uh, smallpox on a, a large scale, uh, buponic plague, which we have seen strong interest in terrorist organizations trying to weaponize uh, the bubonic plague uh, and try to find delivery systems for them. Uh, we realized that we needed to have something on, the, on a larger magnitude to have both stockpiles of this and then try to push it out to our first responders or in communities where first responders could gain access. That's really how this started. Uh, and you can imagine with all of the other challenges facing the United States, it was hard to get people's attention on this. Uh, and so I, I credit, uh, you know, Anna Eshoo, again, some of my, my partner in this, uh, in the White House for saying, yes, this is something we are going to have to deal with given the levels of threats that we see, even given all the other things we have. The one challenge we had subsequent to its passage was trying to get full funding for it. So we got plenty of authorization money set aside for these countermeasures, uh, and it was very, very tempting, as you know, Governor Ridge, uh, that that money was, was just too tempting to be moved somewhere else uh, for what they would perceive bigger priorities. And again, because that enemy was not knocking on our door with the bubonic plague or smallpox or fill in the blank. We know they were interested. We know they had aspirations to use it. We knew they had aspirations to put it together. But we didn't have enough to say, you know, within 30 days or 60 days or 180 days, something bad's going to happen with these biological weapons. It always became a, a backseat issue. We've had some successes along the way, however, with medical uh, countermeasures. Uh, the emergent just signed, or uh, the HHS just signed a contract with Emergent. I think it was about $31 million for the new and improved anthrax uh, countermeasure. And a lot of attention paid to it, but there was a reason there was a lot of attention paid to it, because we watched the terrorists pay a lot of attention to it. 
And so we wanted to make sure that we had stockpiles of countermeasures around the country that could address a problem if it happened. Survivability rate in those cases would go is astro astronomical. Uh, that money will also be used to, to test uh, the prophylactic capability of, of anthrax countermeasures. We think that there uh, can both be a, a prophylactic treatment, which you see now, uh, and a response treatment to, to anthrax. In other words, if somebody gets exposed, uh, it's, there's a, an opportunity that we can have a, a vaccine that could uh, save that person's life. So all of that, to me, has been, uh, it's been a slog. It's been a work in progress. Uh, but I think we've, we've made some progress. And I know Anna Eshoo with uh, Susan Brooks, a, a new Republican from Indiana, signed a letter uh, to the chairman uh, recently requesting, I think, 400 and some uh, million dollars in additional money to the fund. I think it, if they can get anywhere near it, I think that would be a success story. We are going to have to continue to do this to try to stay ahead of the threat. The last thing we want to do is have a successful biological attack in the United States or with our allies and not be in a position to respond. Uh, we saw the panic in across Europe, across the United States, really across Asia, the Middle East, uh, Africa about Ebola. And this is something that we knew had the, po the possibility to happen but weren't re willing to stand up and try to prepare ourselves for the eventuality that it might happen. And so there was a lot of chasing our tail in the beginning. If you watch the way the government reacted, they reacted, which is great. The problem is there was a lot of trying to catch up to do in a way that we shouldn't have had to do if both PAPA and BARDA uh, pieces of legislation had been fully funded and fully operational. And this was a bipartisan problem on full funding. This is, it started in the Bush administration. Uh, that money got yanked away, and it's continued in, into this administration. And again, it's just hard to get people's attention on something that sounds really bad, but I can't see it. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would be willing to take any questions with advice of counsel, of course. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Well, I know you're, right. you're surrounded by your lawyers, so I, <laughs> yeah. I know you're very reserved. You know, my client has a fool for, yeah. or my lawyer has a fool for a client. That's me. Is that yeah, the old saying goes? I think we all have several questions. I'd like to uh, dig a little deeper with regard to the observation you made uh, in terms of generating bipartisan support, not on the authorization side, but on the appropriation side. You know, as chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, you obviously uh, were far more familiar with the, uh, the intent, the aspirations, and the capabilities of the terrorist organizations just because of your role. And I'm sure multiple briefings that uh, you requested and learned, and you learned a great deal from each briefing. Uh, and I guess our challenge is, is that in a democracy, we talked about this a little this morning, uh, we're much more reactive than preemptive. Yeah. And your point saying this is it's a challenge that people understand, but since it's not immediate and it's not visual, rallying congressional support around uh, an issue or an organization that is critical to this uh, biodefense countermeasures and chemical countermeasures yeah, is, is very, very difficult. Do you have any recommendations in that regard as to how this panel may take our recommendations and approach the Congress of the United States to elevate not only their interest, but also their ability and their willingness to take some of these recommendations, because they're bipartisan, they're apolitical recommendations, and, and take them seriously and see if we can change relationships between entities, change certain funding streams. Any thoughts in that regard? Yeah, I, I think any time a member is educated on the aspirational interests of terrorists, uh, that's a good day for an outcome of trying to get ahead of the curve. So I think the report will be important to that end. Uh, and I would use this as an opportunity to get senior staffers, to get members of Congress uh, clued in onto the aspirational nature of terrorist intent. Uh, and in some cases, it's gone beyond aspirational intent. We've seen the use of chemical weapons. We know that people are committed to using them. Uh, we've seen the, the procurement uh, from ISIS individuals in the East, we believe, of obtaining at least chemical weapons, if not gaining access to what research may have been done on biological uh, weapons. And so that's a very dangerous combination. Uh, in addition, any radiological material that they may have, you know, a lot of people are afraid of the nuclear bomb, and we should be, but a radiological dirty bomb is much more in the capability of a terrorist organization than a nuclear bomb, but certainly at this point. That is concerning. And so I think if members get clued in and senior staff get clued in as to what the threat level really is, 
I think it's easier for them to start making these decisions. Now, there's going to be a lot of priority, especially on defense. We've been robbing maintenance programs on carrier groups and aircraft and, and heavy machinery, tanks, uh, to pay for other things in the military. So the pressure is going to be on on the defense side. We have to make this a public health issue, I think, uh, here in America and try to get it out of the defense stream as best as we can. A, an activity here of that magnitude, even small, think of a radiological bomb that has the impact of eight square blocks. So a small amount of material burst in a way that produces an outcome that they desire. Most of the impact of that is fear and chaos. It's not actually damage. And so this is the problem that we confront. Can we sustain psychologically in the United States or economically an attack of even that small magnitude? or a small magnitude biological attack of smallpox. Or we know that they have this strong interest in the bubonic plague, trying to weaponize the bubonic, which is difficult to do, but not impossible. Uh, and they have engineers and capability to be able to pursue that. And now they have a little open space to pursue that. Again, that would keep me up at night. That, that kind of conversation with members outside of the National Security uh, Committee space, I think would be really valuable. Remember, if you're in agriculture, you're, you're worried about agriculture. Absolutely. If you're in the commerce, you're worried about yeah, commerce. Yeah. We've got to draw them in to this notion that, hey, this is a, an American public health problem that we're going to have to do. Um, uh -huh. Congressman, if I remember correctly, uh, we met first when you were a state senator in Michigan. Well, you could have you? a great memory, Madam <laughs> Secretary, <laughs> my God. Um, well, you I were working on some things. I think I had a still I, then, too. Yeah, I don't even remember that. Um, <laughs> The states have a role here, and if the governors and state legislators um, are recognized that and made some demands on their own congressional delegations, it seems to me that that would help. That we've been talking about the infrastructure that's needed, and it's not just a federal infrastructure. Could you give us some insight on um, how you think the states? We can mobilize the states to also see themselves as part of this overall infrastructure that we need. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I, uh, again, great memory. I, I, that's shocking that you would remember that. I'm sure I look exactly the same. I no, know you, you were working do. on an education issue that I was interested in. Yeah, if I remember, do remember correctly. that. Yeah, yeah we, we did. Um, the, here's, and I think this is a great idea. Most states have gone to some counterterrorism position in their state governments so that they realized that they had issues they're going to have to address if they were going to be a coordinating an effort with first responders, coordinating an effort with their hospital systems and, and on infinitum. And it was even down in Michigan to the county level. So county government was having these uh, folks who were committed and, and sat in a room thinking about these problems. I think getting all of them engaged, I see there's some firefighters here. I think that, that, that is a great place to start as well. They will be the first ones to show up. Those are the ones you want engaged with their state legislatures, uh, and their state legislatures and the state government can be engaged with their members of Congress. It, it is really a joint effort. And the states can't be expected to bear this cost by themselves. This would be an act, if, if it were successful, it is likely an act of terror on a broader scale, uh, which is exactly why I think you need to bring to bear federal resources to help in the preparation and then the reaction to those events. The only way you're going to get that message told by the state legislature is to have them engaged in it. And again, these, these state, you know, they have all, all of them have different titles, but their counterterrorism positions should be engaged in this conversation and should be actively working out to talk to their congressional delegation, talking to their senior staff about what their needs are. Um, it can't be just, I need another fire truck. It has to be, we need to be prepared when uh, EMTs show up or firefighters show up to a scene where there may have been a, some kind of a biological weapon discharge. That, I think, is a different conversation and a conversation that has to be had with the individuals who are going to really take the burden of that, of that first response. So that our recommendations ought to include a role for the states. Oh, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Because it's a different coalition when you start adding yeah. state government to. Uh, I, I think that's exactly right. And again, they don't, they're not necessarily going to have the resources that the federal government right. is going to have. And they can be great advocates for allowing those countermeasures to be deployed. Yeah. And you're, you're going to want to do this in a way, it, you know, what I, one of the things we found after 9-11 is that everybody wanted everything all at the same time. It, it's not possible. So you do have to put a threat matrix together that says, you know, the upper peninsula of Michigan is an important place, certainly for me, but maybe it doesn't rise to the level of getting the first uh, maybe 10 tranches of money for a, for a terrorism event. 
He says that now that he's out. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's saying. Say that now. <laughs> I couldn't have said that probably three months ago. Um, yeah. What I really meant to say was Upper Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to correct the record, if I may, on that. And so this is the challenge that I think you all have, as well as the legislators have, is making sure that, yes, when there's a good idea, you know, candidly, if, it, if we're not doing New York City and Los Angeles and, and the places that we know uh, are on the immediate hit list, then shame on us. Now, they shouldn't get it all but they should also probably be pretty high on our priority list because we know that those are targets for terrorist activities. Doesn't mean the other ones aren't and wouldn't be, uh, but that's the challenge. That's how you engage those state yeah. legislatures, but all of them ought to have be a part of this conversation. I think it's a great uh, comment you make there. I, I think from time to time uh, we need to remind people inside the Beltway, and you and I and all of us have been privileged to have a substantial career, significant careers and opportunities to serve here. You can't secure the country from inside the Beltway. Exactly. Uh, you can't do it from a physical point of view, you can't do it from a cyber point of view, you can't do it from the issues that we're talking about. You need to develop those relationships, and there's no important relationships I'm speaking as a governor, former governor, but you, you, you can't secure the country from inside the Beltway, so how we reach out to engage uh, the governors and the big city mayors and their uh, adjutant generals, their counterterrorism chiefs, I think is absolutely critical across the board for all the threats that we face, not just this one. Ken, do you have a question? Can sure. I make, make a suggestion? Maybe going to some of these governor presentations yeah. would be really helpful to, to play a role both uh, in the, the, the Democrat version, the Republican version, and, NGA. Then the, and then the NGA. But I do them all. Yeah. Yeah. And the organization because, of state legislators. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are great hits for the for the panel's release right. and the study and having staff participate in those and, and try to draw people in that way I think would be yeah. really effective. Ken? Thanks. Um, first, thanks for your insightful comments today and your long distinguished service to the nation. Um, one of the panels later on today is going to focus on leadership in this area and sort of assess what leadership has been in place and what leadership hasn't been in place over the years. And you've talked about the fact that there's sort of a lack of focus, a lack of con you know sufficient level of concern about what is a real serious threat. And at the end of the day, it really is the executive branch, at least at the federal level, that's got to carry that ball. The executive branch sort of has to need, it has to maintain the strategic focus on a threat like that that might not be one that is on the front pages every day. Uh, you've had a front row seat, you know, for a number of years watching the executive branch and the function or dysfunction of the executive branch as it relates to this issue. Um, there have been a number of different proposals over the years for a, uh, a WMD czar at the White House, for you know different positions at the White House and the interagency process to try to raise the profile of this this issue and and try to raise the level of coordination among all the the uh, stakeholders in the executive branch. Do you have any thoughts about where there might be gaps right now in terms of leadership within the executive branch, structural organizational changes you might recommend, um, and an assessment of sort of what you've seen that has worked in the past and hasn't worked in terms of driving this issue within the executive branch. Yeah, when, it's an anecdotal story. So when we had first decided we better get engaged in this early on based on the threats that we were seeing come across our desks, we said, why don't we get the, the biodefense, the administration, the executive branch, not the administration, but the executive branch guru on bioterrorism. And that's the same look that we got back, right? Right. They, right. right? they all went, uh, uh, well, we, we mm -hmm. know who are experts on it, and they were, we found those folks, uh, but there really was no coordinating effort. And this is what I found really interesting, even in the biomeasure bills that we produced, we still had one flaw that we never were able to get over, and that was that. Because now you're asking people who are engaged every single day in very serious matters of public health to deal with something that has to do with terrorism that is, it's a little off, mm -hmm. it's a little off, out of their lane. I mean, obviously they understand the, the medical consequences, but it was a little out of their lane to try to figure out, well, like, I, I'm worried about, you know, getting, keeping my hospital emergency rooms open. Why am I, why am I worried about this again? And it wasn't necessarily a bad thing, it just wasn't in their lane. So I do think that there is some value in trying to find some place that you can coordinate all of the information of threat and integrate it with the public health side of it. Because there's always going to be a difference of opinion or a different, not, not necessarily a difference of opinion, but just a different attitude mm -hmm. about it. So if you're in the intelligence business and your design is to stop threats against the United States, you see this as, and this is your job to worry about this, you see it here. If you're a public health person worried about all the other things that are on your desk right now, this is probably pretty low. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you reconcile that? And I think there's probably, 
you, a little cross pollination would be good uh, to have some of the ability for uh, HHS folks to have the exposure of some of the, uh, the very sensitive uh, classified information on threat matrix mm -hmm. on biodefense and then have having the opportunity for intelligence folks to be over there. I don't know if you need to create a new, because every time we do this, there, it comes with a whole organization that comes mm -hmm. with. Um, and you know, Secretary Ridge wouldn't know anything about yeah. that. Would <laughs> 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 and so I, I get a little nervous about saying, yeah, let's do, the, let's do a single point of contact that has all the authority. I think you can push it a different way. And then ask your secretaries to find out who they want to appoint as the point person on these issues. And I think that is a, it's a management function that works in the private sector, could work in the public sector. As long as somebody knows that they've been appointed with the authority to, to cross-pollinate on these issues, they'll do it. Uh, the problem is they always lack that bit of authority, you know, even if it's a memo saying this, you're the person on this and you're going to work with this person or this position, because those people change, this position in Intel, this person in Intel will work with this position in fill in the blank, whatever department that makes sense, HHS. I think you can get much more out of it. And then as a regular management structure, have those briefings come back to Congress. It forces them to go through the management process of making sure those relationships work. And I think it would be a lot cheaper. Well, you know, we, we, we continue to struggle with that, that, that epicenter, that coordinating uh, effort that you mentioned. Uh, I can sp also speak from experience uh, is that one of the ways you affect uh, change in this town is you control the purse strings. Um, and uh, whether or not uh, this person should end up being part of OMB as they go out uh, and uh, mm -hmm. deal with, with, with dollars, but we're, we're grateful for, you, for your thoughts in that regard because that, that kind of interagency inter -agency collaboration is uh, critically important to the separate because there's so much jurisdictional overlap. And as you pointed out, the priorities, depending on the jurisdiction, vary dramatically. Huge, huge. And that's why we always have this mm -hmm. problem of yeah. coming to a common, yeah. and it's, it's really by the design of the departments. It's not. Yeah. They're designed to solve these sets of problems, and yeah. these are these nuanced problems that don't exactly fit. Yeah. Well, to be fair, inbox. the congressional committee structure also doesn't lend itself to integrating oh, funding. I, trust me, I know. The yeah, committee, yeah. Uh, the, the congressional committee infrastructure doesn't lend itself to much productivity. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it's just maddening to me that, the, that I think even the DNI has. Something in the order of 22 different committees he has to show up and testify in front of. And candidly, Congress needs to get its act together. We're very good about telling everyone else why they ought to get their act together. Really, this and and if you wanted to be a bit bold in your report, you may you may suggest not to fix the whole thing because that'd get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, but f to to try to limit to a reasonable number of cross committee reports because how much time how much staff time do we spend? in these departments trying to get ready for yeah. those briefings. I mean, 22 briefings, so any big event happens that you, we lose the DNI for a period of a month, coming up to 22 different committees, some of which will have jurisdictional director, <laughs> jurisdictional impact, of which you would want them to, to be in front of, and some you kind of scratch your head and go, now why is he why is he there testifying there? What, or what are we getting out of that? What, what, produ what productivity is happening? Yeah. It, it is that may be a whole new blue ribbon panel of uh, which well, I, I we're particularly I empathetic up here because <laughs> DNI only had 22. Yeah, know, Secretary yeah. of Homeland Security has over 100, so I the know. DNI is getting off easy. But you're right, <laughs> I mean, and I thought maybe we ought to take a look at the restructuring. Mm -hmm. It's not such a bad idea. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. that. It would be a great blue ribbon panel yeah. in, in and of itself. But you could even That's use a good. section here, yeah. just saying if you want That's to streamline how this gets done. Yep. And forces that management structure of the relationship. I think you could do it, but you'd, do it, you'd have to do it with a much smaller number of committees so you weren't spending all of your time briefing the 100, 100 committees on. And by the way, all the 100 committees won't focus on that anyway, which is part, the other part of the problem. You can't get any focus on it uh, because it's just so broad and you're going to spend your time up on the hill talking to 100 different, and not that it isn't fun and delightful for you to do that. <laughs> It's much more fun when you're on top of the dais rather than sitting <laughs> in that chair. I just sure. see that right we've now. Got, we've got for reform advisory right committee. Debbie? Yeah. Uh, Congressman, you mentioned this interesting concept and challenge of the fact that countermeasures only have one customer. And that's something that you and I worked together with, Bar with BARDA uh, when I was over at HHS and back up on the Hill. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how BARDA is working? Is it properly incentivizing the right countermeasures? I'm not really interested in the funding question per se, which you alluded to, but whether FARTA is doing the job it was designed to do. Effectively. 
Great. It's great to see you again. It's great to work with you on that. Uh, that that's a pretty difficult question. So in the beginning, we had countermeasures that existed that were looking for outlets. So now you have this new funding stream, and they're trying to plug in as fast as they can. Right? And it's all good, right? They have a lot of dead weight cost in the development of those products. And I think to your point is, is that the most efficient way to try to get a countermeasure that is, that is pretty sophisticated? Um, and if you recall, at that time, there was a big debate on anthrax. Uh, and the next generation of anthrax that didn't require the, the number of shots, and I forget the exact number now, it was 13, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in countermeasure shot, which is a very long, pretty tough process, uh, pretty, was pretty difficult to convince um, first responders to go through this regime. The military didn't have a choice. Right? You're told you're going to get it, you, you get it. Uh, first responders were thinking, thanks, but no thanks, that sounds like a problem. And did that process in and of itself slow down the next generation of, of anthrax? Um, I, I'm not sure I know that. I'd have to look at all the information. I do think we finally got over that hurdle, and I think this last go-round with the merchant showed that they got the hint that they had to step up their game. And it is now a much different, much more efficient uh, prophylactic measure that they can apply. It's not 13, I forget what, maybe down to three. I, I, I shouldn't say the numbers because I'm not, sh I, I don't know well enough to, to go there. Uh, but that is something that we're going to always have to watch uh, on, the, on the value of that money. You do want a slice of that money challenging the next generation of countermeasures, much like the market would do on its own. But without that market push, it's not going to happen. So I do think that the fund has to operate in a way that takes a little money and says, we are willing to bet on the next generation product, uh, and you are going to have to improve your product, or we may go in another direction. Without that market pressure that's not really market pressure, I worry that the outcome will be mediocre countermeasures for 20, 30 years. So, so how would you apportion those researchers? What, what, what percent would you assign to that future looking? Well, I'd have to think about that, because you, you want to get that part right, because one of the things that we didn't have in the beginning was any stockpiling of countermeasures pretty low and getting low. And so we had two two problems facing us, and I say us, I mean the, the Congress and the, and the administration. You didn't want to not have the appropriate level of countermeasures stockpiled in case there was an event. And we knew, by the way, that terrorists were interested in this particular, mm -hmm. anthrax was something they were interested in. Anthrax is something that they could actually produce here in the United States. They didn't have to import it. All the problems that went with it were concerned. So, that one, I think you have to almost take an individual case. We needed stockpiled anthrax uh, vaccines. I, 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 when we looked at that, we said, if we don't do this yesterday, we're making a big mistake, which is what we ended up doing. Then the push came in, well, there's this new generation of recumbent anthrax vaccines and you know, fill in the blank. That's when you have to start asking yourself, okay, when we hit our stockpile number, is that the time you can free up more percentage for the next generation? So if they have a five-year contract, say, you're going to have to work. That five-year contract might not be yours in five years. You're going to have to work on the next generation. Or we are going to take this money and invest in other companies. And what that percentage is, I'm not sure I know. And I would also base it on what the threat is. Uh, clearly, I'm, I'm nervous about this bubonic plague. They found it on ISIS computers not that long ago. This is something they're thinking about. And if they're thinking about it, we better start thinking about how we react to it. And all of those things are going to change. What percentage that is? I'm sure. I'm not sure. I'm qualified to sit right here, not right now, and tell you that. Thank you. Accurate. Thanks. Thanks for your work, by the way. Scooter. Uh, thank you for your. Excuse service. me, Dr. Libby. Yes, Dr. Libby. In this topic, um, you said something which I think was quite important, but I want to make sure I understood it properly. I believe you said that terrorists now have open space to pursue this area. What did you mean by that? Well, I mean, if you look at ISIS today, they own and occupy <coughs> land about the size of Indiana. Um, and so when you have that much open space, and they did take government facilities, that pr just presents an opportunity for them to be more engaged in research and development than I feel comfortable with. Uh, and so by owning that much space, and as you can see, it's th that's not going well. Um, and any comments to the contrary just are not accurate. They, are, they continue to hold ground, they continue to push back, they continue to frustrate uh, 
opportunities to disrupt their ability to have research and development centers right now. They have research and development centers. And I, I argue that's, that is a dangerous combination for us and our European allies. And so that's what I was referring to. They have that open space to do that. So they have territory today and the ability to do these things that they haven't had since they were knocked out of Afghanistan in 2001? I would say this is worse than 2001 because in Afghanistan, at, they, didn't, they had freedom of operation there in a way to plan events. Now they have capability for the research and development part that they would have had to work really hard at in those areas just for capability. In other words, the capability to do that in the tribal areas of, of both Pakistan and, and Afghanistan in the east didn't lend itself to the, that you could do pretty rudimentary stuff. It's dangerous in and of itself. But they use that to plan physical attacks. Here you have the opportunity to do both because now you have an infrastructure. You have electricity 24 hours a day. You have access to engineering materials and, and, and chemistry in a way you wouldn't have had before. Lab space, wet lab space. All the things that make you cringe a little bit if you're thinking about what comes out of there and what its intended purpose is. And so the longer they have freedom of operation in any space that contains those kind of elements, I think that's dangerous to the United States and our European allies. Europe first, I would argue. Anything else? Yes. Thomas. So Congressman Rogers, um, we've heard before that members of Congress who are interested in this issue sometimes have trouble getting a full picture of biological threats and the consequences of biological threats. And that sometimes they get very different briefings from different parts of the government um, and hear different things. You obviously have a deep knowledge and focused on this a long time. Do you have suggestions on how to get a more comprehensive picture of the problem before members of Congress in a consistent way, or is that just you know, a, a well, problem? Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm just going to be very candid here. The, the big administration briefings to the whole House, I, I find, and most members will tell you if they're being candid, not valuable. Right, because they're trying to they're trying to hold back as much as they can and not answer certain pieces of questions. You've all been in those briefings. They're really hard to do in a, a group that big. Some people are interested in the issue. Some people will get up to the microphone and ask you about you know the, the, the bridge and fill in the blank and why haven't you protected that? You know, Governor Rich, you know, why or whatever. I mean, it was some of these things you just kind of scratch your head. So you have to find a venue that's focused on aspirational interests of terrorist groups. We used to do this when I was chairman. We would try to do this when we had the, uh, I even hate, can't believe I'm going to mention this, the NSA leaker issue, to try to get members who were not in the national security space connected to what the facts were about, A, what happened, what does the government actually do, in a way that we could protect sensitive information. And that, I, I found that to be very valuable. And so we cross-pollinated. We had briefers. And again, you don't necessarily, you don't, need, you don't need cabinet level officials to do these briefings. You really need operational people giving these briefings who can ask really detailed, answer really detailed questions, technological ones. In some cases, that might be your cabinet secretary. In a lot of cases, it'll be not even, you know, well below any political appointed position in the government. These are working operators doing this work for and so we found by putting them in a room and, uh, and exposing members in smaller groups, uh, they felt comfortable in asking the question. You know, half of it, if I don't know anything about biodefense, I certainly don't want to look like an idiot when I'm in the meeting, right? Which is why you won't see me asking very complicated questions about agriculture, right? I, I think I'll leave that to someone who knows better. You want them to have the opportunity to ask a question in this meeting in a classified setting where they can feel comfortable walking out having known and been exposed to this. And yet you can do that and open up the security clearance a little bit. You can open that aperture in a way that they'll have a better understanding of why folks worry about the things we worry about. The body. I think that's a much better way to do it. You can also do it through, uh, you know, the Hudson Institute think tanks can play an important role in this. You just won't be able to have the nitty gritty classified portion, but you can give a strong historical look uh, based on what we do know today. And there's a lot of it out there on what this aspirational threat is for staff, for, you know, and that to me, we shouldn't ignore that, for staff uh, and members who are willing to participate in a way that's easy for them to get there, short, and impactful. Uh, I found it was valuable, I think members found it was valuable. Big cattle calls don't work. I just don't think they work. One final question, Dr. Alexander. Yes, uh, Congressman, to follow up uh, on your point about 
about the role of uh, educational institutions like the Austin um, Institute, um, dealing with the perception of the threat, not only in terms of Congress, but in terms of the civic society. And my question to you is, what, for example, the media, or the role of the media is in order to deal with that particular challenge, not only in terms of uh, weapons of mass destruction, but uh, cyber threats and some other threats, and the question of priorities in terms of understanding what is really the top priority uh, to deal with this uh, issue and what Congress can do. Yeah. Gosh, if I, if someone can tell me how the media works, and, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a new member of that media for about 60 days, I'd really like to know. Um, these are really hard and complicated issues, and you really, it's very hard to fit into a 15 second or a 30 second sound, but I don't care if you're talking cyber or biodefense. And unfortunately, the only way to get attention is to say, uh, you know, when, when, remember when the, the cloud got violated and the people had their very personal and intimate pictures, they had to be star, Hollywood stars, right? That got people's attention, mainly because they wanted to go see the stars they liked naked, <laughs> unfortunately, right? And so, but how do you have that conversation about what happened, what allowed them to crack into the cloud, get into what was a secure server, steal something that people wanted to be kept private? That was the conversation we should have had. We never had that conversation publicly. And the media never allowed us to have that conversation publicly. Same with biodefense. I find it very difficult to get people interested because it's not right in your face. It's not right there. Now, it could, should be, right? Remember the, the, the train station attack in Japan, the sarin gas, right? I mean, scary stuff. Took the lives of real people, just commuting to work every day. The kind of activity we know they're interested in the very vulnerabilities we have in this country in our larger cities about how would you how would you react to something that bad it's just really hard because it isn't something that has exactly happened here think of the chemical weapon we, we had a very difficult time getting their attention when I was chairman on the impact of chemical weapons and what exactly that meant when they were starting to use these stockpiles and what those stockpiles were and what was available for them to use Right? That's, I thought that was a really important discussion to have in the media. We never really had that discussion. But it was really hard to get it out. So I, that's a terrible answer, only because I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. I do think it's just, you know, you have to keep at it. Uh, and the best way you can make an impact is if you are making an impact with members of Congress and policymakers in the executive branch, then that starts to take on a weight of its own. And when that start takes, people start getting interested in trying to fix the problem, I think that's how you get there. And it is a combination of all that. You got to get legislators, you got to get executive branch professionals, all of those people kind of saying, yeah, we agree that this is a problem and we need to do something about it. What's next? That's a long process. The media can play a part in that. You hope they do. I hate to say it, I wouldn't count on it. It's just really hard to have hard conversations in the media today. We want to thank you on behalf of the panel. Thank you on behalf of the Hudson Institute, of which you are a fellow. Thank you for thank your you. extraordinary public service. and. Uh, a very thoughtful, refreshing, and candid uh, assessment of some of these issues we brought before you. And I guess as a fellow of the Institute, we may be back as we pull the report together to get, uh, uh, maybe to make sure we got the details right, particularly in the areas that we talked about today. So, Mike, we thank you. can't thank you enough for your, your public well, service. Thank you for your public service, yeah. Secretary. Thank you for yours. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having me today. I appreciate it. And when I said the media was not quite getting it right, I didn't mean CNN. No, they are exactly getting it right. <laughs> wink, wink. No, yeah, got it, got it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure that guy, they still let me in the building. Good to see you. Okay. Thank you so very, very much. Thank, Thank you. So you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin now with the response and recovery uh, session. Uh, we're going to have five panels <clears throat> today. We've you. got a lot to be uh, tucked into a five and a half hour time period. Uh, so we're uh, grateful for your patience and, more importantly, for your participation. Uh, we're going to talk about the revolt of uh, pre-event activities, public health response, pharmaceutical response, recovery and mitigation, and finally we're going to take a look at uh, some advice of some people with regard to uh, leadership in the public and private sector as it relates to the efforts of the panel. So we invite the first panel to uh, come to the front. I'm going to make the introductions brief. 
and uh, please join us. The panel on pre-event activities and emergency response. Chief Keith Bryant, the Fire Chief of the Oklahoma City Fire Department. He is President and Chairman of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. Dr. Matthew Minson, Senior Advisor for Health Affairs at Aggie, Texas A&M University. <laughs> and Dr. Carter Meacher, Senior Medical Advisor, Office of Public Health, Department of Veteran Affairs. Uh, former Director for Medical Preparedness Policy, Homeland Security Council and National Security Staff under both President Bush and uh, President Obama. Gentlemen, uh, I, the introductions could be a lot longer. We thank you for your service and your contribution this morning. And uh, Chief, let's start with you. Thank you, Governor Ridge. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, it's uh, an honor for me to be here this morning. Uh, again, and I appreciate the, the, the short introduction. That's just fine with me. Um, but as uh, the president and uh, chairman of the board of the International Association of Fire Chiefs, I represent over 11,000 leaders of the nation's fire, rescue, and emergency medical service. And it's on their behalf this morning that I'm honored to be here to speak to you about the response issues relating to the threat of terrorism using chemical or biological Everyone agents. here in the back? All right, you can check the microphone. Make sure it's working. I notice some people in the back are having a difficult time hearing, so. All right, very good. As you stated in your opening remarks, and as our previous speaker uh, just mentioned, also the, the threat of terrorism uh, using uh, biological agents or chemical agents in, in the U.S. is very real. Obviously, we've seen several examples over the years of uh, biological agents such as anthrax and, and ricin being used in, in various events, and, and certainly uh, the, um, the availability of industrial chemicals and toxic chemicals that are out there. In, in, society today uh, represent also a, a very real threat and obviously there's different levels of vulnerability in, in various communities across the country. According to the U.S. Bureau of Transportation Statistics, U.S. Census Bureau's 2007 Commodity Flow Survey, 2.2 billion tons corresponding to 323 billion ton miles of hazardous materials are shipped by air, road, rail, and pipeline in the United States annually. Uh, obviously, hazardous chemicals are a vital component to the American economy and quality of life. Uh, however, we must realize that extremists can take advantage of weaknesses in the nation's transportation system or chemical facilities to obtain toxic chemicals for nefarious purposes. Um, we see these things in uh, media reports and on social media that there are uh, pro-jihadist uh, groups, uh, ISIL, ISIS, that um, tweeting um, using chemicals for attacks in, in the United States and the, the Global Islamic Media Front published a document known as the Explosives Course which teaches interested parties to use commercially available chemicals to manufacture explosives. So again the threat is very real is something we absolutely have to be prepared for. In terms of response to a terrorist attack, uh, as far as the fire and emergency medical services are concerned, uh, initially that would be treated as any accidental hazardous material release. And that um, once a release of an agent is confirmed, uh, the fire or EMS department in an area would isolate uh, the area involved, uh, stabilize the area uh, to minimize civilian exposure to that agent establish safe uh, zones to make sure that we limit the uh, spread of that agent uh, to unaffected areas. Um, many cities, like my city in Oklahoma City, would uh, deploy their hazardous material response team. In, in other areas, that might be somewhat what more of a regional r response uh, team that would be in place. Uh, those teams would be deployed to use chemical detection technology to ascertain the type of agent released along with the personnel who are trained in the signs and symptoms of chemical and biological agents and, and their effect on, on, on people. Uh, the hazmat teams and other specialized contractors would be in charge of decontaminating the scene. We absolutely would be uh, very reliant on local law enforcement uh, to play a huge role in scene security and begin the investigative activities associated with that event uh, once the incident is identified as a terrorist attack. 
during the response, uh, depending on the, the nature and the complexity of it, the local joint terrorism task force and other state and federal authorities, including National Guard units, uh, would be alerted and brought in to assist. If the attack involves a weaponized chemical or biological agent, military civilian support teams may be required to help with the response. It also be very important in this type of incident to prevent further panic in the area. Uh, our emergency responders would also have to be very cognizant and vigilant about the threat of a secondary device. An important difference between a accidental hazardous <coughs> materials incident and a chemical terrorist attack is the necessity of working with those federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies to pre preserve evidence and maintain scene security for the criminal investigation. A little bit more complex situation might involve an infectious disease such as smallpox and in, in, in that event, uh, public health community would obviously play a large role and then working with us uh, to, uh, to manage that incident. Uh, it'd be important to track down who was exposed to the disease and who came in contact with these patients. And, and, and that, this type of event, uh, again, this is where you see symptoms may not be uh, present or may not arise immediately, but in the ensuing days. Um, although each of these incidents, depending on the agent or chemical involved, uh, might have their own uh, intricacies. Yes. Uh, there are some commonalities within response to a chemical or biological attack. Obviously, accurate information is one of the um, most important aspects of that. And as I stated earlier, one of the goals of a terrorist attack is to cause public panic. It is important that accurate information about the incident be relayed to both the public and responding agencies to, again, eliminate uh, as much panic and, and to, to eliminate as much confusion as possible. Obviously, we're in the age of social media, and um, initially there will be a rush of inaccurate information, and, and it'll be incumbent on authorities to make sure that they, they track that and process that properly in a, in a, in for the reason of trying to get as much accurate information out there as possible so that we could, can keep panic down to a minimum. During the Risa Ebola uh, situation here in the country, uh, you know, firefighters depended on their leadership to provide accurate information about Ebola symptoms, what precautions to take when treating possible Ebola victims, and what steps they should take to prevent them from exposing their families at home. Another common uh, part of a response to a chemical or biological attack would be a in coordinated incident command structure be put in place. Um, Fire, emergency medical services, law enforcement, and emergency management will have to coordinate those efforts uh, with other fields, including public health, as I mentioned, and possibly military or National Guard units. Uh, the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, is designed to provide the capability for federal, state, and local partners across all disciplines to work and operate together. Uh, again, during uh, the recent Ebola scares, there were questions about which organizations would serve as incident commander, and in some cases, decisions were made outside that unified command system, and, and that just tends to co cause a little bit more confusion than, it, than is necessary. Another well, component would I mean, be, excuse NIMS me. has been designed uh, across the board to be deployed at emergency management centers regionally and nationally, but. Uh, uh, well, give me a bit of, I hate to interrupt you, but the, the notion that you got a turf fight jurisdiction when you're trying to deal with a response and recovery effort is, it, it continues to perplex me. Uh, what was the heartburn? Well, I think, again, when you bring in maybe the public health community that ordinarily might not be involved in an emergency, uh, especially in the immediate stages of a, an emergency type of incident, and again, when you're dealing with uh, something such as a, a Ebola, uh, if, if, if they haven't been used to it and you haven't been exercising the, the NIMS program uh, on a, on a, in a training environment, um, every component of that or everybody that might be brought in to manage that incident may not be used to, to right. operating in that, in that type of structure. I appreciate that. I'm sorry, I won't interrupt you anymore. I thought that's fine. And another important component of the response is training, and it's just absolutely essential that local first responders train for potential acts of terrorism involving chemical or biological agents on a regular basis. 
these events are low frequency but, but uh, very high risk, which means that there will be a few actual veterans of these types of responses. Um, again, from the Ebola situation, we learned that firefighters will have a better confidence in the response and their leadership if they have adequate information, <coughs> high quality training, and the appropriate personal protective equipment. Um, and as an example, uh, maybe what I'm talking about, there were a number of YouTube videos recently about how to remove your personal protective equipment after exposure to Ebola <coughs> patients, which were, to be very frank, dangerously incorrect and misleading. And obviously, uh, availability and, and, and having the necessary equipment, as I led into, that uh, is essential that first responders have adequate amounts of necessary equipment to respond to these types of uh, attacks. Uh, the International Association of Fire Chiefs recommends that local fire departments be able to stabilize the situation for at least 72 hours before federal assistance arrives. Uh, again, one of our concerns from recent events is that uh, we found that there was six to eight week back order of the personal protective equipment necessary for Ebola responses. In terms of preparedness for a chemical or biological attack, um, a few recommendations for ensuring effectiveness would be one that the federal government must provide accurate and timely uh, threat information to local first responders uh, considering the, the multitude of potential threats and certainly uh, we still see budgetary constraints of local government uh, local first responders need to know which threats for they should uh, that they should prepare for Groups are promoting violent extremis, extremism and publishing uh, training materials on the internet or social media. The federal government should provide information to the local governments about what tactics and techniques are being taught, again, in order for those local entities and agencies to be uh, prepared. Uh, the local Joint Terrorism Task Force, state or local intelligence fusion centers are, have, are working to build strong relationships uh, with local law enforcement. Uh, to help local fire and emergency medical service departments to obtain this information. Chief, I'll tell you what, I, I know you've got a <coughs> lengthy testimony. I'd like you to submit it uh, as a part of the record here, and we'd be pleased to review it. I think your colleagues have uh, significant statements to review as well. Uh, we'd like those submitted as part of the record, and uh, if you would kind enough to conclude, Chief, if there's anything sure. you want to uh, conditionally to add. I, uh, this is a very important panel. I'd like to give uh, the board and the advisory board an opportunity to really interact with you. Absolutely, okay? sir. Thanks, sir. And then I'll just wrap up by saying again that uh, it, you know it's, it's very important for federal, state, and local agencies to, to plan, exercise uh, for potential incidents using chemical or biological agents. Uh, the private sector obviously has a, a, a big role to play in that as well as working with those same uh, with, with the governmental and, and, and agencies, both at a a local, state, and federal level, and uh, continued training uh, obviously is vital component. Uh, the equipment, again, uh, some local agencies are very reliant on grant programs that exist out there right now to provide them with that necessary equipment and training. Uh, so again, uh, just can't stress enough the uh, collaboration that needs to take place from all levels of government, uh, from the local level on up through the federal. Uh, be prepared for these types of incidents and once again thank you for allowing me to be here this morning I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, we're, Chief we're grateful for your participation and stay tuned we'll come back at you I got a couple questions to start yes, with, one with my colleagues. Doctor. Thank you very much. Um, again my name is Matt Minson I'm uh, the Senior Advisor for Health Affairs at the Texas Engineering Extension Service at Texas A&M University. I also have a private sector practice uh, in occupational environmental medicine as the medical director for Superior Energy Services, and that may actually be germane to some of the comments I'll have. Um, I, I've been asked to speak specifically, we've talked about the pre-hospital sector, I'm, I'm going to speak more specifically to the healthcare system vulnerabilities and issues that may be associated with that. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that in, in, most, in most of these settings, the first request is actually an, adv an advocacy for additional funding. That's, I'm going to focus away from that, actually, although I would say that they certainly can use the resources. I'll also offer that, that absent adequate and appropriate strategies for those resources, that is money that is misspent and often to the point of folly, and I think it's very important that we, we kind of look at some of the issues that are taking place organically in the healthcare system and how that might actually affect what we do with those strategies. 
And so on that point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually kind of give a quick address to some, some issues that we know. Um, healthcare systems are in general in competition. Uh, they are businesses, and uh, we expect them to somehow uniformly and seamlessly integrate uh, during an adverse event. This will be especially arduous when we're talking about things like infectious disease type scenarios or biodefense issues. Um, coalescence of healthcare systems, it's important to understand how these things came to be. Healthcare systems, generally speaking, are corporations, and in that capacity, they grow like other corporations, either organically by having great practices and, and accomplishing the marketplace, or by acquisition, in which case the acquisition may be by a distressed asset or company that ultimately is vulnerable to uh, assimilating their procedures and policies, or they, they actually acquire a successful entity that is doing things well and thus may be somewhat resistant to taking on these new policies. In any case, we often see that those situations allow for some integration, but incongruence, if you will, between platforms of things like software, communication, <coughs> and the like. Those become vulnerabilities when we talk about an untoward event such as a bio disaster. And I think that's very important to understand, so that when we say, well, why didn't the electronic medical record transition, or why didn't this happen, that may be why. And that needs to be understood in advance uh, of, of some of these preparedness activities. Uh, inventory that resources the hospitals actually has gone more to a just-in-time platform. That is very different than what we anticipated with regard to massive stockpiling and warehousing capabilities. This is good for business, not so good for disasters sometimes. Um, there have been many government programs that have addressed this or tried to address this with regard to resourcing of strategic stockpiles and things of that nature. Um, but that's still an area, and the chief illustrated that when he talked about the PPE issue that there are still gaps and vulnerabilities that we need to think about when we start to talk about these sorts of things. Um, there are a couple of social, uh, I, I want to talk about the human resource issue associated with healthcare because I think that's very important as well. Um, one of the major breakdowns is human error or human issue. And um, it's to be understood and anticipated, I think, sometimes. But understanding the, the way that healthcare workers are going to integrate in the system now and how it's changing, I think, is instrumental to preparing appropriately. Um, one can think as recently as 10 to 15 years ago that the relationship that a physician might have had with the healthcare system was that they were an independent contractor. They billed insurance for the patient or did something like that, um, and they were an advocate for the patient, but they then had a different leveraging sort of position, if you will, with the healthcare system. Um, nurses traditionally were employees of the healthcare system. That paradigm actually is inverted now, where we're seeing that in many cases, um, nurses are actually part of a group that actually practices and, and works, if you will, on an agency basis. Physicians more and more, and we're seeing this out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics analysis, where they, they, their anticipation is that we're looking at 75 percent of physicians may well be employees. That changes both the concept and the compensation and reward mechanisms associated with those groups. This is important. Uh, this is an economic, organic reality that I think needs to be understood when we talk about preparedness issues. Similarly speaking, I like the background music. That's wonderful. Um, the, Sorry. No, no, that's, that's perfectly fine. I, I, think, I think there was an issue out of Ebola that actually illustrated this. In the canvassing of the nursing population or nurses that were involved, um, this number stood out that when they asked nurses for their familiarity or having read the disaster, if you will, plan or the contingency plan for, for their hospital, 8% uh, acknowledged that they had. That's a disturbing number. That number was reported in the media. Uh, whether that's accurate or not, I think it was an informal survey. But, but it does belie an issue there. And I think some of these organic things I talked about with regard to the way they integrate now uh, probably speak to that. I've, I've been trained and have been taught almost to a punitive extreme that I'm not supposed to bring problems to the table without offering some solutions. And so I'm going to try to do that now. Um, I, I think that what we really need to do with the human resource issue is think about what we would do in terms of training and socialization strategies with regard to the personnel. Um, the way to do that, I believe, and, and there's been a lot of support and discussion about this, is to actually look at this in terms of an old military construct of other duties that's assigned or battle stations. So if, you, if you're on the ship and you peel potatoes or you're a cook, you also have a battle station that you go to during a bad time. The healthcare, if you will, cohort might well be served by that. And, and there are mechanisms for this to happen uh, for paramedics or EMTs. Uh, there are state certifying agencies that actually allow these people to have the credentials necessary to go out and do the job they're going to do. Uh, there are state boards of uh, medical examiners or state medical boards. And there are nursing boards, similarly. Um, where those are different, if you will, from the organizations of board certifications is
is that we're talking about licensure issues, and that is instrumental to these people being able to function. I think that those are excellent mechanisms. Um, in many states, there, there have been some analyses done, the University of Maryland did an analysis of 62 jurisdictions with regard to advanced nurse practitioner um, uh, provisions in, in their statutes. And it was very interesting in looking at that because there, there, there are dissimilarities, uh, but there are a greater number of similarities. And uh, to understand how, how then a compulsion, if you will, in terms of renewal of CMEs and whatnot might include, if you will, some preparedness mechanism, I think might be very valuable and hasn't been fully, I think, explored. Similarly with physicians, we're seeing more and more specific CMEs being called out, such as ethics and whatnot. Um, it makes sense that this might also be a, a piece that could be taken on. Um, and that would also engage the community to advise on that, and I think you'd get a better return on, on the effort in that case. Um, uh, I mentioned the boards. I'd also offer that for hospitals and healthcare systems proper, um, there has been a great deal of discussion about how we would engage in the term healthcare coalitions or regionalization as far as approaches uh, are concerned should be undertaken. I, I do support that. Healthcare coalitions are large, monstrous animals in terms of what they entail. Uh, many different equities, many different types of su supervisory mechanisms. So you're talking about an entire community associated also with the healthcare system. Um, it's valuable, it's the most successful mechanism, it's also the broadest one, I think. Um, and so it's going to have unique challenges. For hospitals and healthcare entities, we saw during Ebola, uh, and we see under steady state considerations with regard to a variety of types of pathologies, trauma, burns, heart attacks or cardiac care, and strokes, um, we've seen that there are stratifications within healthcare systems of different hospitals being a level this versus a level that and how patients are transferred or handled. It, it doesn't make sense that we would depart from that for something like biodefense or, or an issue like this. And I think Ebola actually illustrated and supported that. We ended up ultimately with centers for Ebola care uh, with an understanding that hospitals would then feed those patients to them if someone presented, if you will, through the emergency department. Um, I, I think this is an area where some, uh, some organization like the Joint Commission would be very valuable. They've already undertaken this with a lot of other uh, specific types of uh, healthcare considerations or specialties. And so um, I, I think that that would be a great area for additional consideration to take place. Um, the Joint Commission is, is wonderful in, in the way they execute this. I think that they could be of invaluable service in helping to uh, bolster sort of both the insensible and, and sensible aspects of the healthcare system. So I, I, I'm out of breath, and I think I've exhausted attention. I'm going to yield the floor to a learned colleague at this point. Sir, thank you, Dr. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to address the panel. I'd like to focus my remarks by using the example of one of the more difficult scenarios, a wide, wide area aerosolized anthrax release. This scenario illustrates many of the challenges we face in preparing for and responding to bio threats. Wide area anthrax release scenario poses complexi complexities generally not seen in a typical hazardous materials release. Clearly definable contaminated areas would not be known, and may be spread over a large area. Because contaminated, contamination levels throughout the entire affected area cannot be known with precision, it follows that everyone across a broad geographical area must be assumed to be at risk. And as a result, responders would need to assume that all people in that area, on the order of several million in most metropolitan areas, require immediate antimicrobial post-exposure prophylaxis. In the context of that scenario, I'd like to highlight a few key issues for consideration. First, although we tend to focus on the public health and medical consequences of a large-scale biological attack, it would be much more than a public health emergency. It would be a national security crisis. By definition, this would not be a naturally occurring disease outbreak. It would not behave as such. This would be the work of a thinking, plotting, and reacting enemy and that enemy could combine multiple bioagents, engineer the bioagent to be resistant to our countermeasures, or even use conventional weapons to attack potential secondary targets of opportunity, such as large crowds of people gathered together at points of dispensing or pods. And due to the delay uh, of potentially more than 24 hours to recognize a covert attack with our current biodetection bio detection capabilities, consider the domestic and international travel into and out of our major U.S. cities in that time period, in that 24-hour period from the, the moment of attack to the moment of recognition of an attack. By the time an attack is recognized, individuals who might have been exposed to anthrax could be scattered across the country, and in fact, scattered across the globe. 
Moreover, an attack anywhere would heighten concerns for all major metro areas everywhere due to the concern of reload and secondary attacks. That means an event may be international in scope by the time it is even recognized. Second, the immediate response of distributing and dispensing effective countermeasures to the population of a major metro area in the opening hours is critical to prevent catastrophic loss of life. <clears throat> the challenges associated with completing this time-sensitive task are significant. In the event of an anthrax attack, oral antibiotics would need to be started within 48 hours of exposure um, to anthrax spores to minimize illness and death. And the prophylactic antibiotics are effective only if given before illness or symptoms occur. Because there is an inherent delay in notification with the existing detection system, responders would likely have far less than 40 hours to complete that task. Third, there is little that can be done after this initial period to make up or recover from a failure to provide a post-exposure prophylaxis. The response, including the federal government's assistance, must be immediate and cannot fail. That is why the preparedness and response efforts have been so front-loaded, uh, focusing really on the opening moves um, of this immediate mission, the rapid distribution and dispensing of countermeasures. The challenge the federal government faces is how to assist cities within this narrow time window. And if our response is not fast enough, lives hang in the balance. Therein lie the most pressing challenges that we face. One, the rapid detection and identification of a bio threat. Two, the immediate coordination and mobilization of an all of government, in fact, all of nation response, um, immediate access to life-saving medications and vaccines, and the maintenance of public safety and security, without which the distribution and dispensing of life-saving medications would be impossible. Given these, given these challenges, the usual expectation that a local jurisdiction is on its own for the first 48 hours during a disaster does not apply to the scenario of a bio-attack. The immediate challenges have been described as the four Ds, uh, and, and to simplify the challenge we face, detect, decide, distribute, and dispense. Improving the speed of detection and confirmation of an attack, informing and accelerating decision making in a setting that would likely be chaotic and confusing are critical to mobilize a timely and effective response that minimizes loss of life. This all presumes we have the capability to detect an attack, we have biodetection and biosurveillance capabilities, we have the means to coordinate and mobilize an immediate all-of-government response to help maintain public safety and security and assist with the distribution and dispensing of countermeasures. And three, we have the adequate supplies of effective uh, medical countermeasures available to dispense in the first place. I'll focus on the second and third and fourth Ds. I assume that others have addressed the, the issues of surveillance and biodetection and its importance of, of, of recognizing a, a bio, bio attack. In terms of the second D, decide or decision making, um, the federal government already has protocols for, uh, for coordinating an all of government response to other rapidly evolving threats such as maritime and aviation threats. In 2011, the federal government established an analogous protocol for responding to bio threats, the Biological Assessment and Threat Response, or BATTER. Um, the purpose of BATTER was to ready the entire federal government to respond to, an, to a major bio threat by enhancing and accelerating biosituational awareness and decision making in order to more effectively direct all the resources of the federal government to support an immediate response. It's important that a batter like process, I understand that the acronym has changed over time, is regularly exercised and especially important that the triggers for activating that process include scenarios where uncertainty, ambiguity, and indecision might delay recognition of and response to a bio threat. The last two Ds, distribute and dispense, are among the most daunting. We face a time distance challenge that is bounded by the physics of reality. How quickly can we mobilize the SNS and distribute and dispense antibiotics to millions of Americans? How could we mobilize federal personnel and assets in time to assist with maintaining public safety and security, as well as assisting with countermeasure distribution and dispensing? I'll quickly just mention one strategy. One strategy for mobilizing federal uh, personnel and assets in time is to make a difference, is to leverage the federal personnel and assets already in place, working and living in or near the impacted city. One federal agency with expertise in distribution is the Postal Service. The Postal Service is the second largest federal agency in the federal government with approximately 600,000 employees. Nearly one out of every four federal employees work for the U.S. Postal Service. And they're present in all communities across the United States. Six days each week, they exercise a the capability for reaching every household and business in the United States in an eight-hour period. The 
potential advantages of leveraging the Postal Service capabilities to deliver antibiotics are readily apparent. In 2009, the President signed Executive Order 13527 for establishing federal capability for the timely provision of medical countermeasures following a biological attack. The postal model was singled out and mentioned first in the Executive Order. Postal Service and five other federal agencies, DOD, VA, uh, Homeland Security, Department of Justice, and, and Health and Human Services account for nearly three-fourths of the civilian federal workforce and encompass the key capabilities that would be needed, including security and public safety, logistics and delivery, and public health and medical care. Work still needs to be done to integrate local or organic federal capabilities into local response plans. Mobilizing even these local federal assets, assets will take time during an event. To minimize delays, potential responders, federal or otherwise, or want to have immediate access to medical countermeasures for themselves and their families. The executive order called for establishing a mechanism for the provision of countermeasures to ensure mission essential functions of federal departments and agencies could continue. This is a key component of the postal model and could be achieved for other responders through workplace pods or the issuance of a home med kit. This all underscores the importance of reducing time to detect an attack, to mobilize a response, and to distribute it and dispense countermeasures. It also highlights the need to be flexible and prepared for surprise because the incident and the response may not unfold as expected. And given how difficult it is to quantify the risk of a bioattack and prioritize preparedness investments in the face of the many competing priorities facing federal, state, and local governments as well as budget realities, we must look for the most efficient, cost-effective, and sustainable strategies that will protect Americans and safeguard our nation against this threat. I'd like to thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you both very, very much. Uh, just to, to start with, let me, let me start if I could. Chief, um, yes, one of the uh, areas uh, that uh, emergency responders have, I think, depending on the state, of, have built uh, are uh, mutual aid capabilities where uh, you don't necessarily build up uh, the capability within every fire station or every community to respond to every conceivable uh, challenge, but within that region, and you talked a little bit about regionalization, and, and, and uh, so Dr. Meachin, you talked about the regionalization. Uh, I'm very interested in pursuing that concept, and as you take a look at the, uh, uh, the resources and the ju jurisdictions of the chief, how effective is the mutual aid concept uh, in terms of uh, gaining support nationally to respond to the variety of challenges, either the physical attack of terrorism, a biological attack, a chemical attack, because uh, you know, we, we all know everybody likes to have all the equipment, all the toys, all the accoutrements they need so they can be specialists, but we know mutual aid. How effective is the tool and how embracing is the broader uh, fire chief community in accepting the fact that they can't have it all, but they better regionalize their ability to respond and recover? I think one of the best examples of that is the Urban Areas Security Initiative Program. Uh, that, that really, to me, is the best example of what you, you've just mentioned, uh, that we've looked at things on a regional basis uh, instead of just, you know, individual communities, cities, municipalities. And so in those areas that have been identified as UASI regions or areas, um, you, you do see that. You do see that uh, uh, collaboration and you do see that um, um, uh, consolidation of resources so you look across the region you see what the vulnerabilities are it's it's a threat based type of system and again uh, the, those those resources uh, are, are staged in certain uh, areas or within certain agencies uh, within that region and again if there is an incident uh, they're all brought to bear in, in a collective manner uh, beyond that, you mentioned the mutual aid. I, th I think that's something that's uh, obviously been a big part of the fire service community throughout, uh, you know, that, that, that towns, uh, cities, and so forth uh, would, would pool the resources in times. Obviously, in Oklahoma, we're no strangers to natural disasters, so it's a big part of our response and knowing who our mutual aid partners are, and, uh, and we exercise those things on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and again, we, we've had a lot of experience in, in, in dealing with that so I see that as a fire chief as something that that's improved over time again uh, the, the some of the programs that the federal government uh, post 9-11 has uh, established uh, particularly the UASI program I think has been very instrumental in, in, in bringing those and pooling those resources so you don't have to have each community equipped with the exact same things but the resources are there in a region 
and we know where they are and we know how to uh, pool those when necessary. Dr. Meacher, to your point, you talked about centers for Ebola care, uh, and uh, which again is, is very similar to a, it's a mutual aid kind of idea that you, that you do create a center of excellence. What is the, uh, is there a compelling authority or what is the initiative needed for the broader healthcare community, which, as you pointed out, is very, very competitive, very competitive, uh, so that uh, individual uh, hospitals and healthcare delivery systems will give up to a certain extent, surrender their autonomy uh, to a particular hospital or healthcare system to develop that level of expertise, because often that means there'll be funding going to that uh, center of expertise, which every hospital. CEO would like to have in his or her a jurisdiction. Sure. Is there a forcing mechanism out there in the healthcare community that could uh, uh, require that, or who, de who decided that basically the set these are going to be the centers for Ebola care? So um, I, I prefer the carrot to stick. I prefer the carrot to the stick in, right. in a situation like that. I think I think compulsion of behavior is probably going to be less effective. Um, I mentioned the, the way we do stratification of health care under uh, joint, consider joint, joint commission considerations. There are advantages. Um, there's marketplace uh, uh, competitive edge. Uh, there's sometimes deeming mechanisms that help with things like Medicare uh, presentation. Um, it, it enhances the confidence in the community that, that you have a hospital or health care facility that's capable of rendering a certain type of care. I think that those are the elements that will actually help. I think eventually uh, I would say that if there were priorities or in a funding stream or cooperative agreement that there was um, a designation that facilities that had demonstrated that they had a certain type of capability would, would obviously have an advantage to some of those funding initiatives, that certainly would be an inducement uh, and I think it would be useful. Not every hospital is going to be able to do the same thing, and that's just reasonable, and that's to be expected. Um, we've recognized, as I said, we've recognized this in a lot of different pathologies and disease processes. Uh, stroke is the most classic example. We have the Joint Commission where they actually have sort of descriptors for a primary stroke center versus a comprehensive stroke center. Um, these are, they require both some equipment, some training, um, some exercising. Um, all the things that one would want with a biodefense initiative, they have that for stroke capability. And so I think, that, I think that the templates are out there. I think the mechanisms that make those things successful in a steady state are the very same mechanisms we would want to follow if we were going to design this for a biodefense initiative. I won't delve into, I could be here all day talking about the particulars of it, but I think that, I think that there are some um, pieces to that that we would want to exploit if we wanted this to be successful, if that makes sense. Um, I'd also offer on, uh, just for classification and uh, to help uh, illustrate this, um, my background actually uh, previously was as a, as a local preparedness director, then a state preparedness director in Maryland, and then subsequently as a strategic medical officer for um, uh, Health and Human Services at ASPR. And in that portfolio were countermeasures, uh, first responder protection issues, and then the national health security strategy. What, what the chief was talking about as far as UASI, I think also is mimicked by some of the cooperative agreements we see for public health initiatives, also what we see with regard to hospital preparedness funding as well. And so I think that the patterns are already there. I think that they are successful. I don't want to, by pointing out where I think vulnerabilities might be, indicate that there hasn't been successes, because I think it's important to acknowledge that they're there. But I think um, what one thing that comes to mind for me from a pre-hospital standpoint is urban search and rescue. Not everybody is able to do that. So we have these regional collectives that often are called into play either by states or by the federal government if there's a big disaster. And that's another illustration of a, of a good example of what might work. Mm -hmm. Dr. Um, Chief, um, 20 years ago, o Oklahoma City had a terrible tragedy, the bombing of the federal office building. Um, what have you learned since then and what kind of trade, if that had had a a bioterrorism aspect to it, and you didn't know at the time mm -hmm. uh, what it was. Um, uh, what's the difference between the training of your people now and uh, what happened 20 years ago? Well, I think anytime you have an event like that, and again, um, not only the, the bombing of 20 years ago, but as I pointed out, you know, we we have. Uh, very regular uh, natural disasters and so we, 
you learn lessons from those and you learn what works well and what don't. I would say in terms of the bombing, before there was a NIMS or a National Incident Management System, that was in every case a NIMS event. And because of the agencies that were involved, being, being a federal building, obviously. Um, so as the doctor mentioned, uh, that was our first experience using the urban search and rescue, the teams that are sponsored by FEMA uh, throughout the country. We used 13 of them that, that deployed during that event. Uh, you know, we recognized in Oklahoma City that uh, we weren't as skilled and as equipped in urban search and rescue as far as building collapse, uh, those types of technical rescue components to that event that we needed to be. And that's certainly so uh, since then, and since we've developed a, a, our own program in Oklahoma City uh, that we uh, collectively uh, work with Tulsa, the Tulsa metro area for urban search and rescue in the state, uh, that, that we've become more proficient at that, which has helped us again in some of the ensuing uh, natural disasters that we've had to respond to over time. So I think just with every event, yeah, there's lessons learned, there's lessons to be shared. Uh, had the Oklahoma City bombing had a, uh, a bio, uh, I think, uh, I, I'm a little bit scared to think about it at that time because just as I mentioned in the, in the terms of technical rescue, I don't know that we would have been as prepared for such a component as, as a bio uh, agent. If I remember correctly, you brought the FEMA people in for search and rescue. I lost a lot yes, of employees. I was at HHS at the time. Yes, ma'am. Um, Doctor, uh, is it Mecker? I'm Dr. Minson. This Minson. is Dr. Metz. Dr. Minson. Dr. Minson, uh, almost every every hospital in this country has to deal with infectious diseases. So you're really, if, you, if we're talking about certain centers, we're talking about highly infectious diseases like an Ebola because we can't afford a, 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 a health system in which we don't have a reporting system to state health departments and to the CDC so we can follow patterns because this country is dealing with infectious diseases every day. Could you talk a little about that infrastructure? Um, I want to be careful that we're not thinking that all infectious diseases go to these um, small numbers of centers because we're really uh, we we're dealing with this every day without knowing whether it's a bioterrorism outbreak, um, at, but with a, a a system that that looks at patterns. Thank you. I, that's a very good point. And and um, so to elaborate on that, I, I think you're you're stating it absolutely correctly. Um, what what we're not suggesting <coughs> in this discussion is that anything different would be created. Um, simply, what we're saying is is sort of what what happened during the Ebola response in this country was that um, we had facilities that had uh, both expertise, materiel, um, equipment, and and frankly, the wherewithal to take care of the disease as it went through the arc of the disease um, with an expectation that any hospital should be able to recognize it, report it, um, do stabilization procedures, control it, and, and ultimately then if, if the issue were something that had specialization requirements, that that, that then might be referred on to a center of excellence or center of specialization or however you wanted to describe it. Um, I, I, I don't want to use a trauma analogy, but I'm going to. Um, the, the truth is, most hospitals in the United States, you can't control who comes through the door. Um, uh, we have laws that, that prevent that, and rightly so. Um, but if an individual were to present and had a certain type of traumatic problem that the hospital didn't have, say, a surgeon or the anesthesiology support or critical care support, then that individual, because of, of uh, arrangements and relationships that are already established, would be able to transfer that individual after some um, uh, after inceptive. Them. Yes, yeah. ma'am, absolutely. And, and, and that works. That works very well. And, and that's really what I'm saying is we should not create something different. They still have the same requirements for reporting of their trauma statistics yeah. and whatnot. So it, it's absolutely the same thing. It's just looking at it in terms of, of biodefense and specifically some of these more esoteric type responses. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the post office department. I'm a big fan of the post office department. The last time I remember them implementing anything, it was Medicare. Um, and I don't remember them having refrigerators um, other than to keep their lunches in. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't we be better off um, using the pharmacy network in the United States for the distribution 
of uh, vaccines or anything else. It seems to me that we've got a system, it's private sector, but it's pretty well organized. And I would think that if I wanted to get some things out fast, bringing in the pallets, in fact, the contracts, if I remember, the federal government contracts are not with the post office department, but with FedEx and UPS to bring in pallets of, of drugs. I would distribute them to an existing network of pharmacies, and I assume that that was looked at as well. Um, there are more pharmacies in this country than there are post office uh, these days, so uh, I would think that we would use an existing uh, system that's, that has a control mechanism rather than rebuilding one for a distribution system. I would agree. I think we would want to use any and all capabilities to be able to rapidly distribute countermeasures. There may be uh, um, particular scenarios where that may be more attractive. For example, uh, pandemic, pandemic influenza, uh, where you want to, perhaps you want to be able to distribute antiviral medications very quickly. Uh, it's not a, that's not a bio attack scenario. Uh, and you would leverage your pharmacies to be able to, to distribute those medications. If we're talking about a bio attack, that one of the challenges you have uh, of when you look at, at distribution points is maintaining security and all those challenges. It's a little slightly different. And the, 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 in terms of distributing countermeasures, if you think about what order of magnitude challenge you have, if you need to distribute to, to five million people in 24 hour periods, you, know, you try to count to a million, it takes you about 12 days. Take, you know, 1 million seconds equals 12 days. 5 million seconds equals two months. Um, that's how long, big 5 million is. Now you could have multiple channels that you can distribute it to, but it just underscores the, 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 the really the, the challenge you face in a very short period of time to very rapidly distribute countermeasures to a population where uh, you don't know what's happening next. This isn't a, a, a naturally occurring disease. And it's reminiscent. I flew into Washington, D.C. on the morning of 9-11, uh, right around 8.15 in the morning, came into Reagan and headed to VA headquarters for a meeting. And what struck me about 9-11, which I'll never forget, was the uncertainty of what was going to happen next. And during that initial 12-hour period, it was very uncertain. And so I could put myself in the setting of a bio attack. And you're in the midst of that event very early on uh, and not knowing what's coming next uh, and what other secondary attacks might there be. And I would think security would be a, a critical issue. And so the challenge is, is being able to balance, as you say, all those other distribution points that you potentially have, yet also maintain uh, safety and security for the public. Jen? Thank you. Thanks very much for your remarks, gentlemen. Carter, great to see you again. Um, Chief, I'd like to direct this to you. I noted your comments about the uh, amount of intelligence briefing that you receive from the federal government, you and others in the first responder community. Um, and that's, you know, that's been a, a challenge, um, just the, the concern about getting what is generally classified information out to the first responders so you can make use of it. And obviously, particularly critical for you so that you can, it can inform how you're going to prepare for the attack, if it's going to, if it looks like it's more likely that our adversary is going to use chemical, uh, use the chemical threat, you prepare one way. If it's a bio threat, particular bio threat, another way. So um, that's critical that happen. I know that um, with the, let's say the police, uh, local police, they have sort of more regularized intelligence briefing process. In part because they're part of the infrastructure that's going out and doing the investigating on the front end. Um, my question to you is, from the perspective of somebody who's in the non-police first responder community, in terms of you all and the public health officials, are you getting the intelligence briefing that you think you need about uh, what our adversaries are looking at so that you can actually sort of position yourself and be poised to respond to what is the threat of the day as opposed to what might have been the threat of the briefing that you got a year before? I think it's both, sir. I think I'm in some places that happens uh, in a better way and, 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 and more often than in other places, to be very frank. I think a lot of it, again, depends on the, uh, the area that you're in. Uh, again, if there, as I mentioned, if there's a joint terrorism task force in your area, uh, you, you know, the non-law enforcement first responder community may be more or less involved in that. If you have a fusion center, you know, that, that this gathers and disseminates intelligence information 
in my case, uh, one of my deputy chiefs is, uh, sits in that fusion center, or, or, and, and so he is briefed regularly. I think there are gaps, though. I think in other places where you don't have a good relationship, that there may not have been relationships established between the, the, the fire service, emergency medical service, and those law enforcement agencies, that, that they don't get as regular and as in-depth briefings as they should. So there's some work to be done there, but I think overall we see some improvement. I think it's somewhat incumbent on us and the fire service to keep pushing in that regard to make sure that uh, we do get the information that we need and, and sometimes that's what it takes. Um, so uh, it, it really boils down to a communication issue, it boils down to a trust issue. I know in some cases when you're talking in terms of the federal government and, and those uh, federal agencies that, that, uh, that uh, collect and disseminate intelligence, um, you know, there's security clearance issues that sure. come into play. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I don't know that we need to know the detailed information on my side of the fence, but we at least know that there's a threat out there, uh, the potential of that threat, the credibility of that threat so that we can be prepared. So overall, I see some improvement in that regard, but still some work to be done. Yeah, I'm not, not surprised at all that maybe it's uneven around the country. That's, you know, it's based on relationships, based yes, on sir. sort of what tradition you have in a particular region, et cetera, of coordination among the federal agencies, law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies, and first responders. But I, it looks like you're well positioned um, as chairman of the um, National Association of Fire Chiefs, maybe to pulse all your colleagues to get an understanding of where the weaknesses and strengths are and, and, and push for it, and also to let us know, because that intelligence process and making sure that intelligence gets out to you all who can prepare for it, that's going to be, that's a part of our uh, our view. So, any um, any input you have on that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. We've heard several others talk about to, to go from a, a need to know basis to a need yes, to share basis, and we just need you and the chiefs and the others not in law enforcement to keep pushing and developing that need to share culture um, and, and uh, relying simply on relationships within regions. It's a good start, but it's not where we need to be. It's not the finish line that we want to see developed if indeed there's to be an integration of capabilities between the federal, state, and local levels. So we appreciate your candor on that. Uh, advisory board, questions, multiple questions. So go ahead, Debbie. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, endorse Secretary Shalala's comment about uh, using the private sector for distribution. Uh, I think it's a very good idea, and I know that there have been some companies with distribution networks that have talked about it, and they've been they've received some resistance from within HHS, so I think it's something we should look at in, in the report. Uh, for Dr. Metcher, you're one of the few people who served on the Homeland Security Council and then into the new incarnation of it when it became the National Security Staff. I was wondering if you could talk about whether that led to any uh, diminution of capabilities or if there was, was it a seamless transition from HSC to um, Homeland Security responsibilities being within the National Security, Security Staff and also how you see the, this uh, Homeland Security function within the White House fitting in within the four D's that you discussed? Well, when I was at the, when it was the Homeland Security Council under uh, President Bush, uh, Dr. Robert Cadlick was the Senior Director of Biodefense and I served with him uh, during his tenure at HSC. And so I had the opportunity to see uh, a, a Senior Director in place who had primary responsibilities for dealing with biodefense. So. Um, there was a, an identified individual who had primary responsibility to lead the biodefense effort. Um, following the transition uh, and the reorganization of the Homeland Security Council into the National uh, uh, Security Staff, that, that office was subsumed into a directorate of resiliency. And so that senior director position was, was uh, removed uh, and all of those all the portfolios that were associated with those individuals in biodefense really moved under um, uh, uh, resiliency. Uh, if you recall, very early in the administration, we were hit with H1N1. And the work that I was involved in and others in biodefense was in pandemic preparedness and pandemic planning, development of the national pandemic plan. Uh, and so when H1N, H1N1 uh, began in, uh, in April, or late April, of uh, uh, 2009. It was early and just several months into the administration. And so we did not have a senior director in biodefense. And uh, what was organized was a response with leadership within the Office of Resiliency 
um, uh, to lead the effort or organize the interagency effort uh, for uh, H1N1, which was really a major um, bio effort. Uh, and so a number of us were integrally involved. But what I did see was the difference between having a, a leadership that was identifiable for biodefense uh, and then not having a single individual who really uh, you could identify as biodefense. Uh, I, I think that there are some advantages. I saw them firsthand in um, the past administration of that individual uh, and leading the effort, uh, uh, which Bob Cadlick uh, uh, certainly did. So are you saying we should return to the days of having a separate dedicated Homeland Security Council? What I was, I was, was talking about was the advantages of having someone identifiable senior in, individual um, to lead the effort in biodefense. Um, I, I think the Homeland Security effort still could be um, uh, uh, certainly led from within the national security staff. Uh, it still was, uh, you know, Homeland efforts were still identified within uh, the national security staff. What was missing was a, an identified senior official for biodefense. Thank you. Tom. So uh, I'd like to ask the panelists about their respective communities' responses to the Ebola outbreak over the last six months or so. Um, we have relatively few proxies for bioattacks in this country. Obviously, there are big distinctions between Ebola and the kinds of things that Carter was just discussing. But do you think we did better or worse than you would have anticipated? Is there anything particularly that surprised you that we can learn from that we could think about in terms of preparing for biological threats? <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> it speaks to the coordination problem. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll speak to I'll, I'll I'll give an anecdote from a corporate sector. Um, we're a multinational. We have people that were in. Um, Western Africa at the time, um, uh, performing things for uh, infrastructure support. Uh, we worked with government partners. We initiated a, essentially a quick communication campaign. We had to look at how we were going to move someone if we had someone that was ill, which obviously is not a private concern. It's one that has to have the coordination between the private sector and, and the government accepting the individual coming back for care. Um, so uh, what I would say is that I, I think it was reasonable to say that across the board we, what we saw was mixed result, and that's fair. Um, I think um, it, what what if I were going to say if there's anything that I would look at in terms of, of changing, because I think that was your the, the, the root of your question, I, I think I've already offered it, and that is that this idea of having, if you will, some sort of system or identification, communication, and then, if you will, the referral of that individual to the proper facility that can take care of them very rapidly. And I think we're a little bit better conditioned to do that now because we've been through this and we've made them some mistakes and we've done some things well. Um, what, what I'd like to see is that rather than do this every single time disease specific, is I'd like to start to do this with an idea of infectious disease or biodefense rather than wait to have to go through the iteration with the the peculiarities or esoteric nature of each of the different agents. I think that's the safest, smartest way to do this. Um, that's That may not actually be in place right now, and I think that that's something that we could start to, to attend. That's my thought. And two comments. One was on risk communication, of uh, being able to convey the risk, and I think uh, the reaction to a highly, uh, you know, an infectious disease with a high consequence infectious disease with a high lethality rate um, uh, communicated itself, uh, and I think we did see the, the spike in, in fear. Uh, the challenge I, I saw was the really to be able to first conceptualize what that risk truly is uh, and, and uh, in terms of trying to quantify that risk. But that, that risk is always viewed through a lens of other, as, uh, as Sam Min and, and Vince Cabello like to talk about, the outreach factors that the public views um, that, that risk uh, uh, within. Uh, and so I think the risk communication, um, uh, it, it's always a challenge in any kind of event. Uh, the, to get to the issue that I think uh, Matt was mentioning, um, I, I think we focused a lot on where to treat these individuals and what really was needed was the assessment capability. Um, uh, does everyone really need to have the capability to treat uh, Ebola or manage an Ebola patient or do, do they need the ability or, or the uh, capability to be able to quickly recognize it, recognize you know simple things that they can do to protect themselves and other staff and other patients and very quickly get that patient uh, uh, to a, a specific center, rather than trying to set up centers everywhere potentially to take care of these patients. Um, uh, 
that I saw was that there's a tension between developing this capability across the country versus focusing the capability in a relatively small number of, of centers and expanding the capability, just like the infectious disease, that you have that capability everywhere to take care of patients with infectious disease, but you have a concentrated capability to take to actually manage the high consequence infectious diseases. So I think that distinction between um, assessment and where we would provide that treatment in the setting where we can protect the, our staff. The other thing that I think that we came to realize is that um, the, the patients are their most infectious when they're the most ill, uh, when they're critically ill. And we put these patients in intensive care units, which we are we staff with, you know, are very intensive in terms of personnel. And so in terms of, of controlling a disease outbreak, we're almost doing the opposite thing. You know, we're exposing potentially large numbers of people um, to a, a highly lethal in, in infectious disease at the very moment when those patients are probably the most in, in, infectious and, and, and have the highest viral loads. And so I think what the event also underscored was uh, thinking about ICU medicine. My background is critical care, so thinking about ICU medicine and the special needs that you have in ICU care, which we tend to throw lots of resources and lots of people. Yet when you think about Ebola and these kind of diseases, you're almost going the opposite direction. You're trying to constrain the number of people who have contact, limit the staff um, that are having contact with the patient. It's almost opposite of what we normally do in critical care medicine. And that's why isolating the space is important. Yes. Dr. Libby. Oh, and Jerry Parker next. Yeah, just a question for uh, Carter and similar to Teddy's question. Part of your, your testimony really highlighted the need. Uh, we, we've already talked about how novel the bio threat is and low probability and high consequences. And it demands novel approaches. And it, and it requires people thinking outside of their box and outside of their com comfort zone. And, and it requires cultural change. And um, the postal model stockpiles and yes the private sector is, is it needs to be incorporated in this and novel approaches but it's really come, speaks to leadership and so it comes back you know to, to leadership and it's also maybe not on, in addition to the White House leadership but the, you know having the secretarial and dep deputy secretaries also engaged on this is very very important as as well but and that leadership you've already told us that you believe you know having a Bob Cadlick, uh, and and that leadership in the White House is important. But what other lessons learned since you were in the eye of the hurricane, so to speak, in in uh, the White House? In addition to just having that position, what other attributes need to be attached to that position to be most effective? There's a consensus here. We'd like to clone Bob Cadlick. We can't do that. But <laughs> coordinated but uh, absent that we're looking for other alternatives in terms of the leadership I think one of the things the, the leadership provides is you know I, I had the, the, the good fortune or you know the, uh, the opportunity to be able to, to, to watch a transition in administrations to see what happens as it, it, administrations change I also was able to to see firsthand h1n1 um, Deepwater Horizon, the, the Haiti earthquakes, uh, Fukushima, and and got to see firsthand how what it feels like w when a disaster unfolds, uh, and you watch it stutter and unfold. And while it was unfolding, um, we would have conversations, some of us in biodefense, and say, you know, it's 24 hours past the point which this thing first we first heard about this event. Had this been a bio event, we pretty much would have had to been done with with. Uh, antibiotic dis distribution and dispensing. You think we could have done it within 24 hours? And, and then we would look at the information that we had at the moment that we heard about the event in the first 24 hours, 48 hours, and you watched how that information changed, and you saw that most of the time the initial information was not 100% um, you know, correct, and it evolved over time. And so you're dealing with this evolving um, uh, situation, uncertainty, ambiguity, yet you still need to act. And I think the importance of leadership is in that type of an environment uh, where the information is never going to be complete. It's going to be inexact. It's, it's going to be a lot of ambiguity. Um, you're going to be looking through 
the fog, um, you're going to need uh, to be able to give advice, uh, or someone's going to need to be able to give advice um, uh, to leadership in terms of, of options, of, of actions. And that needs to be as informed as it can be. And so I think having someone like a Bob Cadillac, uh, who's been in biodefense for a long time, being able to offer that kind of, or an individual like that, being able to offer that kind of advice, I think is important. Is there any, anything that um, that person needs in regards to budgetary um, authority too? I, I, it's hard to get things done without uh, the ability to control dollars. Uh, and so I think having some influence um, in some way of being able to um, uh, move resources to direct them towards a, towards a problem. If you, if you identify an issue but you can't, can't swing resources to assist, you know, it's probably not going to get done. Matt, can you say anything about what you observe at the department level, you know, say in, in, in preparedness and particularly medical countermeasures of spending that, that might be helpful to? I'd be happy to. Um, so I, I, I want to touch on uh, anthrax and countermeasure delivery. There really are two theaters of activity taking place at the time of an anthrax attack, and that's really kind of what we're talking about when we talk about the postal, um, uh, postal HHS consideration. There's the issue of actual patient care of individuals who've actually contracted the disease. That's obviously arduous and difficult and hospital-based. Then there's this other concept, which is really classically preventive medicine. The idea is that there may potentially have been an exposure. You want to get the countermeasure in the individual to prevent the disease manifestations. And by doing so, you eliminate a lot of uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, the, the, what I saw at the departmental level with this was that I think um, when we talk about, co we've already mentioned healthcare coalitions. Healthcare coalitions are actually communities. So you're talking about everybody that, uh, that applies to and supports the healthcare system. So it's actually faith based initiatives and, and folks that do the logistics requirements and support all of that enterprise. That's a big animal. Uh, I think what you want to do is bring as many of those support capabilities to the table. Carter mentioned the collaboration between the United States Postal Service and Health and Human Services. I, I want to I point out that that was not something that was actually federally driven. It was actually, it was identified by a local jurisdiction that this was part of, not in lieu of, using pharmacies or points of dispensing or any of those other initiatives. It was actually an adjunct to them based on the tactical considerations of the local if general or, or public health director uh, as far as their overall countermeasure delivery platform. And the thought was that perhaps there would be a population that either because of mobility issues or logistics or traffic arteries or geography or something might want this delivery to instead of a pull out of and go to a location. And and uh, in the juris and I, I won't speak for them, they actually voiced this. For the jurisdictions that subscribed to this and implemented it, they were very successful and they thought that they had a very good working model and I agree, it looked, it looked very good. Um, Dr. Parker mentions the, the idea of culture change. This is what we're talking about. And so that was really what I was getting at when I talked about the idea of, of pulling in um, some sort of training requirement or some sort of credentialing element necessary with these boards to, to actually provide that, that nugget, if you will, of biodefense as part of the other duty as assigned. Because what we're really talking here is kind of a 21st century civil defense construct within the healthcare community. It's not a bad idea. Um, uh, as with all things, the particulars are going to be either the success or the undoing. So, um, from a and, and from a state department and from a local department standpoint, I, I think what you have to do is allow enough latitude for a local to make tactical decisions that will work. So you could probably support me on this, but I think. Um, states then become sort of the, the funneling capability. It's easier for the issuance of funds and, and initiatives and requirements to go out that way. But I think that, that um, at, the, at the federal locus, it's very important to make sure that we allow that latitude for the execution of those duties so that they're effective. Because this is a very uh, diverse country in terms of both its, its requirements and, and its and frankly, it's resources, depending on where you are. And I think have, keeping that in mind will probably help with that culture. How constraining are the scope of practice rules of, of a state? I mean, one of the things, what you're suggesting works as long as there are not narrow scope of practice sure. rules for what health professionals can do. Okay, so I would, I would distinguish, um, uh, just very quickly, I would distinguish what we're talking about with scope of practice. So for physicians or individuals who have autonomy of practice, uh, uh, MDs and DOs, 
uh, generally speaking, um, there's a great deal of latitude. The, the restrictions for those individuals actually are determined in the civil courts and, and quite frankly then by either criminal behavior or some sort of, of, of evaluation by their state board on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, states set those limits. Um, and that, that when I mentioned the study that was done at the University of Maryland about the advanced nurse practitioner latitudes, they were very distinct. Depending on where you were, they were very, very different. Um, and they and so when I talk about autonomy of practice, that's one group. Then there there are what are used to be classically the physician extenders, advanced nurse practitioners, PAs, individuals that, that function in much the same way, but either have some sort of supervisory agreement or have some sort of arrangement. Um, that's changing to some degree in the United States, uh, and it depends on the state. So. It's hard to answer that question in totality. Um, that's why I'm offering so much qualification, is that um, you then get into certification levels or technical trainings, and that's a very different kind of construct. That requires, if you will, protocol-driven and symptom-driven um, supervision. Gee, that's for EMS, I suppose. So um, the answer is, how do you do that? I, that's why I'm going back to the boards, the folks that issue the licensure. If that's a piece of the, the required CMEs, for the license to renew, or if it's for new graduates to have that as a part of the, the curriculum, that might be the best way to do it. Yeah, but if you look at what's happening in healthcare, there are less and less independent practitioners. Absolutely. The autonomy is, they're part of larger practices or, or ACAs or, or ACOs, or, or they're employed. Yes, ma'am, no, that's quite true. That said, e even if they're employed, they, they can't do what they do unless they have their licensure. Right. Um, and, and so that, that's why I'm saying rather than making it part of a social organization or a guild or something of that nature um, or a, uh, th that I think that the licensing board that allows them then to have that employment and, right. and process is probably the, the most effective way to do it, although there are many. You've been uh, very helpful and obviously very provocative. I think we can keep you there for the next couple of hours, but we're going to move on to the second panel. But as uh, they come forward, we thank you for your participation today and your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next panel will involve the public health response. And we have three distinguished uh, individuals who will join us. Dr. Suzette McKinney. Deputy Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Health. I want to, to ask you. Ms. Melissa Hirsch, President and CEO of Hirsch Consulting. And Dr. James Turbush, Senior Partner of Martin Blanc and Associates. He's the former Command Surgeon of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, U.S. North Command Department of Defense. I invite you uh, to come forward. that your schedule may have anticipated a break but we're going to try to keep this thing moving we've got five very distinguished panelists and we don't want to shortchange them the input's really important to us so uh, maybe we'll catch another minute or two when we break for all of 10 minutes for lunch uh, but we're going to proceed uh, with our second panel the public health response and uh, dr mckinney we'd like to proceed with you first Uh, listen, I, we, we, we do as instructed. <laughs> we can take instruction up here, believe it or not. Sir, proceed. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I will be uh, continuing uh, some of the themes of hospital preparedness and then hopefully Good, thank you. provide a transition to uh, uh, public health response. So um, since leaving government, I've been uh, fortunate to uh, and enjoy teaching public health and consulting on a variety of health and disaster-related topics. I'm delighted uh, to be able to speak with you today on a topic I consider to be of key importance to our nation, especially when we experience another bio-event such as Ebola 
or other significant natural or man-made disasters, and that topic is resilient hospitals. In the opening chapters of the celebrated book, Five Days at Memorial, the author, Sherry Fink, recounts in detail the horrifying facts of life and death in a storm-ravaged hospital post-Hurricane Katrina. She describes a major medical center without electricity, clean water, wastewater treatment, ventilation, and only limited communication supplies and transportation. Patients deprived of life-saving technology lingered and then died in the heat, a nightmarish scenario indeed. Did everybody here in the back? Okay, very good, thank you. Just double check, no, you're good, sir. Thank you, sir. Of the 16 critical infrastructure sectors, healthcare and public health is certainly important in the immediate disaster response and recovery. The population that we serve, those critically ill and injured hospitalized patients, are arguably the most vulnerable segment of our society. The other reason perhaps we need to focus on resilient hospitals today is that the sector is one of increasing complexity and relies on a combination of support from the other sectors, especially the power grid, and a reliance on moment-to-moment -moment connectivity with information technology and the internet. I'll refer to that as IT. So resiliency for our purposes, uh, working definition, is the ability uh, to take a blow and come back. Uh, resilient hospitals are able to prepare for and adapt to changing conditions and withstand and recover rapidly from disruptions. Not just hospitals, of course, should be considered, but healthcare facilities of all types are vulnerable. Patients receive care at a variety of different facilities to include long-term care, nursing homes, clinics, and increasingly at home. It is not just the physical structure which must withstand a blow and come back, but we need resilient staff, resilient management, resilient plans, and planning. A naval aviator friend told me once that truly superior pilots plan ahead to avoid those situations where they might have to use their superior skills. Hospitals and their staffs have repeatedly shown superior skills in disasters, but we would prefer to have less heroics and more routine activity carried out according to the plan. And of course, this is an all-hazards approach. We're referring to a variety of different threats against hospitals. Hospitals have unique vulnerabilities. Patients are more sensitive to changes in environment, temperature, humidity, noise, etc. The very young, the very old, and of course, the very sick have very different requirements. Some patients have to be isolated from others and need separate ventilation systems, changing rooms, etc., as we saw in Ebola. Some patients rely on ventilators or other specialized technology with a limited battery supply of perhaps several hours. So when the power goes off, if backup diesel generators are tasked to perform beyond their limits, these devices eventually run down as well. Another vulnerability common to devices connected to the internet is that some medical devices, to include some life-sustaining medical devices, can be hacked remotely either turned off or the settings changed. When the power goes completely off, hospitals quickly become dark and dangerous places. Most backup electrical generators are designed for no more than 48 to 72 hours of continuous operations. After that, they probably need routine maintenance, certainly refueling. And another unique issue of hospitals is the evacuation of critically ill patients connected to life support when only one or two facilities are no longer able to care for patients, the option remains to evacuate. When healthcare facilities across an entire region are affected, we have to be able to continue to provide care in place. And one example where we saw this was Hurricane Gustav, where the hospitals admittedly were able to discharge those of lesser acuity, but held back because of the difficulty of evacuation of those patients who were on life support until basically we reached the limit uh, for uh, uh, aeromedical evacuation, the wind speed. So electronic medical records and data stored in the cloud can be both a help and a hindrance. When IT systems and access to the internet stop, modern medicine as we know it ceases to exist. Although valuable patient records and other data may exist somewhere out there on a server, inability to access or retrieve data stops 
our business as usual. The ability to record and store patient demographic and clinical information on a secure handheld device, especially in mass casualty, is essential. The data can be downloaded later or sent to another device when internet connectivity is restored. Tracking of patients and their accompanying family members is particularly important when facilities are being evacuated. Otherwise, we may have to revert back to paper records and clipboards, which were both used in the shooting incident in Aurora, Colorado a couple of years ago. Less effective, perhaps, but that abil ability to revert back to another legacy system is also an indicator of resiliency. And I might go on to say that it's this integration of information from the hospital to EMS to public health responders needs to be shared across the board, and that's really the key to success here. A point made earlier, just in time, supply chain complicates disaster healthcare delivery, and the need for cost effectiveness complicates resiliency because it is more cost effective to have vendors deliver supplies just in time. There's less waste and less wasted shelf space. The, late, the days of large stocks of IV fluids, pharmaceuticals, disposable are gone. Instead, vendors may obtain supplies from multiple sources, both domestic and overseas, and those vendors in turn have a supply chain from even more obscure sources. And IT systems connect them all. Um, as systems become increasingly complex, they are also increasingly fragile. And for no-fail missions, such as disaster health care, communications, intensive care units, life support, emergency rooms, we need redundancy and additional capability. This capability could include, include more trained staff, equipment, supplies in-house. Um, functions within the hospital are then prioritized as mission critical or non-mission critical, such as we do in the military. And functions of lower priority may need to be turned off in an orderly manner, as in the phrase, failing gracefully, which um, is already practiced. All this, of course, adds to business costs, staff hours, overhead liability, and represents an additional risk to the hospital. And very briefly, sir, I just attended a re risk management meeting where a survey was conducted amongst CEOs, CFOs, and a new term, CROs, Chief Risk Officer. Uh, uh, number one uh, were costs associated with um, regulation. Number two, interestingly, were cyber threats. And number three, uh, for these business leaders, were infectious diseases. Alternate technologies can be useful in a disaster if they are baked in. PPD 21 promotes research and development to enable the secure and resilient design and construction of critical infrastructure and more secure accompanying cyber technology. Uh, now as an example, an architectural firm based in Boston is designing hospitals from the ground up which have more natural ventilation and lighting are more sparing in the use of water and have a reduced requirement for wastewater treatment. Some of these hospitals include a thermal tower which pulls air through the facility without the use of electricity. They have large fans in common areas uh, in case this doesn't work. The day-to-day -day electricity requirements for these hospitals are much less. More of the hospital is on ground level. Patients can be moved more easily without the use of elevators. So why is this technology not used more commonly? Because these hospitals are be being designed for third world applications and locations, situations in Africa and elsewhere. Now certainly these countries who experience disaster and loss of life more frequently than we do here benefit from this technology. Maybe certain ad adaptations of this type of technology are needed here to make our hospitals more resilient. These technologies are appropriate and resource saving all of the time and do not have to be turned on in a disaster. Cyber secure microgrids. Another example of technology useful all of the time is a backup electrical generation system incorporating conventional diesel generators, renewables, batteries, and the ability to push power back into the grid with possible associated cost savings. 
these microgrids are less susceptible to hack attacks and um, electromagnetic pulse EMP as well. I've seen one of these systems seamlessly transition from providing power for a large portion of a military base to putting power back into the grid and then storing energy and batteries. They also have the ability for portions of the system to go offline for a period of time so that they can be maintained and refueled and you remember that was a problem in Superstorm Sandy. Currently, Department of Defense has such a joint capability excuse me, Joint Capability Technology Demonstration, or JCTD, the acronym is SPIDERS, which could be adapted for use in a large medical campus, for example, and I could discuss that subject further if you're interested. A system of systems approach is needed, and a favorite slide that I like to use when giving similar talks is one showing the various critical infrastructure sectors stacked on top of each other with lines of interconnectedness. So, for example, power grid relies upon transportation, transportation is connected to water, the water sector needs electricity, and IT connects all of them. Healthcare may not directly affect all the other sectors, but it's fair to say that all the other sectors affect healthcare. Especially vulnerable in a disaster are patients at home or in a long-term care facility which must have an electrical outlet for life-sustaining technology, such as ventilators, oxygen generators, and renal dialysis. I'm gonna ask you, doctor, if you could just yes, kind of summarize. We're gonna submit your record, uh, the entire testimony for the record, but uh, I, I think uh, there's a lot of questions are gonna come to this direction of this panel, so if you'd be kind enough to do that for me, sorry, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. I just want to speak also in favor, as have some previous speakers um, of coalitions, uh, not only interagency, but public-private partnerships and coalitions of hospitals, especially as Dr. Tim Steele spoke about at a previous panel uh, from MESH. Grant funding from the government will never be enough. Uh, a colleague uh, uh, told me that you can never grant your way to preparedness, but specific funding dedicated toward a specific vulnerability, such as hospital cybersecurity or emergency power supplies, can, however, help. So I think with that, I'll go ahead and, and close, sir, and um, Thank you very much. Speaker. Thank you. Yes, please. Good morning, and Good thank morning. you very much okay. again thank for you. the opportunity to be here. I was asked to discuss the public health response role and some of the challenges that we face in public health with regards to uh, real-time epidemiolo epidemiology and other tools for characterization of the spread of disease. So I will highlight a few of public health's roles and then talk briefly about some of the challenges that we still face. So the public health response to biological events is multifaceted. It requires skilled staff, the resources and the wherewithal to complete the mission and relationships with key partners across all levels of government, nonprofits, the private sector, and community leaders and advocates as well. In a biological event, public health officials are responsible for characterizing the threat, utilizing biosurveillance and epidemiological tools and investigative procedures. Robust surveillance systems and mechanisms for information sharing help to facilitate and maintain situational awareness across public health, health care, and other public safety partners. Upon characterization of the threat, public health officials must coordinate with the health care system, providing treatment recommendations, including the use of medical countermeasures, recommendations for laboratory testing and other diagnostic procedures, and recommendations for personal protective equipment to ensure proper protection of healthcare workers, as well as continuous communication with healthcare partners to ensure the maintenance of surveillance activities and bi-directional communication flow between public health and healthcare. On the operations side, public health must ensure that medical countermeasures are distributed or dispensed rather to affected populations to protect against the threat, particularly any potentially exposed who are not hospitalized. This is done by ensuring that operationally sound plans and procedures are in place pre-event that account not only for the actual medication distribution, but all of the logistical components that operate in the background and ensure a successful mission. 
I emphasize operationally sound because over the years we've learned that it isn't sufficient to just have a plan. But staff need to be continuously trained on those plans and functional and full-scale exercising are necessary to evaluate the viability of those plans and how well the response can be carried out. In other words, there needs to be proof that the plan can do what it says it can do. Um, and I'm happy to say that in my jurisdiction, our public health responders are fully integrated into our unified command structure so we don't have the turf wars and resource pulling that, that can occur when it's time to respond. Overlaid across all areas of public health response are the need for quick, efficient, and comprehensive risk communication messages to the public, continuous information sharing with response partners, and engagement of those who are most vulnerable, including those with access and functional needs and therefore may not be able to get to medication distribution points, the elderly and the chronically ill residing at home, and those who are socially isolated and may be distrusting of information sources that most of us depend upon daily. Finally, there is the need for relationships and partnerships. We often say that at the time of, the, of a disaster, it's not the time to be distributing business cards. However, we underestimate the power and the strength of relationships with key partners who have resources and tools that can be brought to bear to support the public health mission in response to a biological event. Again, these include relationships across all levels of government, the private sector, nonprofits, health care and health care coalitions, but also community leaders and advocates. And I often tell the story, uh, the personal story, of an elderly man with whom I was quite familiar who was living in the Lower Ninth Ward as Hurricane Katrina approached New Orleans, refusing to evacuate his home because in his mind this was just another storm. And he didn't trust the messages that were being delivered through the mainstream media or even by the government. However, if those same messages had been delivered by the leader of his local Masonic Lodge or perhaps the pastor of his church, he perhaps would have trusted those messages and his outcome would have been quite different than what it actually was. So again, I stress that relationships are key. We won't always know how we may need to leverage those relationships until the situation is upon us. In terms of challenges, there are many, particularly with regards to epidemiology and surveillance in the effort to characterize the threat. What we know is that public health officials will learn about the threat in any number of ways. One perhaps could be through the BioWatch system, which would put us several hours behind the time of the agent release. Another could be the BDS system, which is present in many postal facilities across the country in jurisdictions that actually have BDS systems. Or most likely, through an astute physician on duty when a symptomatic patient presents in the ER. But my point here is that there is no single detection mechanism that is consistent across all jurisdictions and no standard competency level that is required for any of the three mechanisms that I mentioned. For those reasons, there is great need for biosurveillance that integrates multiple approaches or multiple mechanisms for biosurveillance to improve coordination across jurisdictions and increase competency for quick detection of a biological release. We have many tools in our toolbox, but we need to figure out how to best integrate those tools and move forward with resolving some of the outstanding issues that still remain for those of us in public health. And briefly, in conclusion, some of those outstanding issues continue to be remediation. In other words, how clean is clean after a biological event? Reoccupancy when the agent has traveled indoors or perhaps is released indoors. Who is the authority to determine that a facility can reopen for business? What's the balance between public health and law enforcement investigations? How can we ensure that we coordinate with one another without interfering with the very different investigations that we are respectively trying to carry out? And lastly, how do we ensure that as a public safety community, we are resilient from high regret decisions that might be made in the face of a biological attack? And with that, I will end and thank you again very much. Thank you very much. Please.
Thank you for this opportunity to share some reflections. And while I apologize, Asha and Ellen, in advance, I'm actually going to speak about the politics of response a little bit more than some of the epidemiological challenges that we face or some of the successes that we've, we've um, experienced. Well, that's inherent to the challenges we face, so you're, <laughs> you're on topic. Uh, don't, you don't have to apologize for that. You're on topic. <laughs> I personally don't have a, uh, any funding to defend, nor do I have a portfolio to protect. So consequently, I'm going to really just speak in my personal capacity as a risk analyst and a consultant who has worked uh, inside and on the periphery of health security for around 20 years. So while we're here to talk about the public health response to a high consequence biological or chemical incident, and I realize we're sort of shafting chemical incidents today. Um, and this is against uh, an incident of any origin against humans and ag with a focus on livestock. I think the point I really want to focus on is that there are many tacit assumptions surrounding the act of responding, and not all of my comments will remain within the purview of health. And some things may be anathema to public health and clinical professionals in this room. I was going to use three examples. One of those was uh, Ebola in West Africa and the United States, but since it's been discussed so much, I think I'm going to not talk about that. And instead, I'm going to talk about polio in Pakistan, Nigeria, and Afghanistan, and brucellosis in the Western United States. Um, obviously, we could talk about MERS in the Middle East, we can talk about dengue hemorrhagic fever in South America, and we could talk about a lot of other pathogens that cause diseases that are of high consequence. But in general, the tacit assumptions that we're looking at are really rather basic, and it's who should respond, um, to what should the response be, where, do, where does the response begin and when, and how should response be handled? Should it be using healthcare professionals, law enforcement, militaries, or other cadres of trainable teams of people, or all of the above? So I also wanted to caveat this with a few assumptions of my own. One. Yes, leadership is too fragmented and lacking, and that's one of the issues that's come up repeatedly. Also, in my personal opinion, responding to a kinetic biological or chemical attack is somewhat less challenging than responding to a non-kinetic incident, because you have no forewarning and you have no actual blast zone or disaster space that you can surveil. I would also say that the majority of U.S. policies prioritize a duty to treat or care over a duty to contain the threat, and conceptually we envision triage in terms of individual health and consequently a standard of care as opposed to population health and sufficient care. Also, decontamination is often seen as inferior to therapeutic countermeasures. Also, there's still a lot of reluctance, from what I can tell, for non-traditional partners in the response arena and in the response generally, and that would include the private sector, which we just heard a bit about, um, and the military. And these folks have a lot of cool toys at their, at their hands and at their convenience, with whether it's geospatial data, UAVs, trucks, guns, communications equipment, things that we don't normally associate with people in clinical and public health environments. Uh, we're also reluctant to communicate more with the public about mass fatality management for both humans and livestock, and we saw that a lot with Ebola. We were really loath to address burial practices and actually talk about cultural differences and the need to actually potentially put aside some of those differences rather than appeal to each and every individual's preference. Um, slow onset disasters like Ebola in West Africa, polio in Pakistan, Nigeria, and Afghanistan, and brucellosis in the Western U.S. are generally responded to like rapid onset disasters. And by that I mean that you often get duplicated and disparate resources and coordination mechanisms that are thrown together in an ad hoc manner, um, thus signaling the need for better management and managers. And healthcare professionals should focus on the health aspects of a disaster and should not be in charge of managing the response of a large-scale incident. So I wanted to talk a little bit about polio in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and Nigeria. And while currently the U.S. doesn't have a problem with, with uh, polio, when there's an infectious disease of high consequence anywhere in the world, it has the possibility of becoming a problem back in the United States. So in the polio virus, which in polls and in the aftermath of World War II 
was second to nuclear war as the thing Americans feared most, today remains endemic in three very uh, terrorist-rife countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. Many of these, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and Boko Haram, and now IS affiliates, are proponents of anti-vaccine fatwas, and specifically anti-polio vaccine fatwas. Moreover, in 2014, there were also outbreaks in Somalia with Al-Shabaab, Equatorial Guinea, Iraq, Cameroon, Syria, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Madagascar. The likelihood for cross-border infection, particularly in contiguous nations that border anti-vaccine controlled areas, and consequently into regions with growing allegiances and affiliations with known anti-vaccine terrorist organizations, poses a risk to eradication strides made over the last 40 years. And if polio is not effectively managed, the CDC suggests that a resurgence of polio could paralyze more than 200,000 children worldwide every year within a decade. And while there's no such thing as a microbial manifesto, terrorists and extremists that are rejecting polio vaccination on behalf of their children are functionally turning their children into microbial mujahideen. So withholding vaccines may not be tantamount to active bioterrorism or biological warfare, but perhaps it can be labeled as passive bioterrorism. Terrorists are deliberately disrupting disease prevention systems in place, i.e. vaccines, and incentivizing obstructionist behaviors, including committing violence against healthcare workers, as well as sacrificing children to the disease, anointing them as martyrs should they succumb to illness or death. So this insidious passive form of bioterrorism does not require the need for manipulating pathogens or even mimic the effects of an endemic disease or to successfully weaponize the and disperse the polio. Rather, by deliberately denying prevention measures, the disease is permitted to run its course unfettered. And additionally, violent and obstructionist acts that have been taking place, we've seen in 2014 there were nearly 90 related killings of healthcare workers that went out to vaccinate children. 80 of those healthcare workers that were targeted and killed were in Pakistan, with about 10 in Nigeria. So in short, the effects of preventing access to healthcare workers and supplies to unimmunized children due to violent extremism, and thus denying children a potentially life-saving intervention, are no different than actively exposing children to polio as a weapon. So on, on that, a point that I would like to make as a recommendation is that until there is recognition by the security apparatus in Pakistan, whether it's law enforcement or military, that polio is a threat to its national security, whereby security forces are actively engaged in threat reduction efforts, polio will continue its resurgence. And that also raises a national security concern for the United States and the rest of the world. From there, I wanted to go on to talking about brucellosis. And I wasn't going to talk about this, and I'm not a veterinarian, but I've looked a lot at the uh, economic impacts of zoonotic diseases. But last Friday, I was sitting in the round robin at the Willard when my friend and I began speaking to the table of people next to us. And it's going to sound a little folksy, but Brian and Marsha, who own and operate a family-run cattle ranch, were visiting Washington, D.C. from Montana to meet with their congressman about the problems they're facing with respect to brucellosis. While brucellosis is a zoonotic disease, meaning that one that can infect animals and spread to humans, their concern is about domesticated livestock and wildlife in and around their farm. Also, as it happens, brucellosis was a weaponized agent that the U.S. had as part of its stockpile, as well as the U.S. perceived some other countries had as well. But in the words of these ranchers, they said that the disease has been previously controlled and eradicated in uh, cattle and humans. However, a reservoir remains in wild bison uh, in Yellowstone Park and has uh, spread to wild elk herds of Montana. And these elk migrate and have begun spreading the disease back into cattle in the state. And the consequence of this is that there's been revenue lost as well as operational disruption of these ranches. And one of the things that I found interesting that I didn't know was that the cattle were also being sent to Montana in drought-ridden states like California and Texas. And so the fear was that those states would not do that and Montana would lose revenue from that, as well as not being able to sell the cattle back and or any of the, the beef byproducts. So one of their concerns was that they wanted to ensure that political issues were managed 
to eradicate the disease in bison while the bison population continues to grow and spread to wild elk herd to wander into Idaho and also into Wyoming. They said they've had concerns with APHIS and with the state and fish and wildlife parks and the Montana Department of Livestock. And here again, we're seeing on a smaller scale, disparate coordination and leadership of an issue. And it's been highly politicized about who believes what is necessary and who gets the right resources to allocate towards which effort. And what they really wanted, and I'm not here as a, as a plug to them, but they were really quite illustrative in terms of identifying the fact that there's still a lot of need for addressing zoonotic infectious diseases, as we saw in the UK from foot and mouth disease, from BSE, when we saw the coaling related to SARS, and the billions and billions of dollars that came out of that. And my work in the private sector and doing a lot of pandemic planning and food safety and supply chain security, this can't be understated. This is billions of dollars. Some of it's state funded, some of it's all private sector, some of it's private, public-private partnerships. There's a lot of money at stake here, which means that there's a, a lot of livelihoods affected. So the exports are waning, as we said, and the disease remains um, unmitigated, and potentially the effects that can reach um, our national livestock industry, which I think in and of itself presents a threat. The issues about to you know whom we res who responds, when do we respond? Do we respond before something becomes a disaster? Because with Ebola, had we responded in a rural environment, it would not have actually become a disaster. Um, and just having an outbreak or even an epidemic of a pandemic-prone disease doesn't make it a disaster. It's a disaster when everything and all the people and resources are overloaded and the management falls to pieces. So. Ultimately, I, I just really wanted to thank you for your time and consideration on my diatribe here and wanted to share some reflections from somebody who worked both within the World Health Organization on communicable diseases at the United Nations on the Biological and Toxin, Chemical Wep Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention and looking at addressing multiple non-traditional ways of mitigating the uh, effects of naturally occurring deliberate or accidental diseases, as well as somebody who's been looking at this from the private sector. So thank you. We well, thank you very much. Uh, let me start with the uh, Department of Health in Chicago. You've got quite an operations center out there I visited many times years ago, and it's very sophisticated. It's its in it, its, its own fusion center. Uh, and uh, that community and a few others, but there are very few like that in the country. So uh, it, our the public health community 24-7 in that center? Yes, sir, we are. Okay. And that is because what we have done is utilize some of our grant funding to be very creative in our staffing. So we actually have a public health staff person who is embedded 100% in our Office of Emergency Management and Communications. So while he works on public health issues, he works on the emergency management implications and support needs for those public health issues, and he is on call 24-7 for that emergency operations center um, and the uh, operations within our emergency management structure. And have you had either tabletop or actually uh, uh, on-site uh, training exercises that include a bio or chemical attack? Yes, sir, both <coughs> tabletop exercises as well as functional exercises. And as you might imagine, it's very expensive to conduct very, very large scale functional exercises on the magnitude that would efficiently support our population on an annual basis. So one of the things that we have done is we do um, smaller functional exercises each year building up to a larger, more full scale exercise. And we also exercise our healthcare system partners, specifically our hospitals, on a modular basis so that we are focusing on their areas of weakness and not continuously applauding them for their areas of strength. Who's the lead when you're going through the exercise? When we do exercises related to bio events and other public health infectious diseases, public health is the lead. However, emergency management serves as the coordinating body. So they work closely with us and ensure that we have all of the resources that we need in order to execute the response mission. So you're the incident commander in um, public health? That's correct. Okay. So you're the trained person that handles the public health? 
yes, part of the response. Yes, ma'am. Finally, with regard to uh, surveillance and detection, uh, with the move toward electronic health records at the same time trying to protect the privacy of individuals' public health records, is there a, uh, uh, a digital fusion center where physicians around the state of Illinois, if they see uh, an, an anomaly or unique system so that the public health officials, perhaps even in your fusion center, or in the, can, can see trends developing wherein the broader public health community can respond, or is it still a very anecdotal um, effort where that physician uniquely trained identifies something that is uh, aberrant and then based on that anecdotal incident then the public health community gears up. There's a coordinated effort or do you rely on that that very that's trained in that superb physician? There are actually both. There is an electronic disease surveillance system that has been implemented across the state of Illinois that all local health departments report into for diseases that are reportable by physicians to public health, we then report into that electronic system. But also, uh, specifically within the city of Chicago, we have developed protocols for um, identification of febrile rash illnesses as well as acute respiratory illnesses, whereby clinicians can utilize those protocols to identify um, unusual trends of what they are seeing coming into their ERs and they report those to us specifically at the local health department so that we can activate our epidemiological teams to do further investigation. Uh, Dr. Turbush, in your uh, career both in the private sector and obviously a great career in the public sector, uh, uh, do you find uh, that that Illinois model is replicated uh, around the country or is it uh, unique to a few states when we really think it ought to be part of the infrastructure of all 50? Do you have an opportunity to observe and comment? Uh, yes, sir. And I would say it's hit and miss. I think that the type of fusion center that you've mentioned is uh, uh, particularly more likely to be in the larger cities. Uh, it's not just state by state, it's almost city by, by city. Uh, resource driven, but also the depth of the um, EMS and public health infrastructure. I think that critical mass is often what drives these fusion centers. Um, I think we need more regionalization. I think we need more linking of the existing fusion centers and uh, better opportunities for smaller communities also to participate in that, in that process. Ms. Hirsch, would you comment on, you talked about non-traditional partners having a particular role in responding uh, to a biological event. Uh, could you give us uh, a frame of reference for that uh, notion? Who are we underutilizing based on your experience? Who out there should be part of the integrated system of response and recovery that you think we fail to utilize as effectively and as frequently as we should? I believe since we haven't had a lot of mass casualty event in the United States and we haven't had a lot of problems, we have to look overseas a little bit more. But I do think that uh, we, domestically we should be using the National Guard quite a bit more. I do think that the private sector, and some folks were talking about using the private sector for logistics purposes and stockpiling and warehousing, and I absolutely agree. I do believe that you can have teams of people who have already been used to working together and there's been reference to postal workers and teachers unions or even uh, construction workers who work together who can be trained to do particular things like decontamination or possibly even do things related to burial if need be. Um, I do think the military has a role to play. I was a really strong proponent of having the military be involved early on in, uh, in Ebola. And I also think sometimes we can learn from their command structure, which somebody else I think on a previous panel had discussed. Very good. Advisory board? Yes. Dr. Alexander? Thank you very much for your uh, insights. Uh, I have a question. Uh, related to international cooperation in combating terrorism. And um, as we know, obviously, um, you, <coughs> you can act uh, locally, but you have to think uh, globally, as we say. And my question to you is, uh, from your experience on the governmental level as well as non-governmental agencies, what works and what doesn't work related specifically to the threat of infectious uh, diseases we have seen with Ebola. Want me to 
take a stab at that. Well, uh, using H1N1, government. thank you, sir. H1N1 as an example in April of 2009. Um, of course, uh, infectious diseases knows no border, and that the uh, first indications of uh, this new pandemic virus uh, was actually at a um, uh, U.S. military, U.S. Navy lab at the, at the Mexican-U.S. border where they were able to pick it up. One of the stronger um, network of labs is the one uh, that uh, DOD uses in coordination with others. So I think this um, idea of a network, uh, system of systems of various labs, both um, government sponsored and, uh, and other to include the NGO volunteer community uh, needs to be better coordinated. But I think that the sooner that we can pick it up while, um, well, from a U.S. perspective, uh, while it's uh, uh, further away, uh, obviously the more time we'll have to prepare and, and, and we'll be able to provide more assistance um, uh, that way overseas. So I think networks of labs, system of systems, early uh, notification, transparency, uh, and coordination. The, just to, to echo that, there are already collaborating centers in labs at the international level that are networked. So the World Health Organization has them in different regions as well as in different countries that are potentially pathogen specific for some. Some are just certain, have certain levels of biosafety in which to test certain pathogens. Additionally, they do the same thing for the World Animal Health Organization and the Food and Agricultural Organization. So while there's a lot of capability out there, a lot is duplicated and the coordination is still rather ineffective in my personal opinion. The uh, issues that we've seen even with Ebola, there's an expectation that these international <coughs> organizations should be at the helm of the response that may not necessarily be the case. They may be able to provide subject matter expertise, but they're certainly not involved in terrorist activities or counterterrorism. Tom, please. Uh, since 2008, we all know there's been a pretty substantial decline in support for state and local public health programs. Uh, I think the number that I've seen is somewhere in the order of 45,000 jobs have been lost in public health over the last five years. Can you all say what the impact of that has been in your, in your observations to public health preparedness? And can you give us one, one particular thing that rises to the top of the list that you think this panel could do to help improve the public health component of bio preparedness? So I would agree that since 2008, we've seen a continuous decline in public health budgets from a funding standpoint, which has obviously adversely affected the uh, staffing complement within public health agencies. I've seen from my personal experience a drastic decrease in the number of staff that we have available to simply carry out basic core public health functions. What I can say is that utilizing public health emergency preparedness funding from the CDC as well as for as well as from the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at least in my situation we have been able to relatively maintain our emergency preparedness staff for bioresponse however that capability is getting increasingly difficult to continue to maintain because those funds be, albeit grant funds are continuously declining as well. Um, I think we've had great success in our city of, for leveraging those financial resources that have been available through those grants. But again, as they continue to decline, even the levels of creativity that we've been able to enact are becoming more and more difficult to maintain. So from the panel's perspective, I would say that um, the advocacy for maintenance of those funding um, dollars would really go a long way in helping us maintain our bio preparedness. When I look specifically at the funding that we are able to provide to and utilize for the preparedness of our healthcare system, it is grossly insufficient. 
um, within my own jurisdiction, I have 28 acute care facilities, uh, hospitals that is, and over 120 long-term care facilities that I am trying to keep prepared with a very small number of about $3 million per year. Yes. Debbie, Debbie Troy. So, um, Ms. Hirsch, I was fascinated and frightened by your discussion of the microbial muhajideens and the uh, <laughs> passive bioterrorism. It's, it seems to me we've got a, there, there's two aspects to, to this problem. One is the, um, the active efforts of nefarious folks who just want to weaken our disease systems, and the other is the people on the ground who just don't trust Western medicine and, and people who are the, the, uh, the, the agents who are going, the, the Western public health workers. Uh, what steps do you think we could take to uh, alleviate b both aspects of this problem? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think that, one, the U.S. security apparatus needs to work with the input of the public health community about the best ways to um, prevent and control polio, which is actually something that we already know because this happens to be polio and it's, a disease, it's not a newly emerging disease. We know how to contain it and how to stamp it out. But there has to be a decision by the U.S. national security apparatus to also work in a bilateral fashion with the Pakistani um, national security apparatus. Um, Maybe we do it through the Indians, surprisingly, because the Indians actually have offered bilateral support to Pakistan for polio, and nothing has happened since that offer has been made. But primarily, my, my perception is that primarily that's happened because Pakistan hasn't made up their decision how they're going to go about doing things. And, and an example was in um, maybe a year ago or in the last six months, a local administrator in the Northwest and Khyber Pakhtunwa area had actually decided he was going to co-opt some of his goons with guns to go around and enforce that children were vaccinated. And you know what? It worked. And the children were vaccinated. Nobody was harmed. Nobody was killed. But there was an enforcement mechanism put in place. And so one of the things that we really need to discuss are those uncomfortable things related to whether or not security, if we talk about health security, if you elevate it to a security um, uh, label, that you have to be willing to enforce that as a security concern. So I, I do think there are things that can be done, but obviously you have to have um, the acceptance of the internal Pakistani, and in this case, and also in Nigeria, also in Afghanistan, you have to have their input as well. So. Sounds like we should co-opt the goons with guns. So, <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, please. I would like to follow on that just a little, and then maybe for Dr. McKinney said something that was intriguing. So we've been talking um, earlier today in the previous meetings about leadership and the, the need for strong leadership, but also also partnerships. And my colleague, Dr. Libby, at the end, I think would agree about. We have kind of been talking about how can we put the public back into public health um, and really empower people. Um, so one is, I think we, there's something to be said. We need some strong leadership to bring all the partners together. Um, and I think you've captured some of that. I feel a little uncomfortable blaming Pakistanis for not vaccinating their kids, and we can't seem to do a very good job of that in parts of the United States. <laughs> and I'd hate to call people on the West Coast terrorists yeah. um, because they're not vaccinating their children for measles. Um, so I, I want to put some context there. But I think there's a lesson learned about communicating, and I think Dr. McKinney brought that up about utilizing networks of trust, um, because we seem to have a problem with risk communication. Um, and do you have, you know, what is your, some of your experiences? Are there things to lead? And I do believe it has to, you have to have a strong leadership here nationally um, to encourage that, um, and also to kind of authorize it and open it up and make that an acceptable approach. We've actually done a significant amount of that type of work uh, in my city, primarily engaging and educating faith-based leaders and developing mechanisms whereby we can distribute messages to those faith-based leaders and in turn request that they distribute those messages to their congregations. We've done the same with social service organizations and human service organizations that work with specific vulnerable populations groups and um, one great
great example that I always like to share is a collaboration with the um, organization formerly known as the Chicago Lighthouse for the Blind. They actually have a very low frequency radio station that reaches over 40,000 visually impaired people in the Chicago metro area and parts of Indiana. You need a special receiver to pick up the radio station but we distribute our risk communication messages to the agency and they then read those messages over this low frequency radio station and we reach over 40,000 people that we otherwise would have no way of reaching. Um, so that is one example. We've also begun a, an effort about a year and a half ago where we are now educating and training and exercising Head Start and daycare providers to do business continuity planning and keep their operations running and keep the children that are entrusted into their care safe until the parents of those children can be reunited with them. So for us, it's a multifaceted approach across multiple disciplines um, because government cannot be everywhere at once and we must involve community members, community leaders, and community organizations to help us do what we need to do to protect our citizens. Can I just... Uh, Please. <laughs> you have the last word. <laughs> um, I definitely agree. I don't, I don't want to uh, make a blanket statement that um, Pakistan is doing this. This is about terrorists and extremist organizations, including Al-Qaeda affiliates, Taliban affiliates, Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, and others who are actively using an ideology to ensure that people die or become um, chronically injured for the rest of their lives and hail them as martyrs. So while you may be um, in California and ideologically opting out, in my opinion, for the totally wrong reason because there's no actual scientific linkages about vaccination, it's, an, it's a not too nuanced difference. It's not an ideology of hate and extermination. It's an ideology that's over one's self. This is some, what's going on in, in Nigeria, Pakistan, and in Afghanistan is truly a security threat. And measles is, was a concern, and actually the, the measles outbreaks is what had me start looking at what was going on in, in these areas. I have one final question, Dr. Turbush. Because of your work in the DOD, I mean, obviously they are constantly working with countermeasures and do a lot of uh, R&D work in that area. Uh, as we go forward in the 21st century and try to build a better relationship between DOD, the public health community, and other agencies dealing with biodefense, uh, do you have any recommendations? I mean, there still seems to be from time to time, and I say this with great respect for the organization, it's still a silo that's pretty difficult to permeate. And based on your experience, are there any, any recommendations that you would make in terms of, of uh, the kind of collaboration or improvements between DOD and the private sector, particularly as you address a public health, a biodefense emergency? Yes, sir. Um, DOD does a pretty good job of research, but I think the strength is in the private sector. Uh, as several speakers had previously mentioned that uh, uh, BARDA uh, was the mechanism by which a lot of these orphan drugs and countermeasures got through the so-called valley of death. It was a, a guaranteed um, uh, customer and that still needs to be done. So we're getting back to leadership, but I think private sector, the strength, you know, over, what is it, uh, 85, 90 percent of the healthcare sector is in the private sector. It's not in, not in government. And that goes for R&D as well. So we've got some brilliant minds in DOD research, but I think the real cutting edge stuff with regards uh, development of uh, really new technology, vaccines, countermeasures, uh, in coordination with, with DOD. Um, I think I would speak in favor also of the intelligence community and say that we need uh, the good uh, intel, if you will, to help us to know in which direction to develop these, these new countermeasures. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, it's very helpful to us because we've seen different, we've had different people testify with regard to each one has a role, but in the sense of the unifying them and integrating mutual capabilities for an outcome that we all look for is very helpful, particularly with your experience at DOD. We thank you. We thank all the panelists. We're very, very helpful. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, we're going to take a 
a 10 minute break, maybe nine and a half. Lunches are outside. We got Dr. Irwin Redliner is going to be our luncheon speaker. Any of you been in the military, you can understand what I'm about to say. You got 10 minutes, so you can swallow it now and chew it later. <laughs> <laughs> the food's outside the door. We're going to reconvene at a quarter to one, I guess. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for accommodating our request to uh, uh, keep everything on schedule. Uh, we still have uh, quite a bit of ground to cover, and I'm grateful for your uh, willingness to uh, help us keep to the schedule. Our luncheon uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Erwin Redlener. Uh, many of you know him. He's the uh, professor of health policy and management at Columbia University. He's also the director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. Uh, and we'll invite Erwin to, uh, to share his thoughts with us. Uh, pleasure of working with Erwin since my days in the White House. So Dr. Redlener, please uh, appear before us. Give us the benefit of your thinking. And uh, yes, sir, if you would, please. I suspect you can be prepared to get quite a few questions from the panel, so. Yeah, I'm I, looking forward to it. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, uh, I have known many of the people in this room for quite some time. We've been through a lot of uh, issues and struggles together, and it's really, I feel privileged to uh, speak to all of you on the uh, Blue Ribbon Study Panel. And um, I'm going to try to keep my remarks uh, pointed and specific as I can. Um, and uh, part of the introduction, Tom, maybe maybe should have been, I'm a person with a half empty glass. Just want to just four Half empty just glass? Four, half empty glass as opposed right. to a half full glass. But uh, full disclosure. But I want to start by saying that there are many challenges to face and issues to explore as we think about the state of disaster readiness in the United States. Not that most Americans thought much about this issue before that beautiful sunny day in 2001 when America was attacked by terrorists on the very day, as it turns out, of uh, New York City mayoral primary elections, which of course uh, did not happen. Clearly, the mostly but not entirely unexpected attacks with great loss of life and dramatic infrastructure destruction was shocking enough for all of us. And why wouldn't we be shocked? We're a country which was essentially accustomed to being isolated from a certain level of turmoil and threat that was far more prevalent on other continents and other nations other than our own. We were observers from afar until that day. Yes, we had the Oklahoma City bombing by homegrown terrorists, but this kind of extremist violence by evildoers from other countries just didn't happen here. And to me, though, there was another aspect of the 9-11 attacks that sunk in, consciously or not, to our collective disbelief and shock. And it's this. The actual complexity, the logistics, the coordination, the precision, and the unimaginable scenario of three simultaneous jumbo jet hijackings <clears throat> was very much in the realm of a pretty mediocre Bruce Willis movie. But it wasn't, of course. It was a real, honest-to-God, wildly imaginative terror attack that shook the nation and the world. You know, we could have learned and applied a lot of lessons from that attack and the anthrax mailings that soon followed. But in my view, unfortunately, we had experiences that n did not turn into real lessons and lessons that did not change policies or the way we prepared for subsequent events. And sadly enough, that's true for most of the disasters we've experienced in the nearly 14 years since 9-11. Experiences without lessons, lessons without applications. We've made progress, yes, uh, and some of it, okay, but we're nowhere near where we should be at this point. And every one of these events, which we can know for certain will be predictably referred to as wake-up calls, have been far more suggestive of alarm clocks with very accessible snooze buttons. The catastrophe happens, there's intense drama and media coverage, followed by promises to prepare or respond better the next time. But when the cameras leave, we hit that snooze button and drift back off into complacency, not really changing as much as we should have. And I guess that's maybe human nature on some level. And of all the lessons not really learned about disasters in the years since 9-11, from how to respond to a major anthrax attack, prepare for a superstorm, or prevent a deep water oil drill breakdown, the most important thing that we failed to do was to learn to think about disaster readiness 
with sufficient imagination and at an appropriate scale. And it's not that improvements haven't been made, as I said. Indeed, some important progress has been made, like making airplane cockpits impenetrable. Yes, in spite of the horrible German wings tragedy last month, on balance, I think we did the right thing, and we did it pretty well. But have we learned how to accelerate recovery from a major storm like Katrina in the Gulf, which 10 years later is still ongoing? What about the snail's pace of recovery from the 2012 superstorm Sandy in the Northeast, still far from completed? Articles in today's paper about uh, delays in funding and helping people uh, get out of the jam that they've been in since that storm. Radio and communications technology challenges contributed to the deaths of hundreds of responders in the World Trade Center attack in 2001. And in 2015, 14 years later, responders, including firefighters, rushing to a serious smoke condition in the DC metro system couldn't communicate from the tunnel to units on the surface. Really, couldn't communicate. And while some might disagree, I am telling you that we are hardly better, in my opinion, if at all, to respond to a major pandemic than we were in 2006 and 7 when worries peaked about a possible avian flu that could replicate a global disaster like the Spanish flu of 1918. And even though we filled volumes of planning binders in terms of what we needed to do, I don't think you could show me a large American city that has prepared and sustained its health and public health systems for such a calamity, not a single city in the United States. And worse, even if you could find adequately, adequately prepared health systems, no plans more than scratch the surface about how we could assure the pipelines and supply chains for food and water and medical needs during a massive epidemic, or how we would get the vaccines or appropriate antibiotics made at scale, at scale and distributed properly and in a timely way. Or have we analyzed, or what do we know about, the enormous impact that a pandemic of this size would have on the economy, locally and nationally, maybe globally? What are, what are those uh, impacts? How are we going to cope with those? Who is planning to deal with them? And by the way, these are the things that I worry about, and which is one of the reasons that I have a very limited social life and why my wife doesn't let me talk about my work at home. But <laughs> that said, I, I do want to talk about some of the things that I would consider among the more important barriers to the United States being uh, better prepared than we currently are. They're not in any particular order, but they're all in my mind important factors. And the list for the purpose of my remarks this afternoon does not include the gross underfunding of our public health system and other essential systems needed to improve resilience and response capacity. And I think you've discussed this at some length uh, already today. But about funding, I, I want to make one point, which is that we can't really define what we mean by prepared. And how could we expect to fund something that we can't define? And after all, what, what do we actually mean by a prepared city or a prepared state or even a prepared hospital? We simply don't know the answer to that. If you ask 10 hospitals, you'll get 10 answers. You ask 10 cities, you'll get 12 answers. In fact, I, I would dare say I do this generally when I speak about this topic. I'm not going to do it here because just, we're just not going to do it. But uh, normally, I would ask you to raise your hands, you in this room, if you feel that with respect to yourself, your family, your pets, your community, the people that depend on you, how many of you actually, you could raise your hand invisibly, uh, how many of you actually feel prepared for a major disaster in your community? How many? And I'm telling you, I've spoken to all kinds of audiences. If I get more than two or three hands up and then I test them, well, who's taking care of your mom in the nursing home? Who's picking up the kids from school? Uh, what are you doing about your important papers? Who's going to be paying your mortgage? What's, what's happening? As we get into the details of this, it's abundantly clear to me that we don't even know what we mean by prepared as individuals. Yep. Yes, we can follow the Red Cross or FEMA guidelines about three days of food and water. That's hardly enough to deal with the kinds of disasters. We're glad you didn't ask the question here. Nice job. Yeah, That's out of kindness and respect for the distinguished panel. I'm just saying that if you can't define it, how can you fund it? And in a sense, we're definitionally challenged, and that's a big problem. So let's just put that aside and say that that's 
lingering out there and uh, something that on some level we're going to have to deal with. So I'm going to give you the five top concerns or five of my top concerns. And first is, unfortunately, the federalist system that we live under in the United States. And in many ways, that system serves our country and its people very well. The point is that decisions affecting the lives of citizens are, to the extent possible, decentralized. And by design, government decisions are made by levels of government as close as possible to the people being served. That's the point. It's a fundamental tenet of our society, and on the whole, it's good. The problem is it just doesn't work for disaster planning. Federalism and disaster planning, or good disaster planning, are essentially incompatible. It doesn't, because federalism doesn't allow us to create an enforceable, coordinated master plan, or even the ability to ensure that specific regions are prepared for disasters which are particularly likely and specific to their own communities. Why does the state of Alabama require every school to have a safe shelter for incoming tornadoes for the kids and staff, and Oklahoma doesn't? Why? Is a tornado less likely to kill school children in Oklahoma than in Alabama? How and why is that tolerable? What about planning for a terrorist detonation of an improvised nuclear device? Not a dirty bomb, but an actual IND. Why is there no city in the United States, no city, prepared for such an event, even though people in the federal government say that New York City, Chicago, Washington, Houston, San Francisco, LA, are all potential terrorist IND targets? Yes, it's improbable, but it's something that is on somebody's book of business to think about. Why does a mayor get to decide that it isn't a priority? Maybe they're correct in that decision, but maybe they're not. This is part and parcel of the reality of the system under which we live. The second problem that I'm mentioning is the, what I'm calling the denominator problem. And I think this is rampant throughout government. And here's what, here's what it means. Let's say experts in a state say that 100 million or 200 million N95 masks are needed in the event of a major uh, pandemic. The governor proudly announces that the state has a million such masks in its emergency stockpile, and the total amount stockpiled, let's say, in, in the hospitals in the state is five or six million. And we're patting ourselves on the back, we have a big stockpile, except they're talking about the, numer the numerator, what they have. I want to know the denominator, what they need. And this is a problem, as far as I'm concerned, that's rampant at every level of government. When you hear a report from, a, from an official at the local health department, here, Mr. Mayor, is what we're doing to prepare for this disaster, the mayor should be saying, but what do we need? How far along that path to getting where we need to be are we? What more is it going to take? We cannot be satisfied with a numerator answer to a denominator question. The third problem is what I refer to as the authority conundrum. And it's about the problem we have in managing disaster decision making, from the disaster communications plans to implementation of an effective response. Five years ago, the BP Gulf oil spill became one of the greatest oil-related disasters in history. So who was in charge of the response and the capping of the deep water well, the care of the affected workers, the care of the affected communities? President assigned Coast Guard Commander Thad Allen and the Federal Agency of the United States under the President. Was that who was in charge? Was the Governor of Louisiana in charge? How about BP itself? How about all of the above? How about Billy Nungesser, the Plaquemines Parish President at the time? A lot of people had a lot to say. If there was somebody fully in charge of that response, I'm glad to know it, but it wasn't actually apparent to me. And that's a problem. And a year later, after the disastrous tsunami and catastrophic failure of the Fukushima nuclear power plants, who was in charge in Japan? The government of Japan or TEPCO, the owners of the plant? Again, un impossible to determine who was in charge. That is a problem. From the messaging to the strategies to stop the damage, this is a question, and these are questions never properly answered. And if there were answers, or if someone held, uh, or some entity was in charge, it was clearly a closely held secret. So if there was a very large scale emergency that required all health and public health on hands on deck in New York City, who would call the shot? Yes, there's NIMS, there's an emergency operations center, command center, there's plans on the shelves, et cetera. But who makes the final decision? The mayor, the governor, 
the health department of the state or the health department of the city. Some years ago, this is a true story, a CEO of one of the largest uh, health systems in New York City uh, said to me that, in terms that I won't use here because I don't know all of you as well as I could, but let me kind of paraphrase what he said was. <laughs> in essence, his point was, I don't care who tells me to evacuate this hospital. I am in charge. I'm responsible for the life and safety of the patients in here. And I report to the board of directors of my private voluntary health system. I do not report to the mayor or the governor or the president for that matter. So unless there was a major national emergency declared, I'll decide when I'm going to evacuate my patients. And I will also decide to which hospitals I will send them and when I will send them and how I will send them. So he, he perceived himself as being the sole independent responsible party. And in some ways, our system says, you are right. You are formally right. Uh, we don't control that. So when we do planning on health system readiness in New York City, we have a potpourri of people and things and entities and basically pleading with people to try to get together, have a meeting, and figure out what we're going to do specifically to plan for a big disaster. And by the way, as we saw after Ebola, these hospitals that are controlled by whatever entities are going to want reimbursement for expenses that they incurred getting ready for the disaster or as a result of the disaster. The bills that came into that nearly $5 billion uh, post Ebola fund that was appropriated by Congress were wild. They were just out of control. They were millions and millions and millions of dollars for hospitals that said, since we had to get ready, we had to spend this amount of money. And not only that, we lost revenue because we didn't, we didn't admit patients to the 10 beds that we allocated for Ebola. Um, so things are slightly out of control here. Fourth problem are a category, really, of something I'm calling dangerous disconnects. I'm going to give you uh, three quick examples. So the first disconnect that I would worry about is the disconnect between the silos of public health and personal health services. So between disasters, the daily function of state and local public health departments are fairly routine most of the time. They're providing all kinds of community services and surveillance, creating policies toward the goal of improving the public's health, sometimes responsible for special programs from childhood vaccinations to restaurant inspections and the like. And many health departments have disaster planning uh, entities as well. But they're for the health department. They're for the health department. In New York City, the, the, the health department does not plan for the 75 private sector hospitals. It talks to them. It interacts with them. It doesn't plan for them, really and truly. Meanwhile, on the other side, in the other silo, is the massive direct health services system, from doctor's offices and clinics to enormous academic medical centers and systems who are caring for patients. They're teaching new generations of health professionals, supporting medical research, and all that's fine. It's fine except when it comes to planning for or responding to disasters. These two systems, health and public health, in those circumstances of crisis must function as an integrated, coordinated, single system of assessment, direct care, public safety, and preventions. Decisions about hospital bed utilization, allocation of scarce resources, and a myriad of disaster critical functions blur the lines between the public's well-being and the health of individual patients. But right now, we lack the resources and in mo most places, the planning authority to integrate these two systems when it counts. And in a big disaster, that is a major problem. Second disconnect, military and, civil and civilian assets. Uh, and let's take the example of an evacuation. So uh, let's say a hypothetical Bill Smith, elected mayor of a town of 65,000 people. He's previously a prominent business leader. He became an effective alderman. And with great personality and a good staff, he's elected mayor. He appoints a number of commissioners with a wide, wide range of experiences, some extensive and relevant, others not so much. Now comes a disaster. Maybe a federal disaster is declared even. State resources become available, but now the city, let's call it, as I said, a population of 60 to 70,000 people, needs to evacuate and evacuate quickly. Emergency responders are convened and emergency <laughs> evacuation plans put together, and here we go. It's a green light. Wait, how is this actually going to work? Who thought of the food supply, the water, the medical care that the evacuees will need? Not only because they have chronic medical conditions, because somebody's going to have a heart attack or a seizure en route during the evacuation. Who's dealing with that? Who's organizing the counterflow traffic patterns? Who's making sure there are diapers for the babies because the traffic is going to be incredibly slow? 
Where's the fuel coming from? Who's going to be dealing with the motor vehicle accidents on route uh, out of town? And where are these people going, by the way? Is the state's National Guard being deployed? And who decides what they're doing and how they're coordinating with local resources? Shouldn't they be coordinating with local resources? They should be. Uh, we didn't actually see that in its finest state post-Sandy. But think about this. Shouldn't the regular military forces of the United States be in charge of large operations like this? Because who or what knows logistics and people moving better than the U.S. military? Why exactly aren't they running the show under circumstances that I just described? And where were they during the planning process so they could so they were, they were a known and fully coordinated asset while we're planning and not ad hoc while it's happening. We need to fix this. Posse comitatus, you're thinking, and uh, that is a barrier. That's, that may be, but it needs to be rethought now in the age of mega disasters, completely rethought. And the third and final example of a disconnect is the private sector and public sector disconnect, which is something that is uh, deeply unsettling for people who really think about what we need to do for disasters. So 85 percent of the infrastructure in the U.S. is owned by companies and individuals in the private sector. But government is ostensibly in control of community or regional planning disasters, uh, disaster planning. And I talked about a couple of examples where the confusion uh, in the Gulf and in Japan was very apparent. When the New York State Ready Commission was convened by Governor Andrew Cuomo in the aftermath of Sandy, we were charged to examine what happened and more specifically asked to recommend what should happen in future disasters to avoid or mitigate some of the more vexing problems created by the storm. For instance, the prolonged electrical outage or the persistent gas shortage crisis. The governor very correctly wanted to know what the state should do to avoid similar crises in the next storm. Well, we concluded that there were steps that could be taken by government. For instance, establish a fuel reserve stockpile kept in strategic locations around the state. Millions and millions of gallons are used every day, so there's a limit to what that can do. And that wouldn't be enough to really have a functioning system uh, to make sure we didn't have those crises. But it's the private sector that actually owns the oil wells and the refineries and the delivery trucks and those are the key factors in making and sustaining a resilient supply chain that can function during and after the disaster. Like it or not, and you should like it, they are part of the solution the private sector is. And it's not just because they own the assets, it's because they also have the experience, the expertise, and a whole lot of brain power. A whole lot of brain power. And we need them in the planning. We need not just lip service to having them in the planning. We need them at the planning tables every single time that we're doing serious disaster planning. We need Walmart and UPS and FedEx helping us plan how to make resilient supply chains and distribution systems. There's much more that we could talk about about this, but I want to wrap this up. And I, although I, I do want to say I could have talked to you now at some point, or I'd like to, about some other major issues, for example, the issues of vulnerable populations which have been marginalized, in essence, in most disaster planning uh, processes. Craig Fugate, the administrator of FEMA, actually is in the camp that I totally applaud, which he understands that vulnerable populations have to be part of the central planning if we're going to have an effective plan. It's absolutely necessary. I don't think people understand how many vulnerable people there are. We have, let's say we have 310 million people in the U.S., 75 million are children, 45 million are senior citizens, 120 million of us have some kind of chronic illness. 22 million people, not young and not old, say between 21 and 64, have some kind of disability. 44 million people are poor or near poor. Two million people are in prisons. And a million and a half people are in nursing homes. Uh, and they're not, they're not just out there ready to be taped onto with a post-it the main disaster plan that's generically produced. They are the disaster plan. And if we can't take care of those people, the plan is useless. It's dysfunctional, and it's not even moral. We have to focus on this, and we haven't been to date. Um, so uh, I want to end with a thought. And I would say that I, I get the fact that as wealthy as the United States is, and we have unprecedented wealth even now, even at any point in the last 20 years, compared to other countries in the world, obviously. But our resources are not unlimited. And the possibilities for devastating disasters that could affect us 
are literally staggering to the imagination. And we have many other priorities, however. So I'm not saying spend the bank on disaster preparedness. We have profound poverty and all kinds of disparities in our country. We have three and a half trillion dollar in dollars probably in infrastructure repairs that, that need to get done. We have cancer and Alzheimer's disease to cure, and many of our schools are in big trouble. This is, while my plane was canceled this morning, I got to read the entire USA Today. 61,000 bridges in the United States called in bad shape. 61,000 bridges. It's not the tunnels, it's not the levees, it's just the bridges, ladies and gentlemen. So here's what I really, the final point I'm making here is that I understand that we have to make decisions and establish priorities. But what really troubles me is how those decisions are made. They're made passively, inactively, they're made by default. We don't have the grown-up dialogue that we need, uh, that a mature society should have that examines our needs, assesses our assets, and makes wise decisions about how and where we'll spend our treasure. Because if we did that, if we went through that process, and then we all decided that we simply are not going to prepare for every conceivable catastrophe, but we are going to spend the next decade fixing our schools and our educational systems, or fix the infrastructure, or make sure every kid has appropriate access to quality health care, fine. We've made a decision in the best interests of our country by everybody joining in and arriving at the decision. The problem is that the process for decision making is a mess. It's not proactive, it's chaotic, it's ineffective. It's decision by default and by bad politics. And as such, it has predictable outcomes. America remains more vulnerable and less resilient than we should be, with a landscape littered with programs here and there. Literally, random acts of preparedness is what we have across the United States. And in my opinion, that's not a situation any of us should tolerate or certainly be proud of. That's all I have to say. Well, the next time you appear, you can be a little bit more provocative, okay? I, I'll, I'll try to. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Uh, I, I wouldn't expect anything less from you, Dr. Redliner. I've known you for a long time, so thank you very much. I will uh, I can be in with a couple of questions, but for the first time, I think I'll turn to the advisory panel and see if you want to start. Go ahead, Gigi. Ladies first. Um, thank you. I'd like to ask you to um, reflect on the one particular vulnerable population I know you've done a lot of work um, uh, about in, in, the, uh, in the last decade, and that's uh, children. And right. And especially needs of children in biodefense. I'm wondering if you could. Your question to yeah. Yeah. Get closer to the microphone, please. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, you're Repeat asking about. Repeat the question. Uh, yeah, so well, the audience can, can hear. Can you talk a little bit about um, the special populations, uh, vulnerable, po vulnerable populations, uh, particular children in uh, Um Children represent a particular poignant uh, challenge for us. You know, I'm a pediatrician by background. I have five grandchildren at this point. I, I'm very, very tuned in to children and have been for my whole career. Um, and when we came to face the challenges associated with disaster, disasters and disaster planning, it was immediately apparent that no thought whatsoever had been given to the special needs of children. And in fact, this came up exactly two weeks after 9-11. I was at a briefing of uh, all the hospitals in New York City with federal, state, and local officials talking about what was happening. Literally, it was on the 25th, two weeks later. Um, and um, there was Q&A afterwards, and I raised my hand. I was sitting next to the late dean of the School of Public Health at, uh, at Columbia, and I, uh, I said, what, what is being done around the planning for children who might get caught up in a disaster? And literally, the panel looked at each other, and one of them said, nothing. Uh, which is when I went back to my own institution and started making some calls, called the American Academy of Pediatrics, et cetera, and a process was begun by probably, I'd say about 20 or 30 pediatricians from different places and other people interested in children that began to really look at this. And uh, eventually the National Commission on Children was formed, uh, and from that a bunch of recommendations happened. And I would say now that most of the relevant federal agencies have been really looking at hard what the needs of children are. The problem is that we don't know a lot of the answers. We actually don't know the dose of doxycycline for a kid who's three months old that's been exposed to anthrax. We do not know it. 
So one of the things we've done is we've had now over the years three consensus conferences where we bring in the experts and we say, okay, I know you don't know, I know there's no research, but what is your consensus about getting you get a call in the middle of the night, you have this situation, what are you going to say? You can't say nothing. You're the infectious disease expert. Um, so there are things happening, but we're far from a place that I'm comfortable with. New York City schools, we have a thousand schools and a million school children in the public schools of New York City. Um, I'm very worried about the level of preparedness in the schools. Very worried. And we're going to try to look into that. And I would dare say that that would be a problem in any city. We have a lot of work to do, but I would say in this case that the process has started. Yes. Dr. Parker. Oh, Dr. Yeah, Parker, sorry. then Dr. Alexander. Can I ask you a question? All right, Dr. Oh. Alexander, then Dr. Parker. I, <laughs> I knew you meant to say that. We, yeah. we defer to seniority around here. With all with all the questions that you that you raised, and many are obviously legitimate. My question is, as an academic trying to look at the lessons of uh, history, what worked, what didn't work. For example, the uh, experience of uh, Noah and the Ark. In other words, in the face of the coming flood. What did Noah do? No time for hesitation and time for decision. And at least that's the story and what's the moral of the story? And how can we learn from that kind of experience? Um, I, I, think the, I think the big point, Dr. Alexander, is that, you know, it's, I'm going to go from Noah to buying disability insurance. You, it's a mindset that I think adults generally come to. That if we're going, to, we could we could just kind of wait around, not do anything for the future. We we don't have to invest in retirement. We don't have to buy insurance. We could just kind of keep rolling along, and then something happens, and then we're really sorry that we didn't do whatever it is. I guess building an ark be one example from antiquity, let's say, and uh, what you do in your personal life is, an, is another example. Uh, it's a very difficult decision, and, and, and especially for individuals or countries where there's real economic decisions to be made, we have to come to some way of a process that will allow us to say, we are going to build an ark. We are going to prepare these six cities for the event in the event of a, uh, a, a nuclear detonation. Um, and that's a decision that's a ribbon uh, that we get to by discussion, by understanding the science and the facts and figuring out what we want to take a risk uh, around and what we're going to invest in to make sure we've reduced the risk to the absolute minimum. But I, I get what you're coming from. That, that's what I would say about it. Dr. Parker. Yes, I, um, and I want to first thank you because you've actually galvanized pre preparedness community and prepares, preparedness officials to to really seriously consider um, vulnerable populations, particularly children. So thank you for that and your leadership in that. And my question or comment is along the lines with, with GG and, it, and its unique challenges with biodefense and particularly medical countermeasures, be it antibiotics in the stockpile, are vaccines already licensed, are vaccines in, in development? And, and you note, note that we've already, you know, the community has taken it serious and beginning to grapple with the challenges, but how do we really make progress now? How do we, you know, collect the data that's needed, or are there other communities that might help us? So how do we really begin to make progress so that we have the right antibiotics in the stockpile and know the dosages for children? Right. How do we get the vaccines that can be available post-exposure prophylaxis for children? Well, this is, a, this is an extraordinarily important question and comment, and I'm glad you brought this up. And I, I think what we're dealing with here is specifically around the pharma industry and the public health needs of the United States and the the various mechanisms for researching coming up with the right answers. That we're, we're a little bit adrift here because the farmers are operating under a business model that is not necessarily compatible with what the country needs from a public health point of view. And uh, I'll mention his name because it's, I wrote about him in my book. So the former CEO of Wyeth, a guy named Bob Esner, who some of you may know, uh, told me that 
the country is missing a public health czar. I, I hate to use the word czar, but I think you get the point. It's not the Secretary of HHS. It's not the Surgeon General. It's somebody who, or something, that could lead uh, the development of, of ideas, <coughs> like Barnum, maybe other ideas, that will uh, be able to take the realities of trying to have a functional business, where again, the CEO of the pharma company does not report to Secretary Shalala. Uh, that person, re when you're Secretary, I mean, <laughs> or any time actually, Donna yeah. Shalala. Yeah. Uh, but um, the, the problem is that the, we have different worldviews of what needs to happen, and unless somebody's going to put up the money, in a, in a substantial way so that there, there, there's an understood business model unless we nationalize the farmers, which we're not going to do. So we're, we're dealing with, with incompatible systems right now. And we do need some way of finding common table uh, that smart people from industry and smart people from the public health community can say, listen, we've tried different things, but now we really do have to solve this. The, the new policies around the superbugs, for example. Who's going to develop those antibiotics? And at what cost? And uh, if we're going to develop them at a significant cost, but we're also saying you can't use those because we're saving them for when the resistant, the multi-resistant uh, bugs appear, then uh, what's what is that model exactly? I, I have no idea what the answer is. I'm just I, I'm just agreeing with you. It's a really important point. I'd love to hear other people's comments about that too. Jim Greenwood. I thought it was interesting to hear you talk about a denominator problem. I think you have one. You, you said that your cup was half full. It's nowhere near half full. <laughs> no, it's, I, 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 I uh, actually <coughs> don't even have a cup. Okay. <laughs> uh, seriously, though, um, yeah. quite two questions related, very related. One, how do you, you prepare for an improvised nuclear device attack? This is and to what extent, if at all, is Washington, D.C. and its environs, have they, have there, has there been any planning for such a well, device? Well, you know, it's, this is a very interesting question because, you know, really an IND is an extraordinarily improbable event with extraordinary consequences if it happens. What Brooke Buttemeyer and other researchers have shown us, though, is a very, very interesting <laughs> reality, which is that if the public knew some very simple things about sheltering in place for 24 to 48 hours and then leaving upon getting the right instructions from the, from the uh, public officials, hundreds of thousands of lives actually could be saved in a place like New York City. That's, if we only did that, but you know, if you're the mayor of New York City, are you feeling like you, know, you want to go out and start warning people about what to do when uh, you know, Hiroshima occurs in Times Square? There, there are political issues, there's communication issues, but what's frustrating is that that fact alone, if every citizen knew it, could be enormously beneficial in saving lives. Secondly, there's a lot of mythology about INDs. You know, a lot of people kill, would be killed, there would be horrible, horrible destruction, but not everybody would, would die. We'd have 50 or 75,000 uh, deaths probably in the immediate sense in a city of 8.2 million be an unimaginable, indescribable tragedy, but there would be survivable remnants that need to be organized and take care of the people need being taken care of. Except that if we don't, if we're putting our head in the sand and not talking about it at all, then we're guaranteed that if it did happen, we'd have the worst possible outcome as opposed to a better outcome. And, and has any such planning occurred in the Washington environment? Maybe, uh, there, uh, there, in other words, and by the way, there's a lot of things that I'm saying. I'm not uh, the White, I'm not in the National Security Council. I'm not a, uh, a secretary. There are things that are being discussed on a very high level that are very important and very complex and very top secret. So if it's being discussed in Washington, D.C., in behind closed doors, uh, and it doesn't get to the cities and to the citizens, you know, we have a problem. Because nobody, where does the message get connected from the people that are interested in continuity of government? For example, I visited some guy in the White House once. He was like on the, how many floors in the old executive office building? Five or four or five? He was on the seventh floor. So like, he was in this sort of attic or in the eaves of the White House of the old executive office building. 
And I, I said, what do you do? He said, I'm, uh, I'm responsible for continuity of government. I, I said, where's, where's your staff? I said, where's your staff? Seriously, he said, she's out to lunch. <laughs> so I, I'm saying that there are things happening. There are obviously things happening. There are very smart people at the highest reaches of government that are discussing these things. But if you don't let us know uh, in the cities, the states, the counties, what is it we're supposed to do? I'll tell you something else that's unbelievable to me, which is that uh, if you model evacuation patterns out of a large city where people are going to go, let's say we had a meltdown at an Indian Point nuclear power plant. There's 18.7 million people that live within 50 miles. So some millions of people are going to go. Where, where are they going? And when are they coming back? We still have 90,000 people who had to leave communities around Fukushima that are not coming back in their lifetimes. There isn't a single town, village, county in the United States of America that has been appropriately planning for receiving evacuees. Because it's not just tents and you know uh, bottles of water they need. They're going to need jobs, health care, schools, et cetera, et cetera. We have done, as far as I know, maybe correct me, Tom, if I'm wrong about this, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any planning whatsoever for destination communities for large-scale evacuations that will be persistent evacuation, persistent displacements. So there's a lot of things, a lot of areas of, that require a lot of work, and, you know, it's big issues, not for the faint of heart. Ken? So what are you guys doing in Homeland Security? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what we did. I mean, if you've had trouble going into New York City or Washington, D.C. on a beautiful sunny day, how the hell do you think you can get out uh, with 8 or 10 million people on a bad day? It's not really going to happen. I think you've got to accept that, that notion and say, okay, to your point, I'm particularly concerned about an improvised device that may be radiological. You don't have maximum uh, mortality, but you have huge panic, huge anxiety, yep. radiological plume that's going to expand some life. You got a shelter in place, by the way. You need plastic sheeting and duct tape, but that's really important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think you raise a very important question. I think mm -hmm. you as well. I mean, the, the environment, the urban environment, poses extraordinarily complex problems because it's rare will you be able to see a massive evacuation. I mean, you can get off the uh, outer banks when the Weather Channel says it's coming your way. Uh, technically, you can get out of the, uh, well, I don't know why you leave buses in the parking lot when Cortina's on its way, but that's somebody else's decision. You can get out of the way of a hurricane if you see it three or four days coming. But your point, uh, Dr. Redliner, if it's that event, uh, yep. an unexpected event, catastrophic uh, consequences, I don't think you're evacuating big cities. I just don't think you can do it. And I think you have to accept that as part of your planning procedure. So the answer is nothing about evacuation, Madam Secretary, because it ain't going to happen. <laughs> Ken. Okay, thanks, Doctor. I appreciate your comments. I was particularly intrigued by your comments that, the, that you wrapped up with about the decision-making process yeah. for um, preparedness and the allocation of resources. And I mean, according to you, you find it completely ad hoc and disjointed. And you know, one response to that is, well, that's democracy. You know, it's a messy process, and allocation of resources is done by things uh, are allocated by criteria that might not always be rational. Um, that's the reality of democracy. The reality of Investing that responsibility in politically accountable people, the executive branch and the legislative branch. Um, you mentioned in terms of how to fix it. You know, aside from rationalizing democracy, which is, I think we can agree, is a pipe dream. Yeah. Um, you, you suggested this public health czar or public health official. Um, any other specific ideas as to, at least on the federal level, how we can make that process a little bit more rational going forward? Well, I, I guess. Uh, I, was, I think I would start at the top here. I mean, I think the president and the president's staff, the, uh, the cabinet, has to come to some agreement about a structure for decision making that becomes increasingly more inclusive and gets down to governors, gets down to real decision making. You know, I know there's lots of meetings, for example, with deputy secretaries on various issues that happen uh, at the White House, and then they go back to their agencies. and know something happens or doesn't happen but even the attempts right now to bring people together tend to kind of dissipate rather rapidly so I think sustained leadership from the top is key here secondly the, the right now and the reason I'm talking about this public health star is that there is no particular venue within government as it's currently structured and there could be 
um, it's not incompatible with democracy to have a forum that's got authority and the ability to change things um, to be the place where these things are discussed. I, I don't think it's beyond human ken to, f I, not ken, but you know, got it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. to, uh, to figure out how to reconcile the needs of our very vibrant, important industry of the farmers with the public health needs of a country. We just need, somebody has to convene that and guide that. But I mean, I know, I know a lot of people in the farm industry because of, uh, for a lot of various reasons. And I, I don't think anyone ref would refuse to participate in those discussions. We just need to have somebody leading it where they're coming to the table knowing that what they're saying or what they're concluding will have some impact, will have some consequence, as opposed to yet another meeting where you kind of, you come, you talk, you leave, you go back to business as usual. And that's the cycle that has to be broken. And, and like I said, I really would not be so distressed if a decision was taken, you know what, we're just not going to, I'm just using this as an example, we're not going to deal with INDs now because it's really more important for New York City New York City's uh, average uh, in its schools for third graders reading at grade level is around 15%. I mean, we, we have extraordinary problems. So if somebody said, you know what, we're going to take our chances on an IND from Al Qaeda, we're going we're gonna to fix these schools. You know, I, I might or might not agree with it, but there would be some rationale there for leading us to that conclusion. But um, you would well, all of you would know more than me about how to make, how to make you know, really uh, operationalize this. But if I could follow up on your public health star idea, I mean, not to get too wonkish, but have, do you have thoughts about where that person would actually be in the federal structure, assuming it's actually that person would be yeah. in the federal structure? Uh, I, I think that person would have to report to the president. <coughs> because in, in the White House. In the White House, reporting to the president in some fashion or manner, I, I, whether that works or not, I mean, uh, all of you would know uh, better than me, but it seems to me that the president, whoever he or she may be, has to say, we need this solved. It's in America's interest that we, we kind of transcend the political differences and we figure out how to, how to create a public health infrastructure that will help the whole country. And um, I don't know that anybody could really say that with enough force or power other than the president of the United States. I, I just think it's more complex than that. I I'm guess, sure I it guess, is, Donna. Yeah, 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 I'm sure. I yeah. guess um, uh, having a public health czar just would drive me crazy. Uh, another czar without any staff. Um, right. Who has the ear of the president. So um, the, the problem here is you're talking about different uh, decision-making structures for different incidents. In fact, the FEMA director commands the public health service in an emergency. Um, the FEMA director uh, takes over uh, in an emergency. They have the authority to do that. HHS relinquishes um, authority to the FEMA director and the public health um, officers, in fact, work under the FEMA director in a, particularly in an incident kind of uh, situation. So there, there are structures within the federal government um, uh, to deal with that kind of thing. Bioterrorism, clearly, um, uh, particularly since it's going to be ongoing, you're not, uh, requires a different kind of decision-making structure. Sure. We started out by talking about the challenge of federalism. Assuming that we can't get rid of federalism. Nor should we. I was, the question I is, let the record show I'm not proposing a decision-making system with enough authority in emergencies to be able to run the course and be able to um, manage uh, the various levels of government and the expertise of the United States, and how do you train them well enough so they're, they go through exercises. Yes. If you ask me what happens in my community, for example, I can answer almost all of your questions. I can answer them about the University of Miami, I can tell you what the county's going to do. Yeah. But in general, because of someone like Craig, Florida is organized for hurricanes. Right. Not particularly for bioterrorism, but it, we certainly are well organized for hurricanes. We have seven days of uh, sure. food. 
and all sorts of structures about um, because we're in a coastal region, we know exactly what we're going to do with 10,000 students if we have to evacuate them. Right. I can tell you about the planes and the ships and the, I mean, we plan down to a level of detail. Bioterrorism and uh, the kind of thing we're talking about requires, it seems to be a different structure because you have to have a public health infrastructure. But more than a public health infrastructure, the private sector has to be wielded yes. together with the public sector. So. What we need to do is to think about how you glue the system together and then put it through a series of exercises so it actually works, so everybody knows what they're doing. The fact that the nurses we heard, I haven't read the disaster plans, is a disaster in itself. So the challenge, it seems to me, for high officials is to figure out <coughs> how to put federalism together in a way in which it works. Um, to be able to manage our way through uh, what are much more complicated crises, in my judgment, than the kind of bombing or, or um, uh, a terrorism uh, assault on buildings, as horrible as they are. Yes. Well, you know, uh, right after And I don't think that's a czar that reports to the president. I think it's just, it requires more infrastructure than that in terms of who has the authority to make the decision. I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely right about that. I just think that right now, it, it's we don't have a described no, it's very in place existence. So yeah. th this is, you know, I'm using the idea of this exactly. public health sorry, just uh, really symbolically to just sort of express and the there fact. There is an assistant secretary for emergency management sure. now at HHS. Asper, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, so after, right after Sandy, this was 2012. New York City was flooded with people. I mean, the president said. We will not have a repeat of Katrina, period. And we had, you know, almost every conceivable kind of asset in the community uh, being organized, not even out of the Office of Emergency Management in the city. We had National Guard. We had the mayor's office. The mayor decided that uh, it was Michael Bloomberg, that he's going to just manage everything. So all questions went to the mayor. Meanwhile, we had people literally roaming the streets looking for where they're going to set up shop. I walked into a, uh, a shelter in a school in Staten Island, and... Uh, they tell me there's a medical clinic there. I, I go in there. Who's operating it? MedSense South Frontier, Doctors Without Borders. I, how did, what are you doing here? Well, we were told to come here and to help with the. And so <laughs> it's fine. I, and I, believe me, I, you know, Paris is my favorite place on earth, but what the hell was this guy doing here? He had a table full of medicines that were completely inappropriate in the school here. It was just kind of these random things. We had, we had five mobile pediatric clinics that, uh, that you're familiar with. Um, in the city, and I was trying to find where, 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 where should we put them? Where, where do we go? I, it, it, what we went through just to sort this out, and we never really got a satisfactory answer. We had to just go someplace. Uh, and there's that's these. Why during most disasters, yes. they tell people to stay out. Yes. Right. Yes. The first rule is don't let a lot of people in. Well, hard to stop. Yeah, one of your uh, one of your colleagues that testified previously, Dr. McKinney from Chicago, talked about uh, her role in really coordinating uh, activity at the uh, local and the state level. And unfortunately, I don't think uh, uh, that's a model that's uh, been used very effectively in other urban communities. At the end of the day, you you fight as you train, and you train as you fight. And unless you've got everybody at the table, yeah. a small group of people at the right. table, and then you exercise and rehearse those plans, you're going to run into the same situation post Sandy uh, as you did. I mean, the lessons are in Katrina and your earlier statement was uh, we have experience without lessons and lessons without application. We had experience in Katrina. Uh, there were lessons, uh, but most of those lessons were lost yes. uh, and not applied at Sandy. So I guess even uh, the rudimentary notion that after every disaster you get a debrief, what has transpired that we found very effective, what has transpired it was horribly ineffective, let's maintain the good and figure out how to resolve the bad. We have, we, we're still not doing that in a very, a very efficient way. So I, I think among all the observations you made, that's one of the most important. Ken, please. Can, can I just, just clarify one thing? I took, I took your points about the decision-making process to be directed not so much at the way we operate in a crisis, but before the crisis, the government's right. ability to look ahead, prioritize one threat over another threat, one value over another value, as you said, education, versus uh, crisis, you know, preparing for a bio threat or whatever. Um, that, that, I thought that was the failing that you were 
primarily trying to address with your comments generally about the broken decision-making process and your specific recommendation about a public health official as opposed to, to coming up with a decision-making process that operates best within the crisis. Am I wrong about that? Not wrong, Ken. It's just it's, it's sort of multiple layers, unfortunately. So, right. so we, we have problems in the decision-making process, but we have problems way down lower in the, on the totem pole in the, in the process, <coughs> excuse me, of just even planning on a local level. I mean, I go to a lot of planning meetings now. I'm, uh, I'd like to advise the mayor, but, you know, we never have had any, any private sector people there. You know, we're lucky if we get the local Red Cross chief there. But the whole idea of having those people from the private sector who have so much to offer, we need them badly. You know, we'll call on them when something happens, or Walmart will bring a truck and they'll distribute, you know, bottles of water. But the, the whole process of deciding what to do and how to do it uh, is just not right from top to bottom. But the last thing I was saying, which what you're referring to, is that at a fundamental level, we, we are not making those decisions, and democracy is messy, and I understand that, but you, we can't have uh, poor, decision, poor disaster planning and horrible schools mm -hmm. and broken infrastructure. I mean. Right. Something's not good here because we have to figure out what we're going to, we have plenty of money, we have to figure out what we're going to spend it on and do it effectively with smart people from all parties. Jim, last question. Yeah, <clears throat> you talked about the need for the military to be involved in <clears throat> all of this, and you reference uh, Posse Comitatus, which goes back to 1878 or something. Right. And <clears throat> The RAND Corporation has, has taken a look at what the, the military's role should be in, in these kinds of disasters. Have, have you actually thought through that how Congress might rewrite that statute? And, and I, I, I would imagine that the black helicopter folk crowd would go crazy if Congress started they to do would, that. They would, although, you know, in 1992, after uh, Hurricane Andrew, with a true Category 5, really devastated South Florida, and I was there a few days later with uh, some mobile medical units, um, Colin Powell was running the show. I mean, uh, I may have slightly overstated that, but but he was, for all intents and purposes, he was uh, designated by the president to go down there and right down is that, is that right? Yeah, and it was phenomenal. It was very very well. It was a very very different animal than what we saw after Katrina or after Sandy, for that matter. It was organized. It was effective. It got done. It was people were served, and it was you know it was a big mess, but. But it seemed to work. I think Posse Comitatus was designed to keep uh, Army from being police officers in America. Is that, I mean, that's basically the essence of it. We cannot have the federal government uh, becoming the, the local cops or the state police or whatever. That, that fundamental principle, as far as I understand the law, is good. I mean, I, you know, no one could disagree with that. But it seems to have been extended to really, you know, you uh, an arm's length, arm's, uh, length uh, distancing of military and their assets and their expertise when we really need them. And by the way, in addition to not having any private sector people at these meetings, we have nobody. We don't even have the National Guard represented at the vast majority of these tabletops. Um, and we'll call them when the thing happens, but that's a little too late. You know, we could keep you here a lot longer, Doctor, but I'm afraid we've got three more panels to do. But we thank you very much for your very, you. very, exactly. very helpful testimony. Thanks, Connor. And we look forward thank to hearing you. from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Panel three is now going to join us. It's the pharmaceutical response. We have Dr. Ann Garut, CEO of Epivax. Mr. Daniel Abdunabi, President and CEO of Emergence Biosolutions. Mr. Mike Jervenik, Managing Director of Silken Evans. And Mr. Jude Lasas, Executive Manage Manager of Countermeasures Delivery and Distribution of the United States Postal Service. Ladies and gentlemen, please come forward. To maximize our ability to have uh, the q and I'm going to ask you to try to, uh, best you can, if you got written testimony to uh, you know, relate to us in a, almost in a talking point version and leave it behind so we can review it because I think probably the most
some of the most constructive engagement is when the advisory panel has an opportunity to uh, engage in a conversation with you. So I appreciate your participation. Proceed. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Governor Ridge and members of the panel, at your last meeting, my friend Senator Sheldon Whitehouse spoke to you about regulatory systems that are in place to protect shareholders, or sorry, stakeholders, instead of encouraging innovative methods for solving existing and new bio threats that we face. As he said, protecting incumbents stifles innovation. I'm here to put a face on that issue, and at least as it applies to vaccine development, having experienced it firsthand. I know, and I hope that you will know at the end of my talk, that there are far better ways to respond and to recover from a biological threat than what we're doing today. I trust that by the end of my presentation, you will know it also. My name is Annie DeGroot. I'm the, an infectious disease expert, and I'm uh, founder, CEO, and scientific officer of EpiVax. Over the past 17 years, my company has been engaged in developing and designing vaccines that are more effective, safer, faster, and cheaper to produce than vaccines made with ex existing methodologies. In one sense, we're like many small biotech companies that have a solution, potentially, for dealing with bio threats. But our company may be a little bit different from others. We've become successful by challenging the scientific status quo. And it has been a struggle, but I think it's worth the effort. And innovation can bring around solutions to important problems. That's why I'm here to talk to you today. What's unique about our small company is that we have special computer-driven tools for vaccines and biologic design. We also put forward innovative vaccine design concepts, many of which have eventually percolated up to the level of the bigger firms who do vaccines. I, th I think percolation is fine when it comes to new ideas that need to be adopted in science. However, but what I've learned, and fr many of you know already about bio threats over the years since 9-11, waiting for new ideas to percolate simply is not going to solve the problems, and these ideas may arrive too late before they make any real impact. So what's the important idea that we'd like to move forward for biodefense? Our company has, made, uh, has developed methods for making more effective, safer, and potentially less costly vaccines on demand. The time to think about these new ideas is now. I realize that many of these ideas may not sit well with incumbents in the vaccine industry, including some of the folks who are present in this room. But then again, isn't that always the way it is when new ideas drive change? How do we do this vaccines on demand? We use our extensive knowledge of immunology, our scientific acumen, and our pri proprietary scientific co computational tools to discover the components of pathogens that trigger immune responses, as well as those that enable pathogens to escape from immune defense. As a result, our computational tools can allow us to design a vaccine almost immediately, within 24 hours of having the sequence. We do it directly from the sequence of the pathogen that's made available over the internet. And not only can we design vaccines on the fly, but we can also predict which vaccines will work and which vaccines will not. The difference in the approach we take is significant. Traditional vaccines are made using what I call the shake and bake method. Take a virus or a piece of a bacteria, grow it up, kill it, and inject it. That's a method that hasn't changed since Louis Pasteur. Vaccines on demand are a potential and powerful solution to bio threats, and the approach has broad implications for other vaccines, vaccines in general. But to implement these ideas, the way we make vaccines, the way they're designed, developed, deployed, and actually approved must change. That's the method that's upsetting the incumbents and the regulators. And I'm here to tell you that it's critical to change that in order to better address the bio threats we face today and to prepare for those that we might encounter in the future. Let me give two examples that you're probably familiar with. 
One example is H1N1 pandemic influenza. When it emerged in Mexico, the virus was shipped to the CDC and the CDC checked it out and then informed the scientific community. The bad news, antibodies against the last season's influenza did not protect against the new pandemic strain. The good news, we went further. Using our computational tools, we determined that the same seasonal influenza had components that could be effective against the new pandemic influenza and that the, the seasonal influenza could potentially protect against the new pandemic flu. CDC never looked at that possibility, even though the literature was already replete with evidence that these T cell epitope triggers, that's the only scientific word I'll use, could and would make a difference. What did we do? What could we do? We let our network of scientists know. We sent emails around the world and reached out to our larger network so that the information could be taken into consideration when the response for pandemic flu went, got underway. Essentially, our message was, hold your horses. Maybe there are elements in the seasonal flu vaccine that could protect, that vaccination against the flu strain of last winter would protect and reduce mortality, and, not, and that the new flu would not fill hospitals to capacity, as some were claiming. Our findings told us that rushing to spend millions to make a new pandemic flu vaccine using existing methods would, and as it turned out, not really even be produced in time, might be unnecessary. Were we right? Absolutely. Did these ideas get any traction? Absolutely not. Could we have eased the panic with some <coughs> rapid, well-focused clinical studies? had funding been available for innovative ideas? Absolutely. But bigger companies, the incumbents, the go-to group for the US government, were already in discussions about making a new flu vaccine using existing methods. Nothing we said as loudly as we could say it could interfere with the process since the connections were in place and the established approach was viewed as non-controversial. Example number two, H7 and 9. We put the same algorithms to work on that new flu strain when it emerged in 2013. This strain is very worrisome. It causes 40% mortality in people who are exposed. And it's still causing great worry among pandemic flu experts. Even yesterday, there were two new cases in China. So what did we find out about that new flu strain? We found out within 24 hours of having access to the sequence, that the virus was somehow lacking those specific triggers that would drive protective immune response. It was a stealth virus. Again, we sounded the alarm and predicted the vaccines in our government that pr make producing vaccines using the standard methods would be poorly effective. Were we right? Absolutely. Did it make any difference? No. So you ask why? Why should we care? To me, it's a serious problem when the H7 and 9 vaccine produced using funds from our government is one of the least effective flu vaccines that's ever been made. Especially when tools that we have available to us now can actually make a better vaccine and predict the outcome. So there is a better way. In fact, working with collaborators in Japan and in Florida, we produced a new flu vaccine that's only three pinpoint differences from, different from the, the original uh, vaccine that was made. And we've shown that it's 20-fold better. What's the chance of getting this more effective vaccine to the clinic? I'll let you know next week when I talk to NIH colleagues about whether they'll fund a clinical trial. But I don't think it's going to be any different from my previous experience, and I'm not holding my breath. So what's my message? My message is that using innovative new tools, we, we can design and provide the recipe for a new vaccine within 24 hours of receiving the DNA sequence of any bio threat. And we can distribute that information electronically to vaccine manufacturers anywhere in the world. My vision of the future is that we can do this and distribute the vaccine and if regulations were updated, we would reuse an existing vaccine delivery vehicle, and that particular new vaccine could be produced and distributed to pharmacies or post offices 
wherever you might have within a few weeks of an outbreak. Wouldn't it have been great to have that in place to respond to Ebola in Sierra Leone and in Guinea? I think making vaccines on demand could save millions of lives and it could save tens of billions of dollars. Those dollars are being used now instead to create standard va vaccines that are being stockpiled in warehouses. After a few years, their efficacy expires and new versions of the standard vaccines are put in place. Stockpiling is a costly and potentially ineffective solution to creating a national biodefense system. If you think that making these vaccines this way is science fiction, it's not. Because at Epivax, we've done everything that I just described, except package the vaccine and distribute it to the public. We made a vaccine for Lassa fever in a live fire test funded by DARPA. And we're about to start a DITRA funded program for Q fever um, that, that will be tested, at least in murine models. Agility like this is what the country needs today because no one knows what we're gonna face when it comes to bio threats. The next bio threat we face could be the combination of two different bioterror agents combined with genes that give antibiotic resistance. What then? Making a vaccine on demand is the only response that really makes sense. So the very nature of disruptive innovation is that it disrupts the status quo. If we're so convinced, why don't we move these techniques forward ourselves? The current barriers are so high that it's impossible for anyone other than entrenched incumbents to participate. It can cost tens of millions of dollars for animal trials, phase one trials, phase two tests, thousands of pages of supporting documents. We no longer have the luxury of time when it comes to dealing with bio threats. Excuse me. We don't have the luxury of time here as well. I, <laughs> and I appreciate that you've given us some very, very insightful uh, statements and talking about a change of a paradigm. I'm going to ask you to summarize so we can get to the other panelists. Okay? Thank yes. you. So I want to thank you again for the opportunity to present these new ideas to the panel. And I do have several recommendations in my written testimony. I'll be happy to discuss those with you during the question and answer period. Very good. Period. Thank you very much. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Abdenabi. I'm president and CEO of Emergent Biosolutions. Uh, Emergent Biosolutions is a global specialty biopharmaceutical company, and we manufacture and distribute specialty products to governments and healthcare providers around the world to address medical needs and emerging health threats. We're best known to be the manufacturer of Biothrax, which is the only FDA licensed vaccine for the prevention of anthrax disease. We have been supplying that to the U.S. government for well over a decade, both for military application and for ci civilian protection. We also supplied to the U.S. government a series of therapeutics, a uh, therapeutic for anthrax, a therapeutic for botulism, uh, and a therapeutic to address adverse events associated with smallpox vaccine. We also uh, produce and deliver to the U.S. military a skin decontamination lotion for uh, chemical uh, uh, threats, and that has been provided to the U.S. government as well as to uh, friendly foreign militaries uh, across the globe. We uh, were born into the biodefense space, and we've grown up in that space. Um, so I appreciate the, uh, the panel's invitation to discuss our experience in the biodefense field and some of the successes and some of the challenges. We were organized in 1998, and really the focus was to acquire uh, the Michigan Biologics Products Institute vaccine facility. And our interest in that facility was that is where the vaccine for anthrax was being manufactured, and it was being manufactured for the U.S. Department of Defense. And at that time, the U.S. Department of Defense was the principal government agency focused on bioterror, both in terms of procurement and in terms of product development. Of course, all of that changed with the anthrax letter attacks in 2001. What we learned is uh, bioterror is not a military issue only, it affects civilians. And we also learned that we were ill-prepared to address a large-scale bioterrorist attack on civilians in this country. So despite this significant event, what we saw was a fairly slow legislative response. It wasn't until 2004 that we saw Project BioShield come around. 
And at that time, it was a game changer. That was a significant piece of legislation that really changed the, uh, the landscape uh, for, uh, for, bio, uh, for medical countermeasures addressing bio, uh, biodefense needs. There was um, uh, $5.6 billion that was set aside over a 10-year period uh, to, to support the procurement of medical countermeasures uh, for biodefense uh, uh, uses. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a longer-term plan that was being developed to address the biodefense programs going forward. At that time, this was about 2004 to 2006, uh, Emergent, having been in that space for quite a period of time as a private company, considered going public. And what we found was that there was tremendous skepticism in the public markets about the whole biodefense market in general. Is it a growth market? Is it a, is it a viable market? And we found the skepticism in questions from investment bankers, uh, from uh, institutional investors, from commercial banks. Anybody in the capital markets process had real questions about the viability or sustainability of this marketplace. It was brand new. Uh, very few. Uh, contracts had been issued. There were questions about, is the money real? Can it be accessed? How could it be accessed? Who's going to get it? Are these going to be profitable contracts? A whole host of questions. And those questions created doubts for large pharma and uh, dissuaded large pharma to really enter into this market in a significant way. For companies such as Emergent, the mid-cap, the small-cap companies, uh, capital markets were very, very difficult. And we wanted to access the capital markets uh, to grow our business. We had a new manufacturing facility that we wanted to build uh, to expand Biothrax production. We wanted to grow organically with some of the products we had in development, and we wanted to grow through M&A. And uh, capital markets was really the only way to go about doing that. Uh, other com and we were successful, by the way, in completing our public offering. Other companies were not so successful and therefore remained undercapitalized. And as a result of that, uh, being financially challenged, even though they may have had contracts uh, to, to produce or develop medical countermeasures with the U.S. government support, they were challenged in meeting some of the milestones and some of the goals and the expectations that were set upon them. And those failures created further doubt in the general population in terms of the capital markets about the viability and sustainability of the biodefense field in general. So that, that was the picture in 2006. Uh, over the last decade or so, uh, the U.S. government has really made significant strides in changing, that, in changing that paradigm. We have a much more robust and structured long-term plan and vision for what the biodefense space looks like. And you just think about some of the successes over the last uh, 10 years or so. In addition to BioShield, we've had PAPA. You're all familiar with that. Uh, and that uh, uh, established uh, BARDA, and BARDA has now set, uh, set upon establishing a very robust and thoughtful mechanism for developing products to the point where they can be procured and used in the, in the national stockpile to protect the nation. We also have the Office of the Assist Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, and that office has been designated as the leader in preventing, preparing for, and responding to public health emergencies and disasters. Following with that, we had the establishment of FEMSI. And FEMSI, as you know, is coordinating all the federal agencies uh, who are instrumental in evaluating and assessing and responding to these public health threats. So we have the FDA, the CDC, uh, NIH, uh, BARDA, DOD, uh, DHS, and others. It's very critical because now we have a coordinated approach. PAPA was just reauthorized. Uh, another $2.8 billion set aside through 2018, and an additional $415 million is being set aside for advanced research and development. Recently, HHS uh, just released the FEMSI strategic and uh, implementation plan, uh, which gives us real visibility as to their priorities, operational and strategic, and where their funding decisions might go. So as an industry player, I have a much better understanding of the infrastructure that's out there, the priorities that have been set aside, and some of the budget uh, allocations that the government is thinking about as they build this uh, biodefense infrastructure. So that's sort of on the uh, policy side. I'd like to talk about um, some of the medical countermeasures that have actually been successful in the, over the last uh, 10 years. BARDA, in partnership with several industry players, 
now has achieved success to the point where we have 12 products in the, in the national stockpile to protect the, the nation against these bio, uh, bioterror threats. Uh, ten of them are, are approved. Two of them are available under emergency use authorization. Some have been tested, reviewed, and approved using the animal rule, which as you know, the FDA set that up as an alternative way to get these medical countermeasures approved where clinical trials are just not practical. They just cannot be done. They've also partnered, Barter has also partnered with industry to now establish a uh, enormous pipeline of medical countermeasures that are moving through the system. 160 medical countermeasures are in the queue. 12 of them are scheduled for either licensure or procurement over the next uh, two to three years. So we have 12 approved or, or being procured, another 12 coming, so we're at 24. This is indeed pretty phenomenal progress when you think about the timeline that we're talking about. Nine years, and you think about the funding that's been allocated, $5.6 billion. Let me just give you a comparison. One of the most established, well-known, and prominent biotech companies in the world, it's a U.S. company, publicly traded, household name. In this same period, $33 billion spent on research and development compared to Bartis 5.6, $33 billion. The output, seven approved products compared to Bartis 12, or 10 if they're approved to under EUA, and 12 more coming in the next two years. This is a phenomenal success story. It really is. It's an unheralded heralded success story that we need to understand and appreciate. And it's a paradigm that is working because it's not the government doing it by itself. It's doing it in partnership with industry. Now, the problem as I see it is this paradigm hasn't answered all the questions that exist out there with respect to the viability and sustainability of the biodefense market and industry. So we are still not seeing the number of players, industry players, that we need in order to create the kind of countermeasures, the number of countermeasures that are required in order to address the whole portfolio of threats that have been identified. By way of example, closer to home for us, uh, Biothrax, as I mentioned, is the only FDA-licensed vaccine for the prevention of anthrax disease. Since 2004, we have been contracted to provide over 90 million doses of Biothrax to the U.S. government. In addition, in partnership with BARDA, we have made tremendous strides in improving the product profile uh, for the vaccine. For example, the route of administration has changed from subcutaneous to intramuscular. Why is that important? Because as people get vaccinated, the intramuscular route of administration, much fewer side effects than the local, uh, locally on the skin than the subcutaneous. We've also increased the shelf life to four years. Why is that important? Now you've got a product that is being stockpiled twice the, twice the longevity than it previously had. Tremendous savings and benefit to the U.S. government. We streamlined the immunization schedule. It used to be six doses as a priming series with boosters thereafter. Now we're at three doses as a priming series with boosters thereafter. Very effective for the customer. We're now in the process and we're expecting FDA approval in August of a post-exposure prophylaxis indication for Biothrax, which is why the government is stockpiling in the first place. It can be used in combination with antibiotics, that's been tested now, and, um, uh, and deployed in a post-exposure setting, so after an anthrax attack. So these are the kinds of improvements that are critically important and the need partners with the U.S. government in order to make this viable. Last improvement, manufacturing scale. We are um, now in the final stages of moving our manufacturing from seven to nine million doses per annum to 20 to 25 million doses, a potential tripling of the production output. Why is that important? The government has stated its requirements, 75 million doses of an anthrax vaccine in the strategic national stockpile. Current production levels are not going to get there. This will allow that to happen. I want to talk about away from you products. Got, I'm going to put the same time restraints on you, too. Okay. I'm that's sorry. Fine. No, that's fine. Uh, I want to just point out a couple of other infrastructure improvements that uh, yeah. BARDA has. Uh, there's the ADMs, the Centers for Innovation and Advanced Development and Manufacturing, three of them across the country. Uh, we operate one in Baltimore. Critically important, gives flexible manufacturing, and it allows for, in a pandemic situation, tens of millions of doses, 50 to be exact. There are three such sites across the country. The notion is we can protect the nation with these flexible manufacturing sites. They've also set up uh, a network of fill finish. They've also set up a network of clinical and non-clinical sites. All of these work together to improve the infrastructure needed in order to address these bioterrorist threats. So it's not just the product side, and it's not just the policy side. They're looking at infrastructure that can protect the nation. 
So this is a real healthy maturation of the government's thinking. But to be clear, we need incentives for industry to partner with the government. There needs to be a clear vision for industry to better understand how to plan for these kinds of, uh, th this kind of market. Right now we don't have clear visibility on the size of the market, the uh, direction of the market, and what is the opportunity? What is the business opportunity for industry to partner with government? And that's an area where I think we need improvement. And I do have recommendations on that that I'd be happy to share Good. with you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Sir. Okay, so my name is Mike Scherbenek. Thank you for bringing me here today. Uh, so I'm a managing director of the consulting firm Stokes Evans. So we are a, uh, more of a general consulting firm. We work across all industries. And uh, in 2011, 2012, we were uh, brought in by the Department of Health and Homeland Security to take a look at uh, dispensing and distribution of medical countermeasures, particularly how that might affect the ability to recover in a wide, widespread event. Looking at anthrax, the model, we had several scenarios we looked at. But what was a little different, I think, than what we did uh, is because we are supply chain experts, we're process experts, we tend to look at the outcome and work backwards. So we found when we were interviewing people, everybody had a lot of good solutions, a lot of great athletes, but nobody was looking, you know, where are we trying to win the Super Bowl? Are we trying to complete a marathon? What is it we're trying to do here? What are the outcome measures that are really most critical? So we settled in on we're trying to reduce, reduce mortality, reduce morbidity. If we're starting with that as our outcome, what is it that we really need to, to get good at? What are, the, uh, what are the process measures along the way that are really indicators of progress and which of these things have maybe become distractions where we're hanging a lot of uh, weight on things that we can't really link through to, to the end result. So I'm gonna focus on the process here today. We did quite a bit of work looking all the way from planning through uh, uh, detection characterization, through initial uh, distribution, initial uh, uh, excuse me, dispensing, then looking at ongoing dispensing treatment and, and finally recovery. But we're going to talk mostly about uh, the distribution and dispensing here today. So we, we talked to about uh, 45 people, most of whom are in this room today, uh, and uh, read over 200 uh, papers and uh, got, got uh, educated. Uh, everyone was very, very cooperative. Department of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, state, local, we found that everyone in the community was, was really willing to share their ideas, share their frustrations, share, share their, uh, their inputs. And so we were able to establish an end-to-end -end process model. Being consultants, it was very detailed looking at all the different players, what their roles were, where the different potential breakdowns, identified about 120 gaps that would really stop, stop the system dead in its tracks. And none of these were surprises to anybody. Okay, but you know nobody had really put it end to end bef before, and when you looked at it end to end, it, it wasn't wasn't pretty. And and we said, well, okay, you know we know that we can't change politics. We know we can't create a lot of money to go throw a lot of resources at this problem. But what are the things that can be done, given you know resource constraints and, and given the uh, you know, the authorities of the folks involved, so that we can do better with what we do have. And so in, in doing that, we really first looked at. It, it five real real problems and our sensitivity analysis exposed that ensuring all these affected per people start and complete you know their me medical regimen is the most critical step in all this chain so the biggest sensitivity is people either don't start their medication or they don't complete their medication looking at an anthrax event and that was the biggest single contributor to failure you know, in the entire in the entire process so while there's a lot of pressure to get things out there quickly get the di distribution you know, uh, apparatus moving. We found that you know, not taking into account the uh, uh, the behaviors of the of the people involved, the, the the population, understanding their fear, their distrust, their inconvenience, their ignorance, maybe of 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 uh, of, of, of what was going on. Uh, we really had to take take that all into account, and and we found, without getting into too many specifics here, that the failure rate was about three to five times what most people had estimated it would be in terms of uh, recovery. So. Well, they would say we would have 8 to 10 percent people getting sick. We found that using the, the, the numbers that were already published from different studies, putting those together, we found that you know, over 10 percent of folks would never seek medication. Of, of those folks who did, only about half would take it. This is based on different studies. And of those, you know, about a third to 40 percent would never complete the regimen. When you get that you know, in place, especially with anthrax, the 60-day treatment regimen, you, you probably want to try to either uh, not put yourself in a situation where you're dependent upon that type of behavior, uh, which is why vaccines and so many other pre-event you know, tactics are important.
but also recognize that uh, this is really a marketing issue and it's, a, and it's something that while it's very easy to allocate funds and resources to technological, technological issues that have the promise of, of, of having a big impact, uh, the softer issues uh, of, of marketing and of population dynamics and also the fact that those are always changing. You know, any, any you know, commercial company is constantly taking a look at their marketplace, understanding how the expectations of their, of their customers are changing, changing their channels, changing their mix of products you know, to, to, to make sure that they can you know, deliver what, what's really needed. Um, you know, to Secretary Shalala's, uh, I think, focus earlier, having dependence on a single, you know, uh, you know, distribution dispensing mode, particularly, you know, the, uh, the, the, the point dispensing pod model, limits options to leverage your existing infrastructure. It's, you know, why not build on relations that exist, on public trust that already exists, and try to offer al alternatives. Single threading is especially dangerous when facing a thinking adversary. Again, if we have one, one supply chain, it hasn't been tested, it's a single use, uh, it'd be very easy to disrupt. Uh, one shooting at a pod, now all pods are shut down. What, what, what do you do next? Also, uh, reduce preparedness funding, as we've heard, in public health staffing will amplify these issues. Leveraging ex you know, existing external resources and multi-use solutions become more critical in the future. Uh, efforts of HHS, DHS, all the state and local folks we've heard from, and, and you know, limited personnel, uh, you know, it, it's, it's commendable, but it's not sustainable. And also current planning does not address likely contingencies, including shelter in place options, uh, multi-drug resistant strains, and as we heard about, you know, at risk populations. You know, if uh, you know, fully one third of our population is under 15 or over 65, we have folks with chronic conditions, things, you know, groups that we really don't have adequate solutions for, you know, these all have to be addressed. So. That's great. No, nobody, there's no surprises there. I think everybody has heard these things before. But, you know, what, what we found, uh, and again, we went and played this back to folks uh, in government and, and in industry, and we involved quite a few folks in industry in our, in our discussions, make it clear that our goal is to get pills into every mouth in time and ensure everyone continues taking their pills until it's safe to stop treatment. Doesn't mean you have to complete your, your, your regimen, but if we had better diagnostics or other ways to, to you know, determine it's safe, you know, make sure that we put that in place. So we have to change <coughs> attitudes. Um, also, something that I think we've been dancing around a little bit here today is we're talking about political decision making you know, from the top down, I think is maybe where we are. But uh, I'm an engineer and I take a look, this is an architecture problem. We don't have a performance architecture. We don't have clear outcomes that we can build towards, okay? We don't know what game we're playing. It comes back to the athletes. We don't know if we're playing football or you know, we're playing tennis. What are we trying to do here? If it saves lives, if it's to you know, enable recovery, enable repopulation in these areas, enable us to get back to business as usual, you know, we've got to be clear about that and then understand how that performance architecture is supported by processes, supported by technology, supported then by funding and, and, and resources, and also, very importantly, shared services, things that we don't have to recreate all over the country, but things that can be, be leveraged. Uh, we also said engaging the public, private companies, community are critical. You know, uh, we've heard it again. You know, people are very <coughs> trusting of groups that they understand. You know, they're, whether they're faith-based or the community organizations. How do we leverage them? How do we create an easy on-ramp? We heard from Safeway and other companies, H1N1 response, how difficult it was for them in California alone to respond to 141 different requests for formatting of information when they were helping with dispensing. Such so as in one state. You know, they want to help, but when you talk to what it's like to look across the country, they just say it's, it's really insurmountable. Same thing in trying to just move things across borders when we're distributing things state by state, because that's how our policy says we're going to do it in, in many urban areas or in regional you know, areas. And when we talk about events that may cross borders, when people start to migrate after an event, you know, how do we start to make it easier to deal with this? Uh, again, alternatives to closed pod, like closed pods, you know, we're using these groups to create their own environment, own communities, preload that with information. Don't have to preload it with medical countermeasures. Preload the information so we can make better decisions. Uh, you know, med kits, other, other options to, again, maybe to preload some, some uh, countermeasures to allow certain groups to be more effective in their jobs. Uh, we have to also get better at monitoring. We talked about uh, behaviors and expectations of different groups. Understand that there's different segments that are going to behave not absolutely predictably, but we can do a much better job of anticipating where we're going to have issues and really a, reducing the burden on our public health uh, community to try to be all things to all people and let them focus where they're really 
uh, uh, most effective and, and, and looking at those folks on the fringes. And again, use existing channels wherever possible. You know, redundancy is going to probably create some inefficiencies, but again, this has to become trade-offs. In the architecture, you know, we have to look at that and say, a perfectly efficient system means we've got one, we have one unit for one unit of demand. We're never, you know, if we try to be in that kind of situation, you know, we're going to you know, set ourselves up for failures, especially when the consequence of incomplete distribution, incomplete dispensing, is measured in, in sick and, and dying people. So um, I'm going to cut, cut, kind of short the rest of this, but you know, just to kind of uh, tie it all together is, you know, we need to have somebody in charge of driving an architecture that's owned at the federal level that integrates all of these great capabilities, that has a single set of measures that we can all try to align to. People can make better decisions then within, with their own resources, within their own scope of, of control, but we can at least understand the impact of those and we can, you know, uh, uh, try to mitigate that or, if necessary, try to uh, try to impress upon those folks uh, the consequences of those decisions. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Sir. <coughs> um, my name is Jude Plessis. I'm the Acting Director of Continuity Policy and Planning in the Office of the Postmaster General of the United States Postal Service. I'd like to send my thanks to the panelists, ex officios, and the organizers of today's event for the chance to speak to you about the National Postal Model Program. National Postal Model Concept of Operations was created in response to initial request in December 2003 from the Executive Office of the President to the U.S. Postal Service to consider the delivery of oral antibiotics to residences of large metropolitan areas during catastrophic events, specifically the outdoor release of a biological agent such as B. anthracis. The Postmaster General, after consultation with letter carrier unions, made the decision this could be done voluntarily by our letter carriers if health, safety, and security were provided. In February of 2004, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, yourself, sir, and the Postmaster General signed a memorandum of agreement to establish policies and procedures for USPS distribution of oral antibiotics in response to biological terrorism incidents. Later in 2004, the City's Readiness Initiative, a federally funded program led by HHS, was launched to aid major U.S. cities in increasing their capacity to respond to a large-scale public health emergency. The primary objective of the CRI was to avert mass casualties by dispensing oral antibiotics to the identified population within 48 hours of notification, primarily through points of dispensing. The postal concept became one notional component of the CRI, offering an additional method of rapid drug distribution to the general population. In 2006 and 2007, three proof of concept drills were conducted in Seattle, Philadelphia, and Boston. Command, control, and communications were tested, as well as engagement with law enforcement escorts and public information dissemination. In October of 2008, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved a request from the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at ASPR, or ASPR at HHS for a unique emergency use authorization and allowed postal participants to receive small quantities of oral antibiotics for storage at their homes to be used by themselves and members of their households as directed by local and or state public health authority in the case of an activation of a city's postal plan and refining amendments occurred in 2009 and 2011. President Obama issued an executive order on December 30th, 2009, directing the establishment of a national U.S. Postal Service model for residential delivery of self-administrable medical countermeasures following a bio-attack. This executive order recognized the capacity of postal volunteers to deliver medical countermeasures quickly to every American household as a unique national resource. In the Postal Service, in conjunction with HHS, DHS, DOJ, and DOD, developed and submitted a model in response to EO 13527 to the National Security Council staff who approved that national postal model in 2010. <coughs> HHS and the Postal Service then formed a joint program enterprise to oversee the deployment of the national postal model through the establishment of venue specific postal plans. And in 2011, HHS awarded grants to five cities to fund these venue specific initiatives. Minneapolis, St. Paul, where operational capability was established in 2010. Louisville, Kentucky, uh, established in 2012. San Diego, California, operational capability established in 2012 as well. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Boston, Massachusetts, also in 2012. The objective of the National Postal Model is to use postal resources, personnel, equipment, and facilities to provide quick strike capability to deliver oral antibiotics 
from the strategic national stockpile to residential addresses within a single day as part of local and state mass dispensing plans. The model was designed to augment, not replace, the distribution of oral antibiotics to the public uh, via the aforementioned plots. Formal activation via the federal level through the Secretary of HHS to the Postmaster General based on the declaration of a public health emergency in response to a request from the governor of the affected state. Career letter carriers and management personnel who have been solicited, trained, and rostered pre-event as volunteers for this task will be notified and activated. Bottles of antibiotics and information sheet developed by the local or state public health authority will be delivered to all residences in a set geo area defined in terms of zip code. Every delivery point will receive a uniform amount of material. In the geographical area receiving oral antibiotics, all postal operations other than the delivery of the drugs will be suspended. Those residences would not receive mail that day. Normal postal operations would only resume when cleared to do so by local public health. Operational capability in the five cities was established once five main components of planning and preparation were complete. Volunteer outreach and recruitment, health safety support, security, participant training, and a comprehensive postal plan composed. Identification and solicitation of a pool of carriers, delivery unit management, district emergency management team members, and inspection service personnel was done in each city. Target number of volunteers was met and exceeded in all five. Recommendations for health safety were developed by NIOSH based on OSHA regulations. The process included medical screening for oral antibiotics, OSHA compliant respirator medical evaluation for N95 masks, fit testing and training for those masks, provisioning of household and individual antibiotic kits pre-event, mask provision to the uh, participants themselves pre-event, medkit refreshes, and medkit collection from opt-outs and retirees. Commitment officers provide carrier escort and perimeter security as outlined in each city's strategic security plan and acknowledged again during tactical security planning was accomplished. Security is, was done primarily by local and state law enforcement in collaboration with the United States Postal Inspection Service for postal trips to pick up antibiotics, drop them off at post offices, at the post offices themselves for perimeter security, and escorts for the carriers actually on the street making deliveries. Focus training was put in play related to participants' specific day of responsibilities, and comprehensive postal plans were created for all five cities that included activation, command and control, distribution, delivery unit operations, delivery operations, security, public information, demobilization, and recovery steps. Operational statistics from the program. Uh, for, Man for Minneapolis-St. Paul, 205,000 residential addresses would have been served under the plan. 266 active postal participants were in play in that city. Uh, we need 172 security uh, personnel in order to affect uh, the mission. In Louisville, 244,000 residential addresses would have been served. 291 active postal participants with 191 uh, security escort uh, requirements there. Is this all in a single day? All in a single day. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to summarize, but go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'll skip over the uh, some of the operational statistics for the other cities and just say, for exercises, a uh, key element of the program was design development of a series of exercises in each location. We held tabletop exercises, a full-scale exercise in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and functional exercise in all five cities. Um, program expenditures uh, were pretty slight. Uh, over the course of uh, time, Postal Service uh, was allocated approximately $6 million out of $10 million appropriation, uh, and uh, there's actually still money in the budget. Uh, current status, uh, all five med kits, or I'm sorry, all med kits in all five cities were set to expire March 31st in 2014. They required replacement. Uh, at that time, HHS per leadership advised Postal would no longer fund and conduct health safety support, including the prevent provision of med kits. Uh, instead, HHS recommended that the USPS work with local partners to obtain the resources it needed. For example, USPS, USPS participants would receive day of uh, event provisioning of oral amount of antibiotics through the SNS. Okay. Now, this concept was not only contrary to the original agreement, but also unsupported by solid evidence of efficacy under emergency conditions. So, the USPS deemed the proposal unacceptable with respect to protection of its employees and their household members. 
Uh, all USPS program participants have been placed in a suspension status. They are kept on the district's participant roster in the hope of future program revival. If the program is restarted, current participants will be contacted on resuming active participation. Due to Medicaid expiration and lack of funds to maintain operational capability, the postal plans in each of the five cities were placed in a suspension state as of October 2014. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know you had to uh, abbreviate the last part, but uh, uh, you haven't talked that fast in a long time, I'm go. sure. <laughs> but I, I, we very much appreciate that. It's a very important panel. I'm just going to defer to my colleagues on the advisory board first. I'm sure you have some questions. Uh, Dr. Parker? Yes, thank you. Uh, and ec excellent presentations. And let me let me try to pull a couple thoughts thoughts together here. Uh, first, actually, to borrow a phrase from Dr. Redliner at, at, at our lunch talk, random acts of preparedness. Um, what we're hearing here right now is we have the space of the need for innovation and the challenge status quo. We need the private sector involvement in this space in a big way, and we need the proper incentives for the private sector to be involved in this space. We also need innovative ways to actually, if we make something, to be able to get it to the population quickly and in time. And even though the postal system doesn't sound like innovation, it is in this regard. Um, we also have imposed on all of us and, and, and this whole system, whether you're in the program in government or whether you're in the private sector trying to serve the public good in, in this space. You have federal acquisition regulations that inhibit private sector collaboration and uh, actually are, have become very risk averse to the business model of medical countermeasures uh, development. And, um, and, and we need all this to be able to, to we, we need the innovation to drive change. We need that collaboration. Do we need, for any of the panelists, do we need a Manhattan style type project to really make us more effective? To drive in a bring the bring the innovation, bring the better participation of private sector, and to bring you know new thinking about how to get countermeasures to where they're needed, and to, and and also enable effective collaboration of the private sector as opposed to um, the competitive nature that the FAR contracting process actually en encourages, which is kind of counter to what we need if we're really going to tackle this problem. So any, I'll, I'll offer that to any of the panelists. Who wants to start responding to that? Who wants to start first? I'll, I'll respond to the vaccine start. part of it. I, you know, I think my colleague from Emergent actually did a wonderful job of talking about the pluses in the program that have been introduced over the years. There have been some really important advances. I still think that innovation in vaccines needs to take place and that it will benefit a lot of people. In cancer vaccines, we're looking at immunotherapies that use the technologies that I described. Why aren't we making that available in the biodefense space as well? So I, I think a Manhattan-style project is not a bad idea at all. These are innovations that really are on the cutting edge that can build on an existing infrastructure of production that can be put to work to solve this problem. So and yeah, we talked last week, we do not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Yeah. Please, let's go yeah. down the line if you care to comment, yeah. please. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That, that was going to be my first comment, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> but uh, because there have been so many successes, and I think tremendous progress has been made, particularly in the FEMC, and I think there's much, much better coordination uh, between the civilian agencies and the Department of Defense. Uh, the resources across the government are really phenomenal in terms of the science that's being done, uh, the development, and the funding that might be available. Where I see real deficiencies in getting industry more active is we need longer term uh, contracts. We need a much longer horizon in the, in the way in which we think about setting up the Special Reserve Fund. It was originally a 10-year uh, fund, as you might recall. Uh, the latest iteration is down to five years. The return on that investment has been phenomenal, uh, both in terms of protecting the nation and setting up a dynamic where we have a, uh, a growing now uh, biodefense market. We need to keep that momentum going. I'm not against the Manhattan product project. I don't know what the end result is des designed to achieve. So I think, you know, if we have a specific objective, maybe a Manhattan style project is the way to get there. 
but I think we need to continue to build on some of the successes that we've got. Mr. Chervenek. Sure, I have a, a couple things. I think, Jerry, you hit on it is there's technical innovation, and, and the Dublin Group has published some research showing that almost all value add in the last 20 years in technology innovation actually comes from the process around getting that innovation into the hands of people to use it. So the first innovation is very critical, but it's expanding you know, that so that you get the most bang for your buck. And so I think that whether it's Manhattan Project or I think it's just how do you work within the FAR, how do you innovate around it, how do you introduce programs to maybe ex expand the way that BART operates to get more throughput, but then also make certain that it's getting utilized, make certain that you're getting the most leverage out of every, every, every technical innovation and, and roll that out. And also put in perspective that you know, when we look at the trade space, in, in, in medical countermeasures. You've got leadership issues, you've got technologies that include information technologies, drugs, diagnostics, you've got your logistics, and then you've got your people aspect, your behavior. And you know, if we focus only in the technology aspect without understanding how it gets through that, how it makes, gives better tools to the, to the leadership to make better decisions, gives better, uh, you know, reduces the risk in the logistics, and also uh, you know, gives you better results in your population, we've got to kind of look at it all together. I think that you know sometimes we tend to look at the technology as being the only answer, but we really have to look across that entire the entire trade space. I appreciate that, Jude. Unless the post office has a point of view on this, I'm going to let you pass and respond. <laughs> question here. Go ahead, Tevi. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Jude, uh, about the, uh, the the post program, and you, you you had to rush through it at the end for understandable reasons. Uh, but you were talking about the security concerns and the fact that the program is under suspension. When I was at, at HHS, uh, there's talk that the postal union had objected to the idea of the mail carriers as distributors or dispensers because of the um, uh, the concern that they would they wanted a public safety officer assigned to each postal carrier, which struck me as an unrealistic request given t uh, times of national emergency so how do you think the security concerns can be handled and do you think there is a practical way of going forward so that this program can get out of suspension well uh, we've been dealing with this security question from day one when this first came up and the, the need for both health safety support in terms of pre-event med kit provisioning and also the need for law enforcement escorts on the street uh, th those were original requirements and we went into each one of these five cities. In fact, as part of the grant process, those cities had to come forward with the means to meet that security commitment. And, and they did so. That's how they ended up actually receiving those grants and how we were able to move forward in those five cities. Uh, it is a doable uh, proposition. Uh, when you look at the uh, number of law enforcement officers within a particular city and the number of carriers that we actually need on the street to effect delivery in the entirety of, uh, of a city, uh, even talking in some of these, uh, in some of our uh, cities that we went to, Philadelphia, we covered the entire, uh, the entire city, uh, and we worked with them ahead of time to determine uh, who can you put in place as far as security <coughs> is concerned. So, in order for us to have a plan uh, in the first place, in order to say that we had operational capability in those cities, we already had to have established that commitment with law enforcement. So that was met for those. And we see the same thing going forward if we were to if we were to re-engage on this, which honestly would take a certain amount of political push at this point. Uh, Postal went into this uh, because we were asked to come into it to provide this last mile uh, service, which we do uh, uh, really for, for uh, the entirety of the country, whether it be rural or urban. So uh, we look at it as, uh, as this is just a requirement that is that needs to be met in order to, for the safety and security of the people around the street. We also think it's just a good idea. If you're going to have, a t it's better to have a team concept. Someone out who's out there who's, who's paying attention to the conditions on the ground and someone else who's paying attention in, in terms of the delivery function itself. Where am I going? Where do I have to go to next? How much am I moving? Where would this political push to re-engage have to come from and how heavy of a push would it have to be? I, at this point in time, I, I wouldn't want to put I think one of the things Tibby was referring to, and I, it's one thing to distribute in times of, uh, in, in normal times, but if there's a crisis in a community, you're going to use most of your law enforcement for more traditional responsibilities. So it's one thing, again, I'm fairly certain that you'd be comfortable delivering oral contraceptive if there was no, no, 
no problem. But if in the middle of a crisis, I'm not sure you're going to be able to get the law enforcement personnel to provide the security. I think, Debbie, that's where you're, you were alluding to there at, the, at right. that moment. It's something we have to address because we have, there is no good answer. I mean, the, the bottom line is at the time of crisis, there are going to be traditional responsibilities with law enforcement and helping you deliver a much needed uh, therapeutic or vaccine to that population may not be their highest priority. Can I follow up on that? Yeah, Ken, just, please. Just, um, you, you mentioned that the decision was made to um, that it would only be a voluntary assignment, that the postal carriers could opt out. And it seems like the, one of the most appealing aspects of this idea is that, you know, you already have for every house and every company in the country a human being assigned to go deliver there. And so ideally you say, okay, that person's already going to be going there. That person can then take the um, countermeasures to that house or to that company in a time of need. If people can opt out, if postal carriers can opt out, then that seems like it defeats part of the purpose there. My question to you is why was it made voluntary? Was it but the security concern? We, we, we operate in a unionized department. And so uh, it's not part of the uh, collective bargaining agreement to mm -hmm. have a carrier on the street in that kind of situation where you've got a public health emergency declared, people are being asked to shelter in place, or they're being asked to shelter in place for a particular amount of time and then go uh, to a local point of dispensing. And so being outside of those collective bargaining agreements, the decision was made can we approach the union, speak with them, talk with them about recruiting uh, individuals to join the program and becoming participants of the program? Well, in those cities where you actually try to roll it out, how complicating has it been that people have been able to opt out? Has uh, that been a problem? We, well, we went in, we recruited. We always recruited to the, whatever we could, uh, whatever the maximum. Uh, we weren't shooting for a particular target in terms of we have X number of postal on routes that we need to meet. So we're taking on all participants in that regard. And uh, we were able to, uh, through the recruitment process, pull in enough people to be able to cover, to provide for coverage based on the coverage area, which the local public health or state public health in the case of uh, Minneapolis and Paul had decided. Yeah. Does, does, the, does the post person go to the door uh, they would be going to mail receptacles because that's the way that our right. routing is based. I think that what this tells us is as part of an overall strategy, um, I personally prefer the drug distribution system in the United States because I think it is secure and, it's, um, and it has um, uh, an IT system that accompanies it so that you can actually track it. Uh, better than, but as part of an overall strategy, I think you use everything you can. You can use the social security offices. For heaven's sake, they probably have more people that show up there. <laughs> well, the IRS knows where to find it too. Um, uh, Jim, question for Dr. <coughs> DeGroot. You're a highly educated, um, deeply experienced, award-winning physician and scientist. You've proposed repeatedly. Um, uh, a paradigm shift in the way we develop vaccines, and yet you've said you've re got no traction. No one's no one's responding to you positively. So I'm trying to understand why that is, because it, it seems like it's a fairly straightforward scientific question. And I'm she also wants going to do it without uh, going through the long FDA process, though. She wants the FDA process, and we've got to talk about safety. You want the FDA process cut. I think that the FDA process can be revised when well, it comes it has to been revised. I mean, you can do a fast even track further, FDA process. even further. Even further. So, drugs. so, actually, that's a great example. So, there are ways to look into the process the way it's right. being done now. Can we identify delivery vehicles that can be approved, similar to influenza vaccines for today? We use the same kind of Trojan horse influenza virus and just slot in a new gene for the, the particular virus that's the flavor of the moment. We can certainly do that for bioterror. So I think that we're not just, we're one of many companies proposing that, but we do have to rethink the way that we actually approve these vaccines. And with all due respect to the animal rule, for in many instances, the type of vaccines that we're producing cannot be tested in animals because human responses are different. There are new models that are available that should be evaluated 
as means of testing vaccines before moving them into So is the FDA process the only impediment to, to your proposal? I think that the, another significant impediment is the way that this kind of work is funded. So for example, we, we work through the SBIR system, which has been cut dramatically in the last uh, few years for many reasons, as people are well aware of. And we had grants that had extremely good scores that were not funded, even though we, and for, for pathogens that are considered bioterror threats to Lorenia, for example. And those we could not get funded because of the sit situation that's in place. That should be a priority. BARDA, which does a great job, cannot reach across the invisible line that separates it from the NIH to grasp those interesting projects that should be developed further because they're considered R&D. Maybe where we should set the cutoff for BARDA is proof of principle in animal models, not a phase one trial. So reset the TLR, the, the technical level of readiness, so that we can actually reach into NIH and pull out prom promising projects that are actually innovative, but not yet ready for the clinical trial, because the companies like mine don't have the funding to get them to the clinical trial. Thank you. Over the panel, Billy, do you have anything? We're here. All right. Let me, let me, let me ask. That's okay. That's a relatively easy thing to do, but it, I mean, to, it's easier than it should be. But or sound, but that that's something that can be part of the record. That could be done. Yeah, yeah we've can be done to capture. Yeah, that. we've 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 heard that refrain many many times. I want to ask this question about this whole flexible manufacturing. Procedure. I was thinking about the two of your, your testimony about vaccine on demand, and then uh, you got to do some clinical trials. You know, you don't have the manufacturing capability. If you can expedite the clinical trials, is it conceivable that that is a place or a venue or two that the government should be the, should primarily fund? I mean, to build a flexible manufacturing facility or venue uh, that uh, the small companies could use, but the large ones could use in the event you need massive uh, production in response to a crisis. I mean, I'm just very interested yeah. in that whole concept of flexible manufacturing, not only available to the individual company, but to the broader uh, biodefense community, particularly the, the entrepreneurs, the ones that are coming up. I and mean, frankly, let's face it, most of the innovation comes from the small companies, not from the large ones. They're flexible, they're more, right? That's just the way it works in this country. But you're not going to manufacture. So if we got to move this along quickly, do we need flexible manufacturing facilities to take advantage of vaccine on demand or whatever else is out there? It, it's a great point, and that is the concept, and it's not funded solely by the government. Uh, this is a partnership where the uh, private industry is funding a part of it, and government is funding a part of it, and it is designed specifically, as you state, uh, surge capacity, also for advanced development of products that are in the clinic so we can scale them up and make them more readily available. So that's the paradigm. You've described it beautifully. Uh, there are three of them that exist today. Could it be expanded to others across the country? Sure. Uh, part of the problem that my colleague is experiencing is the capital formation problem. She doesn't have the money, and investors are looking at that saying it's too high risk. How do we know that the government is really ever going to get behind that? So part of the paradigm that we need to think about is how do we enable companies like hers to get funded early on with exciting innovative technologies, maybe in partnership with NIH, is there a way that we can think about that kind of funding being available so these kinds of technologies can uh, have a more uh, appropriate uh, fair hearing? And those are the types of things that I would um, respectfully submit are should be priorities for the panel because if you want industry involvement, and I agree with your point about innovation being an industry, we need to figure out ways for this market to be um, to grow, to be sustained, and to be viewed across large and small companies as a very attractive opportunity for business growth. I would just, just one of those fundamental questions of what should government be doing, and when does it profit share? And we're talking about vaccines in which the margins are smaller than other kinds of drugs, so it's a it's a complicated question. Well, this applies broadly beyond biodefense, so I think vaccines are a good investment for many reasons. And I would just add to the wonderful comments from my colleague that what we also need is this innovative step. So that's where we've really been having trouble getting our ideas to move forward. We also have been able to look at existing vaccines and say, wait a minute, we don't think this is a good idea. There should a be a place for us to say that where it's going to be heard. And really, there's no one that I can talk to. My experience during H1N1 and during H7N9 
is that the CDC doesn't want to hear that. People do not want to hear Absolutely. that the vaccines that they're going to make, the H7N9 vaccine that we have currently de today, is the least effective vaccine that's ever been made. We, t we told you that in 2013 when the virus was published. When the virus was what? When the sequence was published. We published a paper saying the, the, the vaccine was a stealth virus, that new vaccines would be ineffective. Less than 10 months later, we were proven right. Any further questions? I mean, clearly, I think you've talked about an inertia there's in government. We've been doing things the same way for a long, long time. And if you had uh, intel that was credible related to a particular pathogen, perhaps something we didn't have anything on the shelf to deal with, what's the, what's the quickest way uh, to design the components, test it quickly, and get it out? And a three- to five-year process is not going to work for that. I'd be personally, I think the panel would be very interested if you had some specific recommendations with regard to companies like yours dealing with NIH and CDC, uh, we'd love to see them. Okay. Or, or, and, the, or, and the government generally, because I think uh, your companies, uh, your type of companies would be the epicenter of innovation in this space. Uh, we got the great pharma companies, they do things your way. You got a new, uh, a different approach, and I think this panel needs to consider both. I'm sympathetic, but I also want you to address the safety issues. Yeah. Because the public uh, will uh, not tolerate, particularly um, widespread vaccines, something that hasn't been appropriately tested. I think that that's going to be addressed. Well, I'm not. I just want to make sure the secretary. I'm not looking to shortcut safety measures, but I no. do think the whole process could be truncated. It is too, still too, too, too long. I think that actually, when we're doing this kind of work with these computational tools, that we're actually addressing safety. And there are things that we are learning about vaccines with these innovative tools that can improve the safety of existing vaccines. So I think that we need to hold the doors open to innovation while, as I agree with the Secretary, that safety will remain a very important issue. It's still the number one priority. Yes. We just think we could condense Absolutely. it a little bit. We thank you very much. Folks, we are going to take a five-minute break, not a ten-minute break. We'll have the fourth panel up here by 3 o'clock. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our fourth panel involves uh, the issues of recovery and mitigation. And uh, Dr. Kavita Berger, scientist, is it Gryphon Scientific? Did I pronounce that correctly? Griffin. Griffin Scientific. Very good. Well, I'm learning. Uh, Michael Hopmeyer, president of Unconventional Concepts, Inc. Sir. And uh, Dr. Ken Stanley, consultant, McKinsey and Company, former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counterproliferation, Department of State, and former Director for Biodefense Policy, Homeland Security Council under President Bush. Welcome. We're a little bit behind schedule, but we're not going to uh, truncate your remarks. So, uh, Doctor, you may go first. Could you define counterproliferation for me? Sure. So, I think nonproliferation would be uh, the way in which we prevent. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think the easiest way to say uh, to define counterproliferation would be to prevent the uh, transit of illicit materials from one actor to another. Oh, okay. So, uh, first, thanks very much for the opportunity. Don't worry about nuclear arms in Iran's hands. Thanks very much for the opportunity to present here. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, first, uh, what I'd like to do is give a couple of framing remarks, both on con uh, on context and then how response and recovery, I think, are interrelated in a bio event. So first, as everyone here is aware, outbreaks, when they occur, whether they're naturally occurring or uh, come from an intentional release, can cause a massive loss of life. And even when that loss of life is limited, of course, diseases could affect a relatively small number of people, but cause significant economic loss and social disruption. And as we're all aware, events, even on the other side of the globe, can impact the homeland. I'll be speaking about response and recovery, particularly in the context today of what we've seen uh, with recent events, whether that's H1N1, MERS, or more recently, Ebola. But I'd also emphasize, when thinking about response and recovery, that the events we've witnessed to date uh, do not really represent what the worst case looks like. So if some of these pathogens had been more easily transmissible, or if they had uh, been more pathogenic, our response and our recovery would have been much more complex and substantial. Uh, now, a quick few words about the connection, in my mind, between response during a bio event and recovery during a bio event. So, first, in the context of, a, of an infectious disease biological event, 
where illnesses may spread from community to community. Uh, recovery will often occur in some communities while simultaneously response is occurring in others. And so I think it can be helpful to actually think about both response and recovery uh, in the same breath. Uh, <coughs> when I think about recovery, I think of four particular areas. First, rebuilding capacity in the system to the extent that it's been degraded. Second, establishing adaptive behaviors for a new normal. Third, restoring public confidence. And, and fourth, reviewing and updating the response plans and activities that you've put in place. So by, saying, by way of saying all that, I think recovery in many ways is dependent upon the response that is undertaken. And the intensity of the rebuilding effort and the efforts to restore public confidence in many ways depend on the success of your initial response. So in my remarks, I want to underscore the importance of response, which will dictate some of the circumstances of recovery. I'll highlight what I've seen in terms of best practices uh, in, in really in three areas. First, effective decision making and accountability. Second, capabilities required during a response and a recovery. And then third, activities during a recovery. So first, when thinking about effective decision making during a response and a recovery, two best practices that I'd like to highlight for you are first, a clear articulation of accountabilities in terms of roles and responsibilities during the response and recovery phase of a bio event. And second, exercises to practice and refine decision making procedures and execution. So when we think about accountability, uh, I think we've made great strides in, in past years. The original Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act and its reauthorization in 2013 provided us with enhanced structures for decision making and response. But from what I've seen in my government service and sense, best practices would indicate that we could actually further articulate the lead individuals and agencies for health response during both domestic and international health crises. When we think about things on the international stage, we often think about specific roles and responsibilities in the sphere of HHS and CDC. Uh, when we think about domestic uh, responsibilities, we would also think about the way in which DHS would play a much larger role. In addition to increased accountability, uh, I think there's an opportunity to improve decision-making processes during these events. So I think the decision-making processes and the timing of decisions during an event is very different than business as usual decisions. So we often in business as usual times look for an elegant solution that addresses all concerns. And I think during an emergency, you're much better off actually taking iterative decisions that give you more information over time so that you come to a better outcome uh, eventually. And I think there's a real opportunity based on best practices um, to actually conduct additional drills and uh, preparedness activities, particularly with the leadership that will be involved in early decisions for both response and recovery in order to refine our ability to make those decisions. Because I think just from, a, um, from sort of an organic perspective, um, decision making like this doesn't come naturally to most, to most institutions. And the more we can do to put that type of decision making at the fore in these institutions, I think the more powerfully we can respond and recover from events. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about was the capability to mount an effective response and recovery. So uh, there are, I think, two emerging best practices to highlight here. First a full-time capability to respond to and recover from bio events. And second, a strengthening of reserve capacities for surges in response and recovery. So when I think about response, um, I think about really three primary objectives. You're trying to treat people to provide appropriate treatment to patients who are suffering from disease while minimizing the impact on the system overall. Second, you're investigating, you're using epidemiological and lab techniques to characterize the event and to track its spread. And third, you're trying to contain. So you're trying to limit the transmission based on your understanding of disease or the event. There are four pertinent observations that, that I'll make given the objectives uh, that I've just outlined. So first, we've seen that we sometimes have difficulty deploying human resources to the field quickly. So uh, many of you are probably aware of the recent perspectives piece by Bill Gates in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, he highlights the challenges during the Ebola response, particularly with our ability to quickly recruit and deploy human resources to the field. The networks of part-time responders that we've developed uh, with uh, 
with a great deal of care, I think, were overwhelmed in some of our uh, most recent crises. Second, second observation here would be that the knowledge that you need, the types of expertise you need, when you have, with increased scale of response, are actually increased. So with increased SIG scale comes increased complexity and comes increased need for additional types of capabilities when you have a response like this. The third uh, observation I'd make is one that I made at the outset as well. So we have recent examples of bio events that we've dealt with both domestically and internationally. Uh, but we should keep in mind that what we may face in the future could be much more severe and therefore much more complex. The fourth uh, observation I would make is that there's actually been an increase in the number of responses related to health over time and that that scale of those responses has increased. So I'll go back to the two best practices then. I think we already, um, we could consider uh, additional full-time capabilities to be on call for response during a medical event. And that would include people like planners, logisticians, communications experts, and additionally medical responders. I think we've also made great strides in creating uh, reserve capabilities. We could, when thinking about a best practice, further strengthen our reserve medical capabilities, seeking out on-call responders who can be trained on an intermittent basis, whose <coughs> skills are aligned with those necessary uh, for the events that we would anticipate and who are compensated in a way that makes their service possible on very short notice for some extended period of time. The third area I'll speak about is most, is most explicitly recovery. So as I mentioned at the top, recovery has multiple components. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to expedite. Yep, you got it. Still more witnesses. Most of the, one of the recovery capabilities is reviewing and updating plans and activities. <coughs> so I'll confine my suggestion here to considering uh, recovery in the context of replanning. So at the acute stage of any crisis, you have an opportunity to actually take concrete steps <coughs> to actually increase your level of preparedness. And I would just highlight that you can focus on planning, equipping, training and then exercising in a much more concrete way as a best practice at the conclusion of some of these events. So I know that our time is short, so I'll, uh, I'll thank you very much for your time. And any any <laughs> final conclusions in particular in the area of recovery? I don't want to cut you short. Just a couple of principles you care to share with us? Um, no, I'll leave it there. All right, very good. Thanks. Please. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I am going to focus on some of my remarks on uh, science and technology advances that can enhance uh, threat awareness and detection of biological events because both are very central to risk mitigation or threat mitigation and recovery. Um, and both, a key aspect of both uh, is that advanced planning to minimize potential vulnerabilities in that prevention, detection, response and recovery pathway and maximize the availability and accessibility of key resp uh, response resources such as medical countermeasures, decontamination technologies, and detec te detection technologies is, uh, is extremely important. And so as part of my remarks, I will highlight some of the vulnerabilities, but uh, I want to have you think more about the whole system from prevention to response and mitigation to recovery. Um, by way, just of background, um, for the past five or six years, I've been working very closely with the FBI, specifically uh, Special Agent Ed Yu, um, who you had as a panelist last time. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, we uh, produced a, a product on uh, national and transnational security implications of big data in the life sciences. And uh, that opened the doors to a lot of very interesting um, capabilities and problems that arise from biology relating, relying very heavily on digital technologies and how that not only uh, might create some risk but also help uh, detect the risk and help prevent the risk. Um, in addition to that, uh, some of the work that I've done uh, in the Middle East has been on uh, risk mitigation and, and risk identification and so um, it's from that perspective that I speak to you today. So the context in which all of this is occurring, right? You, you know very well about the public health emergency medical countermeasure enterprise, the, tr the strategic national stockpile, the issuance of several national strategies from countering biological threats to biosurveillance, presidential directives on public health, the biological select agents and toxins regulations. Now we've got efforts going on for bio-risk management 
which is laboratory safety and security, both in the United States and, and abroad. And the uh, Global Health Security Agenda was launched last year, which builds on the 2005 International Health Regulations and the um, U.S. government policy on biosurveillance. This is the system in which we're working when it comes to prevention and response. And new advances in science and technology are providing some really new interesting opportunities to both detect um, incidents, uh, biological incidents early, mitigate risks before they transform into threats and respond to incidents through um, a variety of different means, but three of which I'm actually going to speak to you today. Uh, about today, which is big data analytics, cloud-based information sharing, and 3D printing. Um, these technologies offer significant capabilities to threat awareness, whether the threat is an actor who has expressed interest in carrying out a terrorist act, uh, whether or not they're using a biological agent, or the threat is a natural outbreak or an accidental release um, of a harmful pathogen. And they also provide some insight into detection and or characterization of infectious disease threats. Um, that would inis initiate response activities, as well as uh, in developing uh, modeling, development and modeling of medical countermeasures and decontamination strategies to facilitate response and recovery. So big data analytics, what is it? Um, it describes the integration and analysis of data that are generated and collected from a number of distinct sources and from more than one data set at a very rapid speed and at rapid times, at uh, different times. It is large in volume, but not necessarily individual pieces uh, being large, and has a high degree of uncertainty. The data can be deliberately deposited into databases, such as personal genome databases and healthcare information, or passively included into databases, such as internet search terms and purchasing preferences. Data can be born digital, such as social media comments or uh, GIS data or converted from observation to digital information such as uh, data published in scientific literature. Data can be analyzed using a, a number of different technologies, all of which the U.S. government and others are investing in. Uh, these things are, are data mining, data fusion, natural language processing, speech image rec recognition, <laughs> machine learning, social media analysis, and, uh, and mathematical statistical analysis. So I just want to provide examples of, uh, two examples of uh, how big data has actually uh, played a role already in the prevention and uh, detection of um, sort of the biological threat. So one example is the Global Terrorism Database, which uses media and social media analysis to provide a picture of which actors pose a threat and which sort of individuals and groups have uh, expressed interest in using biological agents as um, as a means to cause harm. And with this knowledge, security officials can be better equipped to determine whether certain non-state actors are acquiring the expertise and materials needed to acquire, develop, or carry out an attack with a biological agent, or to employ mitigation strategies that minimize the likelihood that an attack will be successful. Another example is Health Map, uh, which integrates data from Google Maps human and animal sur health surveillance systems, news outlets, clinical databases to detect potentially catastrophic outbreaks. In addition, HealthMap claims to be able to geolocate an index case for an outbreak, which is really important when trying to, to um, do response activities. And so with these early warnings, health officials, scientists, security officials can employ measures to both uh, control the current outbreak and prevent further uh, infection or disruption. This is not the only program that does this. There are several different networks that, that try and build on some of these large data sets and, and uh, different um, sources of data. Examples include the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, the Global Outbreak Alerts and Response Network, which is uh, all part of WHO, Google Flu Trends, uh, Google Dengue Trends, and uh, models of uh, infectious disease <coughs> agent studies, which is something NIH supports. All of this, all, all this to say that forecasting and prediction of an outbreak is really catching on. And I, I actually saw a paper about two days ago that said uh, that China um, wants to, or China has described um, the benefits of using data analytics for their national disease surveillance capacity. So this is not just a U.S. or a, or a WHO thing. 
Um, another sort of sub-example of this is that uh, in 2013, the CDC launched a quote-unquote predict the influenza ch season challenge, which was designed to encourage innovation in influenza modeling and prediction, uh, and they used as a data set the 2013-2014 flu season. So looking to the future, where can these technologies actually add to our capabilities to detect the threat early and to be able to mitigate it or uh, respond to it. Several examples include um, forensic analysis and attribution, identifying more effective and broadly acting medical countermeasures, determining whether function of biological components can be determined through sequence analysis, evaluating the potential damage of an actual biological uh, incident, identifying possible discrepancies in confidence building measures of the Biological Weapons Convention, predicting malicious behavior from a broad set of information, or evaluating the lessons learned from natural or man-made event. Um, but despite these potential benefits, big data analytics is actually vulnerable because it depends on uh, computer systems and databases, so very, uh, very vulnerable to hacking and exploitation. Um, over the last decade or so, uh, it's no, no um, surprise to anyone that computer systems and databases have become prime targets for hacking by amateurs, nation states, and non-state actors. Of course, the U.S. is concerned about protecting of critical infrastructure through cyber attack. That's a conversation we've had for many years. Um, people's personal, uh, the public is, is concerned about protection of their personal information and privacy because of uh, hacking of healthcare networks and being able to identify people. And I just sort of want to point out that in the last, uh, I think, six to nine months, three uh, individual hack hacking events of um, health system or health information has occurred. In 2014, the hospital community health system um, was hacked and 4.5 million records were released uh, in 2015, earlier this year, Anthem which you are all familiar with, 79 million records were released and in around the same time Primera uh, was also hacked and that was 11 million records but what was different about this was that it included medical, rock, medical records. Um, so this is a, is a pretty big problem and combine that with you know having uh, patient genomic information part of electronic medical records, the, the situation actually some can get beyond the individual the individual problem. Um, several technologies do exist to prevent unauthorized uh, users from gaining access to the computer systems, yet not non-state actors in state uh, states are still conducting cyber attacks to disrupt computer systems, steal information, and spying. Um, as you all know, last year PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology, issued recommendations on the technology needs to reduce vulnerabilities and enhance privacy. Um, and, of course, we've had for many years huge investments in cybersecurity, workforce, prevention capabilities, and response, yet the U.S. is not well structured to address cyber threats that affect science and technology sectors where the insult is in the cyber realm and the output is in the release of biological agents from a laboratory, delay of infectious disease detection, or theft of proprietary information about medical countermeasures in which the U.S. is investing. I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to... We're going to give your full testimony to be part of the record. If you could potentially sure. draw some conclusions for our benefit, sure. that'll give us a chance to get back and do it. We're really interested in the Q and A. Sure. Um, I, in addition to, I, I won't go into the three D printing or the the, um, but I do want to sort of quickly talk about uh, cloud based sharing. In two thousand eleven, um, we were able to, as a global scientific community, identify a 2011 E. coli outbreak that occurred in Germany and France as um, one that was natural and not man-made just by uh, within 12 hours by sequences being posted on the cloud and scientists being able to download that and actually sequence it and, and do some analysis on it. And it's, it's through um, the cloud sharing and the cloud-based analytics that we were able to do that. So all of these are capabilities, yet we do come with some vulnerability. And I guess the conclusion that I would leave you with is that we really need to think more strategically about the um, cross-domain threats and the multidisciplinary threats and capabilities that they offer. Um, and that we are not really well set up to be able to look at the risk and the benefit and compare the risk and the benefit of something that does not involve 15 pathogens and seven experiments. 
Right, so we're going to follow up on some of that, uh, the response to that cloud-based information. It's an interesting focal point when we get back to you. Sir. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to address the panel this afternoon. In the interest of time, I'll limit my remarks to just two key points. First, very, we're all very intrigued what unconventional concepts mm -hmm. have to do with uh, recovery mitigation, so we're all ears. Oh, well, I'll certainly do my best to keep you entertained. Um, <laughs> first, a constant refrain through biodefense, or in fact, any <laughs> unconventional threat or incident, if you will, are the requirements, resources, training skills, capabilities that are needed to respond perfectly justifiable and reasonable, but I think that we miss a key question in this, which is more importantly, what is the best that we can do with what we already have? Almost without exception, any event, any occurrence that we have, we have a long list of required materials, oftentimes funding that's needed to prepare for that incident, whether it is in response, mitigation, or any aspect. However, almost equally without exception, we never have any of those materials. We very, very seldom meet all of the requirements we have, in fact, arguably never, and quite frequently we don't even meet many of those requirements. But the question is very seldom asked, and more importantly, do we create plans and prepare for how to optimize the use of the resources and capabilities that we actually do have. That tends to lack in preparedness and planning and the entire spectrum of response to an incident. For example, very few people are aware that within the realm of pharmaceuticals for use in veterinary medicine, those drugs are in fact almost identical to those used for human beings. In many cases, they're actually manufactured in the same plants where the drugs are manufactured for human beings. The primary difference being simply that they're packaged differently. The dosage that I would use for a five or 10 pound cat or a five or 600 pound bull is generally different than I would use for a human being, but the drugs in and of themselves are the same. Yet I at least have never seen a plan that actually looks at reaching out to leverage the pharmaceutical supplies mm. for the agricultural arena to be able to make up deficiencies or shortcomings that we would have in a human event. So the first point I would leave you with is that while I do not advocate replacing the list of requirements that we need, frankly, that provides money and resources, jobs, and, and other things, we need to also add to these key questions and this key base how to optimize the use of the resources that we have. Given we have nothing more, what's the best we can do? The second issue, which I think is equally important, is that there tends to be, again, not unjustifiably so, a focus on the professional responder or professional response community, if you will. Again, incredibly important. But to put things in context, depending on how you actually look at the numbers, there is somewhere between one and a half to two million, maybe as many as two and a half million professional responders throughout the United States, fire, police, emergency medical, and other related resources. Under the very best of circumstances, that's one responder per 100 to 150 citizens. What we tend to lack is a focus on how do we actually empower the people to care for themselves. And it goes well beyond simply public service announcements. An excellent example in my mind is the AED or automatic external defibrillator. Only 15 years ago, if somebody had a, a cardiac event and they needed to be defibrillated, it required a trained nurse or cardiologist and the resources of a full ICU or an emergency room to provide the care. As a direct result of technology and research, we lowered that barrier to entry where Quite frankly, if you're bright enough to understand any of about 30 different languages and can operate a fire extinguisher, you can defibrillate somebody. Concomitant with that is the concept of convergent response. That first started in California and, as many things have done, is basically based on the fact that the true first responder is very seldom the trained professional. In the case of this room today, if any of us had a heart attack or started to choke, the first person to provide care and assistance would not be an EMT or a police officer. It would more than likely be the person sitting next to that person who's in distress. We've lost sight of the fact that whether we like it or not, the population itself will care for itself. It may not do a particularly good job, but I think that that is a failing on the part of policymakers for not planning for that predictably and realistically. And I think a significant 
significant shortcoming there is that we continue to try and focus, again, reasonably on the professional responder, but we lose sight of the opportunity to truly empower the public. And that can be done through two basic means. One, training, educating, and improving the capabilities of the public organically to care for and provide its own support. But two, using the benefits and powers of science and technology to lower the barrier of entry to be able to provide care. It does not require a physician, for example, to diagnose a case of Ebola in West Africa. When you come in, you're bleeding, you're coughing, you're running a fever. At that point, presumably, you have a presumptive diagnosis. There, how can I train the people to be able to provide at least a greater level of care, somewhat analogous to what we do in the firefighting community? When we have large wildfires that are out of control, we don't go and train more firefighters. We typically get a random unit from the military. We've already prepared training and equipment so that in a matter of three to five hours, we can train personnel, one, not to kill themselves or others around them, but two, be able to provide a level of support and assistance to augment the professionals. We haven't taken that to the level of supporting the public to be able to provide care and support not only to the professional response community, but themselves in a biodefense arena. With that, gentlemen and ma'am, I'm done. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Start, uh, Dr. Alexander. Thank you very much. Uh, you answered some of my uh, initial questions uh, how to uh, optimize uh, the available efforts in order to reduce uh, the risks. Uh, for example, should we expand the security culture in terms of uh, uh, training um, the individual, I think you mentioned, to empower the people? That's one, one area. What concerns me in terms of the security, looking at the terrorists and their intentions and what they're planning to do, that there is no end to their evil intentions. For example, can we um, provide better accounting for some of the bio um, materials um, similar to the way we try to follow the money on the financing uh, area? Or should we, uh, for example, um, strengthen disease surveillance and detection? Or should we uh, strengthen on the legal issues the bio non-proliferation that I think you are working on of bio uh, weapons uh, conventions. So in other words, there are a series of questions interrelated in order to try to bring down the uh, risk level, if you could respond to that. Yes, sir. Uh, first, what I'd note, the, there, there's a term in the military, a robust defense in depth, which is looking at a variety of different factors all integrated to function together as a system. All of the points that you, you made and many more, I think, can be strengthened and through information sharing can improve our capability to protect against them. But that is one half of the problem. The other half, regardless of what the cause of a bio-incident is, a naturally emerging disease or an intentional release of an agent, I think there are a number of things that the population itself can do to detect early that there is an event and a, an anomalous event, for example, but then be able to reduce or slow the spread of that event. Many of those fall into the category of non-medical countermeasures that don't require a large infrastructure to develop vaccines and drugs, don't require a large amount of logistics to distribute them, or a high level of training to be able to make them available and usable. The example I gave earlier, an AED, used to be purely the area of a trained medical professional because of technology improvements. Rather than trying to make the effort to train the public how to use it, we accepted the fact that the public, from a pragmatic point of view, isn't going to learn. Regardless of the reason, they simply won't. So taking that as a boundary condition, new technologies were developed to deal with that as a real world. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'd love to follow up on this. Your, your thoughts about empowering the, the people. Um, in the biochem attack context, you know, what exactly would it 
what would the actions be that you would want the people to be prepared to do? I mean, you look back in the history and you think of the 50s and the, the fallout shelters, you got the duct tape, um, you know, we've seen all these things. Devin Ridge probably still gets them in his Christmas stocking every year. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it, we've seen all these things, and but what exactly would you? I love the idea. I'm enamored with the idea of trying to basically professionalize the the populace to well, deal with it. But how? What specific things would you train them to do, or us to do? I, I can give you an example. A, a number of years ago, I, I was on the staff with Dr. Carmona when he was U.S. Surgeon General. We developed and, and talked on the concept of standard of care versus appropriate care. And, and developed the concept of a phase change in population care, population health maintenance. Let us assume for the sake of discussion that the brownies we had here today had cholera in them. And five or ten people come down with cholera as a result of this meeting. Not that I'm saying we have. But in the event that that happened, each one of those people would probably end up in an ICU within the next two to three days, have 10 to 12 medical professionals caring for them. Every infectious disease doc within 50 miles would be allowed to come and take a look at them being miserable. If you had 20 or <laughs> color is really unpleasant. Um, if you had, not from personal experience, I assure you, if you had 20 to 30 people, it would be the same thing. We would scale up, we would clear, clear out ERs and ICUs and doing the same thing. If we had 5,000 cases of cholera outbreak, you couldn't do it. You would have a fundamental transition where the population would be told, basically, here's how you make a cholera bed so that, you know, fundamentally keep you well hydrated, take antibiotics and basic treatment, where I have now prepared documentation, the training for the population to care for its own people. That does not work in every case, but that works in many cases if we start with the underlying tenet that no, I'm not having everybody report to a hospital, but what are the basic skills and training, the basic capabilities, if you will, that the population needs to provide for itself, which may not meet the standard of standard of care, but in an environment like that meet the standard of sufficient or appropriate care. D does that make sense? Yeah, I just, I'm just struggling with what specific things you do, because I, th I think, you know, the things in the past were all... <clears throat> Advisable, you know, you know, oh. it, and, but but they ended up sort of not getting traction, and also query whether there's there's that much that can be done medically, you know, by laypersons, and in the bio, in the, I'm talking about in the bio or chem attack context, as sure, opposed but even to just even in that environment, I'm I'm not disease. sure I necessarily disagree. As I mentioned, we have AEDs that mm -hmm. that is granted a very specific malady. But the fact is, if you look across the board, it, it's the traditional ABCs, airway, breathing, I'm sorry, what's the? Circulation. Circulation, thank you. Um, those are the basic things that have to be maintained. If you can, through a combination of technology and preparedness, allow people to be able to be supported and be supported by those around them and nearby, you don't necessarily need professional medical care or even professional care at all. But it has to be not a model of how do I train the population to do it necessarily, but the other half of the problem, how do I prepare technologies, infrastructure, and the basic expectation they will have to do it and enable them to do it. So a, a different point of view. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Tom. Jim, Jim Greenwood, please. I don't know if you'll know the answer to this or not, but it goes to this question of informing, having the public as informed and, and as empowered as possible. So, you know, there's that, this is only a test. If this had been a real emergency, we would have told you what to do. And it, um, it, it, it's, make me, it's making me wonder whether um, whoever that is um, actually knows what to do in, a <laughs> in these kind of events. That's actually an excellent point. In fact, I, I've lectured and taught on crisis communication in the past. When I lecture on it and teach it, I, I believe most training for crisis communication actually, frankly, is wrong. What we try and do is go in and tell the population what the, quote, right thing to do is. We go into that knowing full well that, frankly, most people are either going to screw it up or do something intentionally different. Katrina is a great example. Evacuate. Eh, most people evacuated. A lot of people stayed home, and a bunch of people went to the Superdome. More specifically, the proper thing to communicate to the population is to try and get the most people to do something predictable 
And the reason for that is if they are doing something that is predictable, I can now plan for that. I cannot plan for chaos. There's the, the old saw, 20% of the population requires 80% of the resources. It's probably a little farther along than that. So we certainly want them to do something of benefit, but outweighing the right thing, even assuming we know what the right thing is, which frequently we don't, is trying to get as many people to do something predictable as possible so we can then plan, prepare, and respond to that. Again, the Superdome and Katrina. If we had thought ahead, we would have not only had water and supplies there, we would have encouraged people, rather than staying home and scattered all over in bridge abutments and houses, if you can't evacuate or won't, go here because we have supplies. Instead, we had the worst possible situation. Majority of the population left, a bunch of them showed up in places we weren't prepared for, and an enormous number, well more than 10,000, were scattered all over thousands of square miles and had to be addressed in but my, but my question, but my question, no, I'm sorry, but my, just to follow up, my question is, and maybe you don't know, um, if, if there were a biological terror attack in Washington, D.C. now, and all of a sudden our televisions and radios started saying, beep, beep, you know, we've had an attack, do you, do you have any idea as to whether the advice that would be coming forward after that beep is the right information? It is highly scenario dependent. I go back to Anthrax and, and a former Secretary of Health and Human Services who indicated that the first case of anthrax was accidental from drinking contaminated water. It depends on... No, 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 no. Uh, definitely not. Uh, it, it is highly dependent on the situation and the individual. And frankly, in many cases, we may not know. Dr. Berger, you had a comment you'd like to make, share it with us? Yeah, so Dr. I just wanted to make two comments. One is that there's been a recent push in public engagement on a, a wide range of different topics, and this is actually a very prime uh, topic to engage with people, particularly if you sort of start with measles and Disney World, <laughs> Disneyland, and you start walking away from that to something that's a little bit more unpredictable, like a bioterror attack, and how you would prepare your families and your workplace and on. The other thing is that I do believe that we'll get some of the predictability um, by the mobile health and smart health apps that we now have on phones and watches and all sorts of gadgets all over the place, as well as internet, you know, the internet of things, right, as more and more of our lives go somewhere in databases, we have a better ability to predict what people are doing. So that's a good thing and a bad thing. But in terms of being able to plan, what are people's, you know, what are people doing at different times of the day? How might they react uh, if they see an alert on their watch that says your temperature has just, you know, increased by so many or whatever, right? The, these technologies are being developed. They're being used in all sorts of mobile applications now and smart devices, and that's something that we should think about harnessing. Dr. Staley. Thanks. Uh, well, just to, to build on some of the comments you, you both made, I think when we think when we think about recovery, we're thinking about a way in which uh, we are rebuilding our capacity, right? And so, if you think about a continuum of supply of supply and demand, we have a, we have a set supply of uh, medical uh, ability to deliver uh, medical measures to a population, and depending on the severity of the event, if we can build more surge into our medical capacity over time, we have a faster way to recover. As events become more extreme, you have to think more and more about empowering individuals to take on uh, levels of care, to take on care that would otherwise be taken care of in a more uh, professional setting. So I think um, when you think just about the, the tools you have to enhance recovery, I think on one end of the spectrum where you think about a very severe, in severe incident where the capabilities have been completely overwhelmed, you need to think about empowering individuals as we've discussed already. On the other side of it, you can also think about activities that we can take now to make our own systems more resilient. Because in the end, our ability to recover depends on our resilience. So a great example of what's going on right now and could be, I think, expanded over time is um, the immediate bed availability program that the uh, hospital preparedness program is doing. So they've looked at the challenges that we might have during a major medical event and said, we want to try to find a way that hospitals could uh, release 20% of their patients 
within four hours so that we'd have the ability to surge patients from an emergency to that system. So they've worked as a process of, about, of planning and drilling, they've worked to find processes that can actually quickly identify, uh, on an ongoing basis, identify the acuity of patients in the system, find ways to offload uh, those patients using a reversed, um, a reverse triage system, and then upload patients from uh, from an existing emergency. So I think when you think about ways to impact recovery, you're looking at a spectrum of, of tools. Part of it is thinking at the very extreme end again about empowering individuals. On the other side of it, I do think it comes down to a deliberate process, a preparedness process that helps you helps your institutions become more resilient. Well, I just have a question, quick question for Dr. Berger, but I did want to point out as a university president, I'm not worried about cholera and brownies. <laughs> <laughs> that also depends on which state you're in now. Yes. <laughs> not on campus. Uh, Dr. Right. Dr. Right. Dr. Right. Berger. Right. What, uh, you've done a lot of creating tabletop exercises, and that's been used for a long time. What are the limitations now of tabletop uh, exercises versus uh, the use of these new apps and other kinds of things? So they're, they're inherently different, right? Yes, right. Um, we have, so the, the biggest limitation that we've always encountered with tabletop exercises is that people sort of come with their preconceived notions and that's how they play. And it's hard to get people to think about what is the role of other, you know, some other function and how do I fit with that other function in my daily life. And so um, how developing the exercises, facilitating the exercises to get people out of their own skin and into somebody else's to get to see how you would interact with different functions and how those um, functions relate to your own is really important. The mobile devices, that's, that's a fascinating thing to see, to watch happen. It is fascinating to me to see how much information is collected and it's fascinating to, for me to just sort of think about where is that going and how is that information going to be used in any sort of decision-making capacity from an individual health perspective to a community health perspective to even a national health perspective, right? So when we think about how do we take all the information that we have available to us from all sorts of different sources um, and provide that in a way to decision makers to say, this is an issue, this is the location of the issue, and this is what we need to do to deal with that issue in a real, tangible, meaningful way, um, we are still a little bit away from that. But certainly the tools are being developed to try and, and do that. Could I follow up with you, Ken, just for a second? Sure. Um, just to follow on the, the point about exercises, you mentioned concerns you had with the decision-making process and crises and in response, and you, you sort of gave us a teaser that you know there are best practices that can be disseminated and, and the need for more practices. Um, can you put any more meat on the bones? Do you have any other suggestions as to sort of how the decision-making process can be refined so that the response and recovery is better than it is now? Sure. I, well, I think, you know, I'd Take it from a best practice perspective. I think um, my awareness of exactly how this, uh, of some of the structures now is a little bit opaque. But you know, if you think about the batter process that brought people together, put, put them around the table uh, to discuss a potential bio event, um, I think you want to take a process like that and you want to routinely have leaders put into situ put into drilling situations where they can uh, make decisions uh, with imperfect information and think about the ways in which they would commit resources. I think um, in order to be more effective, you want to make that a part of a comprehensive preparedness program as okay. a best practice, right? So you think about the different types of threats that you want to, that you're worried about, you think about the different types of capabilities you want to be able to exercise and to, uh, and leaders to be able to have at their disposal, and then you test those over time. Okay, so you'd both just be advocates of more exercise I agree with you. Dr. Berger, in your testimony, you identified the very appropriate use of big data and technology to inform us as uh, from geolocation to the type of potential pathogen that's out there. And I think you used a, an example in Germany. Was it E. coli? 
Uh, yeah, so okay. I, I sort of described that in terms of cloud sharing. So in 2011, um, quite a number of people, hundreds of people, got very, very ill from an E. coli right. uh, uh, infection. And the cases in France were somewhat sporadic. It turns out it was a natural, it, the causes were natural, it came from seeds from Egypt. But the interesting piece of this was that a Chinese company, EGI, sequenced the samples, threw it on the cloud, and German scientists were able to do the analysis on those sequences very, very quickly and looked at how they related to other related bacteria and could say this was natural, not man-made. And that situational awareness then it determines the type of response That's you have, recovery. the level of law enforcement involvement, so on and so forth. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying that. That was very helpful. Anybody else on the advisory board? I want to thank you all very, very much. Yes, somebody raise. Yes, sir. I just think that somehow I'm pulling all of this together, and, um, and it comes back to letting more people be involved in this effort on biodefense. So I think you know the Chinese probably pulled that E. coli out because they want to be the scientists, fastest ones to do it. But then they did share, and then some other people would never be involved in probably that world got to play with it. And like you're saying, you know, let the public. And I think, you know, part of our leadership challenge is, um, is defense, you know, like a secret thing and only we can do it, or is it a societal thing and we engage everybody and get the public engaged and let people in a kind of belief that most Americans actually want to do good things. And they're like, how do we take advantage of that? Is that, you know, I think that's what you're saying too. How do you embrace and get more people engaged in these things? I mean, we, or, you know, last meeting, you know, maybe people can have doxycycline at home and they won't do anything bad with it. They'll keep it in case of an emergency or it could be Cipro. And if they got cholera, they could just take a gram. We wouldn't have to go to the doctor. But we could, you know, really, you know, trust the public, engage them and empower them. And in the long term, probably it has to go back to early childhood education. We start teaching people about, you know, awareness and health and how to help society. I think there's an important nuance there in that it's not a question of letting people be involved. People will do something. Uh, herd of cattle is going to go forward whether they go where you want them to or not. Not that people are cattle, but the point is they will be involved. <laughs> I had to clarify that. They will be involved and will want to do something. The question is, do we give them the information to do something less bad than they would have lacking that information? So, uh, I would Great, Dr. Berger. just like to make two on this. One is that we need to take into account the social and cultural aspects of how we reach out to different people because we are such a diverse culture of people that, um, that we need to be able to first and foremost say we respect you and we respect where you come from and then go from there. The, and that's sort of what the public engagement and science efforts kind of start doing now is to start with that as a premise. Um, the second piece of it is um, is that there are actually board games and apps now that allow people to play role-playing games where you actually get to save the world from a pathogen of some sort. And that, in and of itself, may be some way of sensitizing people to thinking about how you would deal with certain issues in bioterrorism. And it's just something to think about. Any further comments? No, thanks. We well, thank you very much for your contribution. We very much appreciate your testimony. And you got prepared remarks. I you leave with the with the team. We'd like to go over them after you've after you've left. We'll go over them. Thank you very very much. Thanks. You bet. You. Thanks. The last, the final panel of this uh, fourth day of uh, public testimony, uh, we hope will, uh, we think is, is going to deal with an issue that uh, we've wrestled with every time we've had a public meeting, and that's the question of leadership and organizational structure. There's a lot of organizations and individuals who have a role to play in biodefense. Uh, they're in multiple jurisdictions. Uh, they're in the private sector. And so uh, this very experienced panel appropriately concludes the final day of uh, 
this public testimony, and I'd like to introduce them to you. Uh, Dr. Ken Bernard, former Special Assistant to President Bush for Biodefense, He's former Senior Advisor to President Bill Clinton for sec Security and Health, Rear Admiral, Rear Admirable Admiral, <laughs> Admirable Admiral. I knew I'd get it out there. Uh, retired U.S. Public Health Service. Uh, Bob Cadlick, you weren't here, but we already cloned you because so many people <laughs> talked about the work you had done before, but uh, uh, we need to know he's Deputy Staff Director for the United States Senate Collect Committee on Intelligence, former Special Assistant to President Bush for Health and Biodefense, retired Colonel in the Air Force, and I would say probably at the epicenter of much of uh, the bioterrorism discussions in uh, both administrations. I'm most familiar with the great work he did when I had the privilege of serving President Bush. And finally, uh, Lisa Gordon Haggerty, President of Tier Tech International, former Director for Combating Terrorism, National Security Council, again, both for President Clinton, for President Bush, and I might add, uh, within about a week after I got to the White House, we had that first anthrax attack, and uh, I had to rely on, on Lisa and her team at National Security Council to get me up to speed on how we dealt publicly. And, we, we experienced within those first couple of weeks a lot of the uh, concerns have been addressed by previous testimony, not just today, but in the three panels, is how do you coordinate an efficient response in order to deal with that crisis? So we welcome the panelists and uh, ladies first. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the privilege to speak before this important panel today. I certainly support your mission, and given my prior experience, I'm hopeful that my opinions will serve for the purpose. I'm also grateful to be in the company of my two dear friends, with whom I share much in common and have worked towards fixing what seems to be this endless battle of interagency coordination, but most importantly, leadership. My perspective comes from having served as a career civil servant at what was then the Department of Energy, now the National Nuclear Security Administration is the director for a technical response to all nuclear and radiological emergencies. After several years there, I moved to the White House to serve as the director for combating terrorism and weapons of mass destruction preparedness prior to and after 9-11 for serving two administrations. Therefore, I hope to offer both an interagency and a White House perspective of what should have been accomplished many years ago, but what I believe can still be accomplished now for the future. Finally, in the event my opinions might serve to be a bit dated, I've been fortunate to be currently part of serving for more than three years uh, as a member of the National Academy's Institute of Medicine uh, Standing Committee on Health Threats Resilience workforce resilience, which supports the Department of Homeland Security Office of Health Affairs, whose focus has been biothreat pre preparedness, response, and recovery. I also work for a service-disabled, veteran-owned small business, whose focus, primary focus is on uh, interagency disciplinary support for state and local uh, responders, for IEDs, for active shooters, and weapons of mass destruction. When I became when I became when I began participating in the 1990s, it was through the interagency process known as then classified coordinating subgroup, now known as the Counterterrorism Security Group, which supported the National Policy on Combating Terrorism or Presidential Directive 39. The interagency in the White House then began focusing on threats aimed largely within the United States, and thus PDD 62 was born. I came aboard to the NSC to implement President Clinton's PDD-62 protection against unconventional threats to the homeland and Americans overseas, focusing on domestic CBRN preparedness and response missions. Whereas we had the usual core players, state, FBI, Justice, CIA, DOD, and Joint Staff, we were now adding HHS, NRC, DOE, and other departments and agencies which played important roles in protecting against unconventional threats aimed towards the U.S. In the late 1990s, our office, under the leadership of Richard Clark, who held the position of National Coordinator for Security Infrastructure Protection and Counterterrorism, rather quickly realized that in order to populate the new and broader CT mission, we would have to figure out a way who in the interagency should participate. One of the ways to do this was to, one, uncover who had the mission, two, the operational and technical capabilities, and three, the budget authorities. Unfortunately, at this time, and as it stands now, there is still no way to, to determine exactly which each agency's budgets are in every element of the combat and terrorism portfolio. 
Too often, we become aware of inner agency of agencies exceeding their authorities in becoming self-approved or self-appointed CT experts. There's virtually no way to determine who was involved or more importantly, where the American public's money was being spent. We then enlisted the support of some great Office of Management and Budget personnel and undertook the arduous task to develop a CT cross-cut budget involving every agency at that time, in 1999, to determine where the resources were being spent. We spent nearly a year looking at CT, infrastructure protection, and money laundering, as well as WMD preparedness. We thought this work would be invaluable to plus up some agencies and pull back on others which were participating in certain missions but did not have the authority to do so. Of course, we had a lot of detractors to our idea. Most importantly, we were the NSC, whose responsibilities were to ensure that the President's national security policies were being executed by the interagency, not to determine where their budgets were or how many resources should be spent, best be spent for combating terrorism. We also faced a lot of pushback by Congress that the White House might be exceeding its authority because we wouldn't be explaining our funding rationale before the Congress. There were terms thrown around like terrorisms are, as we all well, too well know. Most notably, though, was that all the agencies were aghast that the NSC staff might question why, how much, or where their respective resources were being spent. Nonetheless, our idea held a lot of merit, and even our OMB counterparts saw the value of a comprehensive crosswalk for all CT programs. To this day, after nearly 15 years, I've been asked about this proposal. We've discussed it in other studies, such as the Project on National Security Reform, which was headed by Jim Locker, and a study I co-chaired on the National Counterterrorism Center and how it evolved after 9-11. The lesson to be learned from this story, I believe, is that there is still no single person or entity that can review all CT budgets in the administration or in Congress, as virtually every authorizing committee or appropriation subcommittee oversees a department or, agent or an agency with a CT mission. But for those who don't agree with me, I ask you to name one single point of contact in Washington, D.C. who can explain how taxpayer dollars are being spent at the federal level across the CT community, let alone how state and locals are receiving the much needed resources to execute their first responder missions. While the age old issue of politics often plays a role in this matter, it takes leadership and trust to ensure we are spending our critical resources in the most effective way possible, and it all begins with leadership. If you'll let me permit me, permit, if you'll permit me, I would like to now fast forward to shortly after 9/11. In the midst of the horrific attacks against our nation, we were quickly enveloped in the anthrax attacks. Governor, as you well know, and as you mentioned, we first met the morning after President Bush announced that he was establishing a Homeland Security Advisor at the White House. Richard Clark and I briefed you on the ongoing domestic preparedness and response programs that were my, part of my portfolio and would soon become yours. This was in the midst of the anthrax attacks. Serving as your point man on this matter, we pulled together what I think to, even as of this to this day, an incredible group of unlikely bedfellows, such as you, Samrid, CDC, HHS, FBI, the US Postal Service, and the intelligence community to deal with daily threats, operational plans, healthcare and remediation. And I must say many of the people that were participating in that are in this room and they're all true heroes. We held daily, if not more often, when situations required it, interagency coordination phone calls to ensure everyone was up to speed on the medical, law enforcement, and other related matters. I've been reminded by several of the participants how invaluable those conference calls were to the process. It was also critical to ensure that both you and the White House Press Secretary were often briefed as often as necessary on the situation to ensure that the American public was updated on the crisis. I mention anthrax because it brings me back to my initial point, your leadership. And without a point man that had the authority and support of everyone in the chain up to and including the President of the United States, there would have been no way to operate as effectively and admittedly sometimes on the fly as we did during the anthrax attacks. I'll never forget what it, take, what it took to make this critically needed coordination throughout the interagency happen. As I often recall when one late evening we gathered department and agency heads in the White House to discuss interagency challenges and processes. And when I looked across the room, I saw the Director of Central Intelligence sitting next to the Postmaster General of the United States. And I doubt anyone would ever envision that scenario. 
In an effort to keep with your panel's guidelines, I'd like to thank you for letting me highlight what I believe are two critically important examples of what continues to be challenges to the former, current, and I assume future administrations. Getting a handle on the interagency process from the NSC. A special assistant to the President on Biodefense is a nice and important title, but it is useless unless it has the authority behind it. We have tried and tried and tried again to determine who is in charge and eventually either politics or interagency infighting take over. Someone needs to make a decision and execute. Someone needs to undertake a serious review of the missions, responsibilities, and budgets of each participating department and agency, and then make the hard decisions to take resources away from some agencies, which have unilaterally taken on missions for which they have no authority, and then determine which agencies require additional funding to meet their, their, the needs in their areas of responsibility. If the interagency process or the legislative branch find placing authority within the NSC too extreme, then name an agency to take the lead, and I mean lead, by having the authority over budgets and missions. Although there has been some progress made in such for example, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, that's only one aspect of the CT community. As long as, there are vacuum, as long as there is a vacuum in leadership and execution in Washington, we continue to fail state and local first responders who are our first line of defense, risking their lives every day across our great nation. It won't be the feds who come to the rescue until many days or weeks after an, an event has unfolded. That said, I, believe it's, I firmly believe it's possible to get the executive and legislative branches to work through this long-standing leadership vacuum. The top must be fixed before we can expect our, expect our frontline first responders to be fully effective in their critically important missions. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Dr. Bernard, yes, sir. Well, it's really a privilege to be here. I look around the room and I think I know half the people, which makes me wonder uh, why they aren't actually working in government right now to actually doing what we're talking about. Um, I um, went into Lisa Gordon Haggerty's office not long after 9-11 and there was a uh, special forces um, knife up on the wall um, and I realized that she was not to be trifled with. And, um, <laughs> I, was, I, I happen to like that uh, on the wall was that target. Yeah. Yes. Uh, shooting target and all the holes right in the middle. Yes, I've seen that one too. You got um, my it, attention. It was always it. She always gained the ascendancy by making by showing you the a few of those items. Um, seriously, I just want to mention Lisa did an incredible job um, with with an unexpected attack on America, and um, we all should be very grateful to her. Somebody else we should be grateful to with regarding leadership. It's really interesting. The two uh, people. Uh, leaders that I worked for uh, towards the end of my career, um, Secretary Shalala and Governor Ridge. Um, in uh, 1998, I was in, uh, working at the U.S. Mission in Geneva, and Secretary Shalala decided that HHS needed somebody at the White House on the NSC because national security and health was becoming a more and more critical issue, uh, whether it was HIV AIDS or smallpox or biodefense. Uh, so she called her. Um, her good buddy Sandy Berger and said, I'm sending you somebody. And that's the way she usually does things. Um, <laughs> and I'm paying for them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the first person ever to do health policy as um, at the White House, um, which was interesting because my first two weeks I sat on the steps of the old executive office building inside with my computer on my lap because there were no desks. And when I eventually got a desk, it was in with the speech writers happened to be Tony Blinken and Tom Malinowski, who are now at the State Department. Um, and I learned a lot about speech writing along the way. Um, unfortunately, at the end of that tour of two year, two and a half years, um, the Bush administration came in and they decided health and security was not really their thing, um, the transition team. And so they abolished the office, which was a shame. But you know, I understand during transitions. 9-11 happened. I went off to work uh, at uh, Secretary Shalala's um, behest for Senator Frist to learn a little bit about the Hill and a little bit about Republicans. So um, I, um, I went up to the Hill, worked for him for a year, but during that time, um, the problem, the post problem of leadership at the NSC related to health issues, especially post 
anthrax attacks. Um, uh, Governor Ridge really took that to heart. And so we had one serious leader in Donna Shalala and um, another serious leader in Governor Ridge on this issue. And like I said, I'm really pleased to uh, be able to talk to you about this. So he called me in exactly one year after 9-11. Uh, it was on the anniversary, and I remember that because he had uh, just come in from a memorial service in Pennsylvania that morning, hired me on the spot, and said, open an office, you have five positions, which at the White House is unheard of. Um, and Bob Cadillac joined the office, and Kurt Mann and a number of others, and we started to roll. And I think I think we did a pretty good job considering that we were starting from a, uh, a system that didn't really have a place for health and security at that White House. We did HSPD-10, which is still the, and NSPD-17, um, uh, that was, is still the uh, kind of guiding document for Homeland Security. I think it hasn't been superseded. Um, HSPD-9, which for, was for agricultural bioterrorism. And then I left in 2005. Bob uh, came on, Rajiv Venkaya and Bob Cadillac came on and took over the job. Then, at the end of the administration, they abolished the office again. The Obama administration came in and thought, nah, we don't do this. I was astounded. Um, this was it just, I didn't know, I even know what to say. Um, they then balkanized the health issues and they divided them up among three different directorates at the NSC. And to this day, I still cannot figure out on biosecurity and bio uh, response recovery planning, preparedness, <coughs> countermeasures development, who at, at the White House is really in charge of what issue. I can figure it out, but it takes a little while. Um, and this is interesting because in the latest national security um, uh, strategy that was just published last month, I think, by uh, President Obama. Health is one of the, uh, quoted exactly, top strategic risks to our interests. One of, there's only eight. Health was one of them, health um, and pandemics. Um, there's still, it's still a pretty mushy system. The Ebola outbreak um, continued to, to uh, puzzle me as to why they had divided up the response and the coordination of the agencies among so many different parts of the White House. Um, when I was, I was out in California, I'm going to just finish because um, uh, I want to hear what Bob has to say as well. Um, I was out at Stanford teaching a class um, back last October, and there were a whole bunch of faculty and Stanford students, and these are pretty smart people, um, around, and I said, in October, Who's in charge for the Ebola response in the U.S. government? Dead silence. This is all, these are all internationally savvy people. I said, okay, so who's in charge for the global community, the global efforts? Silence. And as far, it just made the point that we are not putting the right people at the senior positions to manage crises that repeat. Every two or three years we get another one, whether it's pandemic flu, it's Ebola, um, whatever, whatever it is, we are not managing the leadership properly. And the fact that both Donna Shalala and Governor Ridge understand the importance of leadership makes it even more um, uh, personal to me. Stop there. First of all, I'd like to add my thanks uh, as uh, Ken and Lisa have already done to the panel and to the people who made this panel possible. Um, you talk about leadership, uh, look look to your left or to my right and you'll see some future leaders here. And I hope that won't uh, be overlooked by anybody. But in, in commenting or being asked to come here today, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because they're individuals who I had the pleasure to work with or serve with or know about and, and to go from left to right, uh, Secretary Shalala, I didn't work for you but I read some of your stuff and I did a little bureaucratic archaeology and found the document that characterized all the many important things that at the end of the Clinton administration you, you I highlighted as being the first down payment to the issues of biodefense. And, and that didn't come just out of the blue, it came from bold, decisive leadership. And, and I think that that's 
part of it, and, and I think Lisa and, and Ken have already talked about Governor Ridge's role, uh, but if you talk about heroism and, and about uh, great leaders, someone who's a sitting governor who gets a call from the President of the United States and jumps in his car and calls three or four of his closest uh, advisors and confidants and tells them that we're going to the White House, and he does so dropping everything, um, is just an indication of what leaders do. They lead by example. They take risk taking. They have a bold vision, and and I think in some ways that's They're smart enough to get people to like the three of you around them. <laughs> well, sir, you know uh, the nut doesn't fall far from the tree. How's that? <laughs> and then I, you know, I look at Ken, and I work for Ken, and again enabling leadership. Uh, and that's you told what, me I work for you. No, sir, I work for you. <laughs> uh, but it's the whole point that in some ways, uh, you know, having the opportunity to work for leaders who who are comfortable in themselves and who have confidence in their capabilities and who, who have a desire to learn and understand what's right is very important. And I look at Jim Greenwood, who is then at Representative Greenwood, who brought the Bioterrorism Act and BioShield to four. I mean, it takes a collective set of leaders to effectively do things. And then I look to my left here, and I think it's pretty self-evident that these people led by example, and I was a very good fortune um, disciple of theirs to, to do so. But I'm going to li limit my He's comments. Give him as much time as he wants, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm going to be brief. <laughs> and you can advise and extend and extend and extend. Well, sir, sir, uh, this is not the congressional floor, so I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, but I, I just think the thing is, is what makes leaders leaders special, leadership important, is clearly identifying the mission and having a vision of what needs to be done. I can't think, and I'll just use this anecdote, where I learned about the mission was not working at the White House, but working with a group of Air Force Power Rescue Men, and many of you may not know them, uh, but there are enlisted personnel who jump out of airplanes, fast rope out of airplanes, scuba dive, and their only mission and their motto is so others may live. And it just happens to be, I think, the very nature of this business biodefense, which is really about saving American lives. And, and, and there is no greater mission, for those who are mission-oriented like me, to say that that's what I do every morning when I get up every day, 24-7, 365. And, and I think it's the very nature of the leaders that we have here today, and I'll look to my left at Scooter Libby and, and Jerry Parker and Tevi Troy and others, and, and Gigi, who have all kind of armored up, if you will, with that mission and vision, and knowing whatever they do, regardless of what their interests are, they know that that's an inherent thing that they have to contribute to. And I think that's what motivates many of us in this room. And, and I think that's one essential element. And, and leaders articulate the vision clearly for everyone. The other one, other critical thing, and you can talk about integrity, but it's standing for and doing what is right and to be the advocate when oftentimes there are no others. And, and quite frankly, for this kind of arcane subject, for people who haven't had a lot of uh, steeping in biology or medicine, um, or haven't had a personal life experience around this, it can be a little off-putting. And I think for the leaders that have been here, and again, I look to, to my former leader, Ken, who enabled me, looking to me as his subject matter expert, was giving me the opportunities to pursue those issues that he knew were the right ones, and he stood for them, and he stood by me, and he basically allowed me to do what I articulated as the right thing to do to, again, protect American lives. And the other element is, is persistence. Not quitting or taking no for an example. Um, I have to admit there were times uh, during my second time at the White House uh, where I found that persistence can be both a virtue and uh, a liability, uh, particularly when I had to write a personal note of apology to the Deputy OMB Director. Um, but the point, <laughs> the point here is... You got over it. <laughs> and we get on with it, sir. <laughs> um, but, the, but the point here is it is about risk-taking, right? Yep. And in, that's what leadership, the epitome of leadership is. Whether you're that power rescue man jumping out of airplane, or you're a ranger, or sort of during your tenure in Vietnam, you know who the leaders were. They didn't have the bars on their helmets, or they had their stripes on their shoulder, and who would take charge and move out. 
and I think that's part of this. And there's a great quotation here that I like since it's about baseball season. You can't steal second base when you're standing on first. And that is, in some ways, you have to stretch yourself and you have to basically take those risks in your position that you're given. Use the authorities that you have. Use the responsibilities you have and maybe some others that you may not have, but argue vociferously for the mission that you're doing to basically do that. And then the last thing is, and this is to the point that, as I highlighted a number of people in this room, leadership is not about an individual, it's about alliances. And leaders create alliances, they, they, cut, they put their arms around each other and they find other leaders and they basically motivate each other to basically do what oftentimes is said can't be done, but they do it not with the expectation they're going to succeed, but they know they just can't fail. And so. I may have taken a different tact than my colleagues here to talk about what leadership is, but it's the leadership that they did during my tenure, knowing them in my professional life. It's the kind of qualities that you all have and the ex officios have, and it's many in this room have, that in some ways the positions by their title are important, but in some ways, as Lisa said, it's right. It's the authority that you have and the authority that you're permitted to use and that you're willing to use. And sometimes that's more of an issue of what you're willing to do rather than what you can do or what you're allowed to do. And with that, sir, I'm going to end my comments and just say thank you and to the lovely ladies to my right who represent the next generation. Um, I know that they represent the best that we have and there are many in this room who, who stand ready, God willing, God forbid, that we have another set of events like we had in 9-11. But here's the lesson that I learned. We had 9-11, we had anthrax, we had Katrina, we had Ebola, and who knows what's next, but you know there will be something. And it really does require our best efforts now before the crisis occurs. Because we know there's going to be something, and you've all been in the White House, I'm particularly interested in how the White House needs to organize itself. I know more about the cabinet agencies. What's your recommendation? There's a new president coming in in a couple of years. What would you say? to the new president, um, to the new chief of staff, to the new NSC director about how they ought, given our experience, how they ought to organize uh, the White House on these issues. Well, Mike, I'll give you my first comment because um, I've gone over this over and over with everybody who would listen um, in the, at the beginning of this administration. It ought to be pretty much what um, Governor Ridge set up. I think it's just about right. You develop, you put the right people as a leader, you have a few people to help do the day-to-day -day work, you let the agencies have their own budgets, you let the agencies do what they know how to do. You, it's pretty hard from that spot to control budgets without having to testify um, because you get caught in the uh, presidential um, uh, problems of the NSC testifying, so you have to be a little careful with budget. On the other hand, um, you need to have the respect of the community. If you just chair the interagency groups or the civets like um, we're done right after 9-11, um, you bring everybody to the table and you let everybody present what they need to present and then you figure out what the president's uh, a primary policy is going to be and then you get everybody moving in the same direction and they're using their own components. I think that's, um, it works. I've seen it work. I've done it. It works. Bob's done it. Lisa's done it. It does work. And should, should there also be someone in OMB that watches the budgets? Yes. So they can be better integrated? So there's a designated person that's a staff person that actually keeps that data up to date so that when the president puts the, or the OMB director or the president put together the budget, they've actually got that information. They don't have to ad hoc dig it up. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And perhaps that would be the person that would. Um, or the OMB director that would go and testify before Congress. Because as I mentioned, all of the subcommittees, the appropriations, virtually every subcommittee, appropriations subcommittee touches the counterterrorism budget in one way or another. And there's no way to enlist the support of Congress in working with the White House, regardless of who's in the administration and who's in the leadership of Congress. We've tried this years, decades and decades and decades, and it doesn't work. And one of these days, somebody's going to have to come up with a different idea. And that idea is really, I think, starting with a cross-cut of, 
across all budgets in the, all the different agencies. And if the agencies aren't willing to pick a single point of contact to be their leadership, then it's going to either have to come out of the White House NSC or it's going to have to come out of, the, uh, out of OMB that can go back to the Hill and to explain exactly what's gone on. But um, I really think that uh, with respect to Ken, to Dr. Bernard, um, the system that has been in place prior to this administration, many uh, previous administrations, it works from a, an interagency coordination mechanism. But until such time as there's a real leader in place that has the backing of the agency officials as well as the White House leadership, um, we'll be in the same old situation that we've found ourselves in in the past and, and we're in in the present situation. Yeah. Someone sends a memo to the new president. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if I could follow up on that, just to try to put a finer point on it, because um, the, the Secretary Schlitter's question is exactly the one I have. We, we can look at this issue, and I, this issue being sort of WMD terrorism, chem, um, bio, primarily, from a number of different perspectives, the agencies and departments, but I, I'd like to focus on the interagency itself and what it is that's missing now that maybe used to be there, other than Bob Cadlick, we heard from a prior panel that you basically you should just be cloned and and trot it out for every administration. That's but your position, the position you had, the authority that you wielded um, in that position, that maybe that's what's missing. But, I, but structurally, what is it that we need? I think it might be a bridge too far to talk about bringing budgetary authority underneath this person. I actually tend to be um, a believer that the energy agency process can work with a strong person who's fully authorized by, a, by their delegated authority by their position and by the trust and relationship they have with the chief of staff and the president. Um, do you see uh, that maybe we can scratch this itch by going back to a senior director that we had before? Do you think we need something at a higher level? And I'm opening that up to any one of you. Well, I'm, I'm going to just comment and, and to, to just say that Ken's earlier comment about the current state of affairs that's been balkanized, it's been broken up. So what's interesting, or what seems to be a practice, is that you have the same group of agencies, interagency partners, going to meetings on different topical areas with different parts of the NSC. So right there, I think that creates a little bit of a challenge for the departments and agencies when on any given day, they may have three different meetings on three different topical areas that are not necessarily coordinated in the White House. Or so, in the agency. Or in the agency. And, and I think in some ways it requires a coalescence of the portfolio of, these, of this kind to be in one office. How that gets constructed I think is important. The second thing is, is that in some ways I think it does require a political level person, uh, whether that's a SAP or senior director, but it has to be someone who is not going to be imbued with one, with the, will, will be imbued with the priorities of the president, not necessarily one particular agency. To get to the Madam Secretary's comment about OMB, I'll just tell you an anecdote. When I showed back up in the White House in uh, 2007, uh, I went to the OMB director who had the preponderance of funding the responsibility oversight, uh, the health pad, and found out that that person didn't have a security clearance. So I spent my first 60 days justifying with the uh, people in the White House that that individual needed security clearance because they needed to have the basis, you know, the understanding of the threat that I was privy to so that he could understand why I was arguing that we need to do more. And so there's, there are a lot of little things that need to be done, um, but I think coalescing it into one office, um, again, the cross-cut budget is very important, and then, again, it has to be a, a priority. I think it's clear that in the current national security strategy, it is a priority but how they gets manifest in the bureaucracy or the organization, to your point, ma'am, is the essence of the issue. Can I add, add one thing about OMB? The, um, when we were doing the BioShield bill, which is $5.6 billion, which we got through based on um, some of Scooter Libby's friends and everybody else's friends are in and around town, um, the, we had an OMB person in every single policy and drafting meeting every single one and because they had a cross the administration had a bw cross cut it wasn't all of counterterrorism but it was beat up the bw cross cut and they had somebody there and there were times when i would cancel a meeting if that person couldn't come because it was so critical that 
policy without money is just kind of shelfware. So um, the idea that you can incorporate OMB into this, it can be done, even but it if doesn't that mean level. that the office has to have control of the budget. No, it just yep. means that everybody no. has to understand yes, the budgets right. so yes, they can yeah. press the right buttons right. to get the proper kind of coordination and really depth. I mean, I remember why I sent Ken over to work for Senator Frist because. The other choice was to bury him in the in the public health service <laughs> because we really didn't have a place for him there. So I did, simply called Senator Frist and begged him to take Ken. He tells me every time I see him, it was an interagency transfer, so the department ended up paid his salary, I think. Um, but uh, Senator Frist to this day says it's the best thing that ever happened to him because it opened up a window for a senior member of Congress to a whole new area. And that, of course, helped with Congress. So more of those kinds of interagency transfers as part of this, and seeing this as part of the education process, both of the cabinet of the White House um, and of the international global uh, staff as well. You know, just comment on that point that uh, one of the benefits of having Ken there was when I went to work on Capitol Hill for Senator Richard Burr back in the 109th Congress, uh, Senator Frist was the, the leader at that time, and uh, Senator Burr was given the opportunity to to be to be the chairman of the subcommittee on bioterrorism and preparedness that no longer exists. And his sidekick was Ted Kennedy, and and that was a huge. They plowed a lot of the same ground that Senator Frist and Ted Kennedy did, but to to a much more complete and further uh, uh, endpoint. The other and, thing is doctors in this discussion. I had a rule that when you were talking about some some complex bioterrorism thing, you had to have, I made them wear their white coats. <laughs> I just, just need the trust and credibility of the American people. And with all due respect, you cannot put political appointees in front of microphones um, to manage complex questions. You really do need but you also need docs that understand the policy and the politics at the same time. They're not going to do that unless you put them into the system, into the structure of the system. May I just make a comment about the process and the what the coordination mechanism might be, or a better, uh, maybe a logical step to, to putting a national security team together in this area. And I'd say, I guess I'd look back into the late 90s under PDD-62 where we did have a national coordinator for, for infrastructure protection for counterterrorism, and it was an all-encompassing office that looked at the areas of the issues of the day of combating terrorism. And under those different tranches of personnel, if you will, there was traditional CT, there was the WMD preparedness uh, that I ran, crisis management, so response to, quick response to emergencies that happen, crises that happen overseas and within the United States. So. Um, the USS Cole bombing, coordinating the interagency response to USS Cole bombing, to the East Africa embassy bombing, so on, and 9 11. Um, so that kind of structure actually worked quite well. Now, of course, it goes back to leadership, and that person was Dick Clark. And so and most people remember Dick and know Dick is a formidable. Uh, uh, entity, oh, and you know what? I can I can't think of a better person I'd rather have in my foxhole. So maybe there are about five or six other people in the room that could jump in that foxhole with me, but I wouldn't want anybody other than Dick Clark when it comes to these kinds of issues. He knows how to do it, and if we look back and maybe do a case study on something like that, that might be an opportunity to say that's the kind of interagency coordination you bring them together and make the tough decisions, and then move on. You take it up to a deputies, or you take it up to a principals, or you take it up to an NSC meeting, and then it, and decision is made. But to sit around and flounder and wait for the next event to happen is not the way to do business. But Tom, sure, it also requires that you have cabinet officers that understand the role of the White House and the role of the NSC because you can't turf fight. You have to be clear in your mind. Talk about federated systems. You have to be very clear in your head about what the appropriate role is of the White House. <coughs> and it's not, it's not that you're giving up turf you're putting the appropriate leadership roles in the right places. Concur. Concur. Scooter. Um, so on behalf of Hudson Institute, I'd, I'd like to say that it was Bob Caddock who persuaded us to help support this endeavor. Uh, and then he quit halfway through. <laughs> 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 That's leadership. Sir, there you go. <laughs> and the going gets tough. <laughs> <laughs> the tough 
kept going. I just want to review your comments about leadership by example. <laughs> And then move on to your comments about persistence, if I recall. I made some notes here on what you said. Uh, when I think about this problem, uh, there's been a lot of discussion through all these panels and several meetings now, which I would say go largely to the tactical level. When I think about this problem, what often comes to mind um, is a ballistic missile submarine. You didn't get a ballistic missile submarine in one funding cycle. You got it through a long national consensus that the president, should I repeat all those jokes? <laughs> <laughs> that the president and the Congress were willing time after time to say it's unacceptable for an American population to be vulnerable to millions of people dying. And that's what kept us going through the Cold War. I would submit the chance of a bolt out of the blue attack, which is what the triad was all about is lower than the chance that we might get, and was lower than the chance that we might get some type of mass casualty event coming out of what has brought everybody together to this meeting today. So what we, the word that hasn't come out is the president. And the president as leader to say, this is a national priority, so that we're fighting this war the way we fought the American Revolution. There's, there's a bunch of guys in Concord who are doing what they can. There's somebody off here in Valley Forge who's uh, bringing wood. Uh, what we need, if you really wanted to get ahead of this problem, is a much larger national consensus effort, led by the Congress, led by the President, to say, yes, we may end up you know, funding nuclear uh, ABM machines that don't really work at the end of the day, but somewhere along the line we're going to get ahead of this problem. This problem we can be defense dominant process, we will make Americans a lot safer than they are going forward, where, as we heard from the opening panel today, the opening panel, in the first of our sessions, there are enormous um, vulnerabilities out there, which we have groups with resources uh, to exploit and willingness to exploit. So, proposal number one is to make this a large national priority, and if the president were behind it, I submit, you know, somebody like government, Governor Ridge and the job to get it done. I like the idea about the president getting behind it. <laughs> <laughs> Not the other one. Yeah. <laughs> Comments? I mean, I, I do think, uh, Scooter, it's very appropriate uh, because so much of those of us who have been privileged in the executive, work in the executive branch or with the executive branch, you do have, there's a certain structure you get the interagency process, you come to a consensus, and you get to the deputies, and you get up to the principals, and then you get up to the, uh, back to the president. But if you've got a president that is engaged and makes it a priority, that all th that process is very necessary, but it sure accelerates the process, because everybody knows at the end of the day, the president wants this done, so we damn well better do it, notwithstanding we're going to get, we'll get the money if we do it the right way. So I, I think uh, nope, everyone has been hesitant perhaps to uh, raise that issue of uh, presidential leadership, but I think it would be very important. And Donna raised it a little bit earlier. We take this uh, and uh, turn this into a memo to the next, uh, maybe to the presidential candidates on both sides once they deter determine who their, who their nominees are and, and kind of drive it that way. But in the time being, we need to drive it through the Congress of the United States. Ken? I just want to, I, I think Scooter captured the thinking exactly right, and I, I concur with everything you said about how it needs to be prioritized at the presidential level and on down. Um, but in addition, I think it does take organizational change within the White House. Um, I think this is one of these areas, you know, you, you look at a, a threat that America faces like IS, you know, ISIL, IS, ISIS, whatever, and everybody gets it. That's a big threat. Everybody coalesces and responds to it. Like, sort of like cyber, this is one of those threats that people don't really understand. As somebody said, it's very arcane. It seems remote in most people's minds. You know, they sort of think about some flu back at the beginning of the 19th or the 20th century, and you know, it's just not something that really uh, stands out. Plus, it just operationally, it's one of those areas that requires coordination among disparate parts of the government. Once again, sort of like cyber, but even worse because you've got, you know, the health community, and then you've got intel and law enforcement, et cetera. They all have to try to be coordinated. Incredibly difficult to do. 
it just seems to be one of those areas that screams for the sort of the constancy of a high level entity, be it an official or, you know, a, a group within the interagency structure that's going to keep a strategic focus on this because that's what happens. We don't maintain a strategic focus on those threats that are on the front pages. So I would love to hear from you all, and I think you've given it to us in different forms, but specific recommendations for where you would see structurally um, that, that the consistency we need in the organization in the White House to maintain, you know, strategic focus on what is right now being neglected. Well, I said it before, that's um, recreate the uh, Governor Ridge's structure. It worked. I mean, it wasn't perfect and it needed refinement, but I think it belongs in the NSC. Or, um, you can argue about whether there should be a Homeland Security Council too, but it should be at that level. Um, I think it should um, include people, uh, somebody needs to be respected. You talked about, it's all about personal relationships. The way you get things done in the White House when you're a staff is you can figure out what the president wants, that's your policy, and then you develop the relationships with your counterparts in all the agencies so that you're on a common course. And then you get it funded and then you move it forward. And it's all doable. None of this that we've heard about all day today isn't doable. It just requires focus, leadership, and it needs trust. The trust between the person in charge of this component, wherever you decide to place it, I think it should be at the NSC, but, and then you, that person needs to be an honest broker with their counterparts at all the agencies. And I think that's completely doable. Lisa, you're thinking? Um, I couldn't agree more. Again, I go back to the, the process that had been in place in the 1990s. Um, many, most people didn't even know they existed, but that was before 9-11, before this was school and everybody was doing it, uh, being counterterrorism experts. But we had a core team, a core community of the state, state CIA, uh, joint staff, o OSD, the Bureau of Justice. Everyone knew everyone's telephone numbers. You'd pick up the phone in the middle of the night, we have an issue, you'd be on, the, on a civets or on a phone call, on a stoop in 15 minutes and you'd have, everyone knew what the mission was. Everybody knew how to go forward. Everybody had the same goal in mind. And it is, it's personality dependent, but, it's per, but everybody, the, the people that are working the issue are all mission oriented. They know what they have to execute. They know what they need to do. It's been done before, we can do it again, but it takes the leadership. It's a leadership challenge and it also takes a formidable force to remind agencies that they're only one aspect of the entire piece and, and the NSC is the honest broker. I, went, I came to the NSC from an agency, so I was a career civil servant, so I might have been aghast if, I, if at that time I would have said the NSC is looking at my budget at the Department of Energy on nuclear emergency response to see what, you know, what we were spending on what and if it was within our mission. I look at it now and I say, you know what, somebody has to do it because I can't depend on the Bureau to do it, I can't depend on DHS to do it. I, somebody needs to be an honest broker to look across all of the agencies and say, this is, this is our mission, this is our goal, now who has the capabilities, who has the responsibility, who has the budget authority, and if you don't have the budget authorities and it's within yeah. your mission, we're going to get you the budget, and we're going to get you the people to execute that mission so we have a cross-cut and coordinated interagency effort to execute this important national security mission. Robert? Sorry, I just uh, concur with my colleagues here and just say at the NSC, I just want to point out one thing, though, and again, it's the coupling of presidential leadership with someone who will be the leader who will execute the president's policy and will. And, and, and maybe it's been a matter of subject or discussion here, but when... President Bush became, uh, learned of the pandemic uh, influenza risk. Uh, he held five policy times, uh, organized a very um, uh, robust government response that was uh, one of the individuals that uh, occupied uh, the office that I did in Ken, Rajiv Ankaya, basically managed that effort, building a strategy and implementation plan that basically uh, you know, necessitated uh, about another five and a half billion dollar investment by the United States government to prepare for a pandemic that had not happened at that point. So, unlike 9/11, unlike anthrax, here you had the coupling of of presidential focus 
and uh, an arm or an organ in the, in the NSC or HSC at that time that was able to basically organize the interagency and do so in a manner that um, was very effective. And I think when you have those two things together, uh, there's no stopping it. You know, we haven't talked at all about the importance of the NSA having this capability and international protocols when the president goes off to um, have conversations with his counterparts because setting the international agenda on health became just as, and on bioterrorism, became just as important to get those inserted into um, those international meetings. Mm -hmm. Permit me an editorial comment. Uh, we've talked about presidential leadership, but I am going to draw back on my own experience, and I think my colleagues uh, at the table can confirm it. It also was very helpful to have uh, Vice President uh, being advised by one Scooter Libby, particularly to elevate uh, within, and there's a great opportunity for the Vice President to influence policy as well in conversations not only with the President of the Hill, but Scooter, you and the Vice, and Vice President Cheney in terms of the biological and, and nuclear initiatives uh, that were initiated over the past eight years, or you could say the sine qua non. I'm not sure we'd have gotten that far without you personally being involved in the vice president and your team uh, pushing that uh, pushing that agenda. So it's the, it's the white that uh, the competence, the capabilities, and the commitment of the White House team, President, Vice President. I think really led to a lot of the things we're discussing today. Any further uh, comments, observations from the uh, advisory panel? It's all been said well. Yeah, I think it's been very very well said. My colleagues here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Yeah, terrific. Thank you very, very much. And by the way, don't be surprised if we knock on your door and say, take a look at some of these recommendations, see if yeah. it's consistent <laughs> with your experiences and with your recommendations, all right? Thank you very, very much. Uh, before everyone adjourns, uh, I want to thank once again uh, the Hudson Institute. Uh, Bob, uh, you can came down here. Uh, late last fall and convinced them this should be a high national priority. Obviously, you uh, convened a group of people who share that uh, point of view. I want to thank the advisory board for their invaluable assistance uh, here and uh, throughout the past several months at the Hudson Institute and to our fundraisers. We had companies, we had the academic community, we've had NGOs, uh, not necessarily necessary to uh, identify them, but those of us who have been privileged to serve as part of this panel want to publicly acknowledge their most substantial uh, support of our initiative into the, the staff here. Bob, you pulled together a really great team. Uh, but we've just, we're done with the public hearings and now we're going to go to work. Um, so we will convene privately a couple of times over the next month or two. But to all of you who have participated consistently, I see a lot of familiar faces have been here for the four public meetings. I know some of you have been out there in the field when we had these uh, hearings and meetings around the country. Uh, so on behalf of Senator Lieberman and my colleagues here, we want to thank you for your participation as well. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do, and I, we hope to make you proud of the final product that we submit to the Congress of the United States. We can't submit anything without your participation. We're grateful for it. I just want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.